Brian, do you ever get the urge to start beatboxing when you've got like the no. you know no okay no maybe that's just me. I didn't even have the urge to beatbox when I was young enough to where that was a thing. <laughs> so yeah, I didn't say I could do it. I just said you know I feel like I should be doing. I don't know. Yeah, but I never anyway. said I couldn't. I never said I couldn't do. It. I said I never had the urge to Ooh. do it even when it was a thing. Well played. So yeah, well played. <laughs> Well, welcome everybody to another edition of the Irish Breakdown Podcast. Uh, wait, wait. Yep, it's Friday. So that means it's the Friday free for all mailbag. Everybody <laughs> fired up. Best day of the week. Can't wait to get started. I'm Vince. That's Brian. The OGs are in the house to answer all of your questions, football related or otherwise, for that matter. And we're ready to rock and roll. And now Brian's ready you know, to rock and roll. You know, the wife knows I'm doing a show right now <laughs> and she still calls. <clears throat> of course, it so. was her. Of course, yeah, it yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. unbelievable. But yes, That's I am. Fantastic. I am ready to rock and roll, man. I'm ready to rock and roll. It's a beautiful Friday outside, and we're ready to answer all your questions, folks. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna ignore the first question that's in there. <clears throat> oh my I'll, gosh! Okay, so let's. Just I don't know what on. it is. I've got them yeah. blocked off. So yeah. From ND Estimate Trucking LLC. I really hope that you got an LLC out of that, uh, whoever this is. That's awesome. Uh, over under, Rico Flores, 15 receptions. Holden stays 400 yards. Tobias Merriweather, seven touchdowns. And the Notre Dame offense has at least three All-Americans at season's end. This is a loaded question. Yeah, so we're basically doing over under. So let's take okay. them one at a time. Rico Flores, 15 receptions. I'm I'm going to take the over on that cuz I have a really. Feeling. Yeah, okay. I just I have a feeling that Notre Dame's going to have some blowouts where they're going to get right. those young kids in the game pretty early. Right. And have a chance to get them some some playing time and injuries always happen, right? Like in in Rico Flores is an injury away from being a guy that's going to play. That, and I'm not talking about point. just Tobias Merriweather, but just, you know, whoever the next guy sure. is behind Tobias. If Rico's not, and Rico may end up being the number two behind Tobias, especially now that Lorenzo Styles is gone. So I, I think I think Rico and Jaden Greathouse are going to not just be freshmen who play in blowouts. I think they're going to actually be part of the rotation. Now, will they get a bunch of cut, t- cut touches early? Probably Probably not. I mean, yeah. I would hope so. I hope they get some touches early because they're playing a deeper rotation because the schedule's a little bit softer early on outside of NC State. But we'll see. But yeah, I'm, I'm going to go over Vince on that one. What what's what say you? I am actually going to take the under. I just I, I I just feel with the freshman wide receiver situation and just I think I've got a little PTSD. I'm not saying it's BK PTSD, but I'm going to say. PTSD from a situation of freshmen getting on the field at the wide receiver sure. position. I have no basis on that from a uh, from the current staff. I don't. Ha- I don't. Sure. But I just Rico you Flores. See, believe it, man. There's nothing I do. Wrong with that. I do have yeah, to see it. So I'm going to take. I'm going to take the under there. I think he has a ton of talent. I think he is very. Re- he's he's physically. He could do it physically. Let's put it that way. He's put together. <laughs> As an athlete, I could see it, but I'm going to take the under until I see it, if that makes sense. Completely. I, I'm going to give the new staff a little bit of the benefit of the doubt that they're not just flat out lying when they say that these kids are going to play. I also look at the depth chart and I say, you know, they're going to have to play him unless they're going to go like four deep at receiver this <laughs> That's year. That's fair. I, I mean, you know, they're going to have to play it to some degree. I also think that the with the RPO game and different things that we anticipate being bigger parts of the offense. I, I do think we also have to see them play more. So uh, yeah, I, I, everything you said is fair Vince. I just, I, I think we're going to see that because even in 2021, you know, we saw, we saw Deion Colsey and, and um, Lorenzo styles have some production. I mean, Lorenzo styles called over 20 passes as a freshman, yeah. you know, so we, that, we've seen a freshman recently true. have that, that kind true. of production you know, with Lorenzo catching 24 passes. Now, again, he caught like what eight in the in the in the bowl game, but he still had 16 going into the bowl game, right? So he he did have those catches. So I I do anticipate that uh, where where we'll see some, you know, as long as obviously the freshman got to stay healthy too. But I think we're going to see Jaden Greathouse and and uh, Rico Flores both play this now, year. Now, see if that said Greathouse, I would take the over, sure, because I think he's probably the first freshman in line to get some catches and some touches yeah. and although you know, i could argue vince that based on how the depth chart is as far as we know right now i i think that could change a little bit but if they okay. do start Jaden thomas in the slot to start the season off that means Jaden greathouse is third because he's behind Chris Terry Terry as well too yeah. 
Whereas Rico's probably going to be number two at the field. Okay. Actually, or at the field position, which would be what? Uh, which would be the Z, right? Mm-hmm. That's the chart against me. They're in right. back what they are, what it should be, which is the X is the boundary guy. The Z is the field guy. And then they call the slot guy the F. So uh, as opposed to the W and all that other kind of stuff, which they did before, which I, I never understood. Like, what what is W? Why would W be in the boundary? Like, if I think W, I think wide. I just, whatever. I did. Yeah, no, I've never anyone, understood that. I think he'll be there. Holden stays 400 yards. I'm, I'm going to go under. Yeah, me too. Because that's a lot of yards for a number two tight end. Now, yeah. if, if, if Holden stays wins the starting job, which is certainly possible, then I'd go over. But as of right now, he's, you know, he, he's expected to be behind Mitchell Evans. So 400 yards. Now, would I be happy if Holden stays had 400 yards as the number two tight end? Yes, I would. Because I'd love to see the tight end, per, you know, the, the second and third tight ends get more production. But that's a lot for him. Uh, under you said under for you. I said under. under. Yeah, I I just I think Mitchell Evans is going to start out as the one, and I mean again, if the number two has over four hundred yards, that means that Sam Hartman's really spreading it out. Uh, yeah. I, it it could mean that Holden stays is the starter, like you said, which means maybe there's an injury, maybe there, maybe he's just maybe he just got the he, starting job. Be, exactly. I mean, there's good enough to beat. Absolutely, he's good yeah. enough to beat Mitchell Evans out. Although I don't anticipate because I think Mitchell Evans is pretty good too. Absolutely. I'm sold on Mitchell Evans. I wasn't oh, me too. Him, but I'm sold now. No, I'm sold on Mitchell Evans as well as a as a good to very good tight end in Notre Dame's offense as a Notre Dame tight end, etc. Holden stays. I just I think he's got. He's probably going to end up being the number two when it's all said and done. And if he has 400 yards, man, that means they're really throwing the rock around. Mm-hmm. Um, so. Yeah. I if it was 300, I might say, you know, like a push, you know, in that neighborhood, 400 seems like a lot. But, hey, that would be great if that was the case. Oh, Tobias Merriweather, seven touchdowns. Ooh. I'm going to push on that one. Ooh, that's the number. I'm going to huh? push on that one. Okay. Yeah, I, I think that's about a good number for the for them to have as the leading, rece- leading touchdown guy or either number yeah. one or number two touchdown guy. I think that's a – because again, I expect there to be I expect there to be more touchdown passes this season than there were last season. Notre Dame had 25 last year as for a team that didn't throw the ball very much. So right. they had 25 last year. They're they're gonna have a lot more. They had 30 the year before. They had uh, 15 in 2020, which is still a wild number that Ian Book finished in the top 10 in the I Heisman just, voting with 15 that's, touchdown passes. That's the Notre Thir- Dame stat that yeah. just blows my mind it, it, and it, it always it, will. And played 12 games. So it's not like he oh, no. played eight, like Ohio State played eight games that year, right? Yeah. 2018, they had 23, 20 and 2017, 27 and 16, 25 and 15. So 30 and 14, 27 and 13, 14 and 2012. That's wild. 21 and 2011, and then 28 and 20 in the 2010 season. So I think they're going to be at least 30 which yep. is going to be a higher mark than normal. But I, I don't know that I'm ready to go all the way to like, they're going to have 40 touchdowns, right? Like, I mean, it's again, it's kind of like what you said with the original one, Vince. Like, I, I need to see it. Yeah, I, I need to fair. see that happen. You know, but the leading cu- touchdown guy last year had nine for a team that didn't throw the ball very much. In 2021, they had two guys with seven. In 2020, uh, the leading guy only had five. But again, 12 games, didn't throw the ball a whole lot. Only had 15 the whole year. You had 13 as the leader in 19. The second guy had six, and that was a tight end who missed two games, right? So in 2018, your leader had four. Your number two, your leader had eight. Your number two had four. In 2017, that was five and four on a team that didn't throw the ball very much. 2016, your leader had nine. Your next guy had five and only 12 games. So, you know, your your number one and number two have been close to seven every year. So, yeah. I, I going beyond that would be quite a jump in production. Now, is he capable of that? Absolutely. But I, I think that that just that I could see the yards and catches taking a bigger jump more so than the touchdowns. Okay. Uh, just because, again, he's a sophomore. He needs to get stronger. And, you know, that's where maybe a Deion Coles or the tight ends could have a big or Jaden Thomas could be Jayden much Thomas. bigger red zone weapons because they're older, they're stronger. Sure. Those type of things. But I also goes back to what you said earlier, Vince, where the ball is going to be spread around a lot more. I mm-hmm. think the running backs are going to have some t- some tight end uh, production this year. I think Sam Hartman is going to look at this offense and and the ability to throw the ball to different players and just be outside receivers and, and, and have a field day. He also was a guy, Vince, that was not afraid to throw uh, to the slots when he was when they were in the red zone, which is why. As much, I mean, you look at Wake Forest last year. I mean, they had three receivers with nine or more touchdown catches, and another guy had six. So he's going to spread the ball around quite a bit. 
Uh, and so I think it could be tough for one guy to have a bunch because sure. I don't, I mean, they threw 43 touchdowns last year. I don't see their name getting to that. No, you know? I don't either. I, so I'm, I'm yeah. like 35 is kind of more my number. So yep. 10 extra touchdowns, seven, I'm going to go push for, for Tobias. Cause the tight ends are going to have some, Jaden Thomas sure. is going to have some, Tyree's going to have some, the freshmen are going to have some, the running backs are going to have some, uh, Deion Colsey's going to have some, I'm looking forward to seeing that the ball gets spread around a lot. Oh, it's going to be great. I, for this one, I am going to be a little bit more positive than I have been for the other two. And I'm going to say over. Uh, and I also think that Tobias might be the number two uh, guy sure. and still be over. Um, I, I, I have a feeling I like what they're, what I think they're going to do with Jaden Thomas. I think, especially in the red zone, they're going to move him around. They're going to put him on the outside. They're going to put him at the slot. They're going to put him in motion. I think he's going to have potentially double-digit touchdowns, uh, but I think Tobias is going to be right behind him, and so I'll take the over. Not by much, but I'm going to take the over, and I think he'll be the number two. And Notre Dame offense has at least three All-Americans at season's end. I would say I'll take that. Yeah, I, I would That's too. not necessarily an over-under as much. I think we kind of went away from the over-under there as more, as more of a prediction, and I think that's a fair prediction because you, you expect Joe Walt, barring injury, expect Joe Walt. I think a second offensive lineman is going to be an All-American. Now, whether that's second team, third team, that's I'm yeah, leaving the question. What I don't all count as All-American yeah. is like honorable mention, right? Like that's fair. not really an All-American. That's like you were almost an All-American. It's still very good. <laughs> that's like, honorable I don't, mention. I don't, we mentioned right, I don't count it yeah. as being an All-American, right? Makes sense. So uh, I have him there. Um, I think one of the second – one of the two linemen. And then between, between Hartman and – Audric Estime and a tight end maybe breaking out a receiver. I think somebody else is going to be an All-American at at one of the skill positions. And I know there's going to be other like highly ranked NFL draft pick type guys, but if Sam Hartman is who we think he's going to be, he's going to get All-American accolades this season if if he's healthy and Notre Dame's a 10 plus win team and he's thrown for 37, 3800 yards, he's going to have a chance to outduel you know, some, some big right. name quarterbacks again. So he, he, he might get in there, but that that's going to be a little tougher because there's only three spots where right. with linemen it's 15 with the receivers. It's like eight, six or nine, something like that. So I could see something like that. So two linemen and, and somebody like an Audric or a, sure. a Mitchell Evans, a, one of the receivers, somebody like that breaking out. If I think we can pretty much lock down Joe Alt as an all American, right? Mm -hmm. If, Sam Hartman happens to end up as an All American, first, second, or third team, whatever. Then I, his one of his wide receivers is going to be an All American. Like I just, I, I feel like it's going to be a product of the fact that he's got his numbers are high, and somebody's going to be the product of that. Remember, we had that question. Somebody said, you know, how is Sam Hartman going to be Sam Hartman at Notre Dame because he had all these great receivers at Wake Forest or whatever it was. Maybe that was on Sean Show. I forget exactly what it was, but it's like the chicken and the egg you know, were the receivers great and they made Sam Hartman better or did Sam Hartman make those receivers great? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And, and there's probably a little bit of truth to both sides of those things, but I think just logic says that if Sam Hartman just puts up really good numbers and outduels some guys and does what he needs to do to become an all American, I feel like he's going to bring somebody along with him. Mm -hmm. uh, if that makes sense. So yeah, I, I think that they could very they could very easily have three uh, on offense, which would be awesome because I think they're going to probably have potentially two ish on defense. I mean, that's right. potentially that, yeah. That that's a pretty good haul. I think the other thing too is the expectations for the offense are usually so low that if they are pretty good, <laughs> they kind of point. come out and hey, wow, like they they play. But you know, three All Americans is not a lot if you're talking about first, second, or third team. True. That's the that's the other part of it of um of the conversation too. If we're talking just first team, that I would go under on. If okay. we we're talking about just sure. first team, sure. I would definitely go under on that. Because if you think about how good that that 2005 offense was for Notre Dame and all the numbers they put up, they only had one first teamer, and he wasn't even a first teamer on, but two All American lists. Sure, that's Samarja, who was football writers and sporting news, SI, Pro Football Weekly, ESPN, CBS. Uh, Rivals, all those others did not have him as a first team guy because you had okay. Dwayne Jarrett, you had Calvin Johnson, you had Mike Haas. Yeah. Those guys all earned different All American honors too. So it, if it's first team, I'm, I'm going definitely under. If it's sure, if it's first, second, or third, 
than your mom. I mean, look, as bad as Notre Dame's offense was last year, they had two All-Americans, two first-team yeah. All-Americans last year. You know what I mean? So it's yeah. not yeah. it's not completely absurd to, to think it's possible. That's a good question, though, man. We could have done a lot more time on these. <laughs> yep. That's a good question. Yep, I like those. Good way to start. Good way yeah, to start. We have, a, we have a couple Super Chats down here, too. Okay. We got one. Here we go. So let's get to those, too. Tyler Evans, thank you very much for the Super Chat. Can you guys give me your top three unrealistic fan bases in college football? Oh man, that's a good uh-huh. one. That's a really because if if you give me a top ten, I could have probably named them a lot easier. Top three unrealistic fans. Let's throw some. Let's throw some out there, right? I mean, the multiple SEC teams. Cause... Yeah, I mean Auburn is to me number one. I mean okay. the fact that Auburn has, you know, chasing coaches out two years after winning titles. That that yeah. they're a very unrealistic I fan mean, base. Texas A&M is another one. It's going like, to sound ridiculous. Um, be, oh, no, I, sh- I shouldn't say ridiculous. It's going to sound petty for me to say this, but LSU, for very similar reasons, right? I feel yeah. like they're very unrealistic. I mean, they're going to be probably good this year, but... See, I'm, I'm looking like more big picture, not just this season. I'm looking more just overall. Like, who are who are unre- unrealistic fan bases in general? Not so much this season. In general, LSU fans should expect their team to compete for titles. I mean, that's what LSU should be doing. They've won three titles since 2000, right? I mean, True. the expectation should be you're a really good, you're competing for the SEC West most years. And, you know, you, you, when your team starts getting dominated by your rivals like they were with by Alabama, you can understand why they get a little tired of, of some of those coaches. And if Ed Orgeron's not doesn't win that title in 2019, he's done. Right. I mean, so I think they have very high standards. I th- I would say they used to be that way until their program proved they could win a bunch of titles. Then then it became a little bit more like, OK, now they now they have more validity to feel the way that they feel. Right. Um, I think Auburn's the one for me, because the reason I go Auburn and Texas A&M, it's because like you're expecting your team to be like this elite program and you don't have the history of it. And you're not even the best team in your state. And in sometimes, in the case of Texas A&M, you're not even the second best team in your state. So I think Texas A&M's uh, last national title was like in the 30s. Let me look at it. Their claimed national championships. Yeah, their last claimed national title events was in 1939. So two years before nice. Pearl Harbor was bombed by the Japanese, right? Because there's a history question in there today. You know, like, so if you're thinking you're a powerhouse program, you're very unrealistic. Right. Because they, they're, they're the, uh, we throw enough money at it, enough right. at a coach, enough at the players that right. we're going to win. Auburn's another one. They have two national titles, 1957 and 19, 2010. Two claimed national titles. They only have four unclaimed national titles, Vince. 1913, 1983, 93, and 2004. Only one, one of those actually How do you unclaim them? beef. Well, because that? some some service gave you a title, and so it, but it wasn't maybe necessarily one of the main services, right? So like, and then the way that you do it, like back in the day, is teams used to some outlets would hand out championships before the bowl games. Yeah, and so like there was one year, one of the years Alabama claims a national championship is a year that Notre Dame smoked them in a bowl game or beat them in a bowl game. I don't think it's the actual year that they smoked them. It's the year they beat them in a bowl game, I believe. So there's one year where I believe Alabama claims a national title. The uh, same year that Notre Dame does. The same year that Notre Dame does. Right. Okay. And it was a year that they played each other. I believe it was 19. Let's see, when's that their claimed national titles? Let me see here. National championship season. So 1973 that would be... is a year that Notre Dame claims a national title, and so does so does Alabama. <laughs> Notre Dame beat Alabama in the Sugar Bowl. And Lou, that's Lou Samoji has told me that's his favorite game ever. He's he's like showed me the clip. That's the one where I think it was Tom McClements hit Robin Weber out of the end zone and, you know, uh, along the sideline there. The yeah. yeah. And, but, but Alabama claims it because they were awarded the national championship before the bowl games. Why would people so do that? By, yes. Because bowl games were considered different. So the coaches poll back then gave them the title. Wow. And so it, I guess it wasn't until I'm reading it here the next year, but AP didn't give their title out until after the bowl game. So, the coaches poll went to Bama. The AP poll went to Notre Dame because Notre Dame beat them. And I think it, I'm reading it here. It looks like the next year the coaches poll started going to after the bowl games <laughs> because they embarrassed themselves. The yeah, before. I, I would imagine there had been a growing cry about that before. <laughs> but so uh, 
you know, but that's that's how you can have a, a claimed national title versus unclaimed. But other yeah. other times, like Notre Dame has several unclaimed national championships uh, because it's a year where it's not one of the main, right, the main like networks. There's like a there's years where six or seven national champions are declared, but you only recognize like AP coaches, like UPI was the coaches. There was a couple others that over the years were recognized that that uh that have evolved over the years like notre dame has 11 unclaimed national championships including 2012 hmm. so i'm trying to Ooh. see who that was who named wow. them national champs in 2012 wow that's an interesting one i'm trying to see that one they're just throwing so, years up against the wall and see what sticks like <laughs> well it might be one of those ones that you know i mean I, they're undefeated who, who knows yeah you know. i'm not sure i'm not sure what that one is but uh wow that's an interesting one. I don't, I don't yes, know who no, who named Notre Dame the 2012 national champs, but the point is, is that just goes to show that like there's just all these yeah. there's just all these um, outlets that hand out titles, right? And you recognize it, like, hey, this is an unclaimed one, but you only claim Notre Dame only claims the big ones. If, uh, somebody told me one time, and I can't remember what it was, but somebody told me if if Notre Dame claimed championships the way that Alabama does, they'd have like almost 20. Something wow. like that. I don't know. I don't know the specific number of that, but there's something like that. I mean, if there's, so every, and if every there's eleven unclaimed, what's yeah? If there's right. eleven unclaimed, so to speak, that's right. twenty-two, right? right? But I don't I mean, think Notre Dame, but Alabama doesn't claim every title. Okay. Like Alabama has some they unclaimed titles as well. They, they right. pick and choose. Right. Well, they have a criteria. It just it's theirs cute. is more loose than <laughs> right. Notre Dame's. Right. So Alabama has eighteen claimed and five unclaimed. If that kind of gives you a sense of 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 what we're talking about so wow. it's it's kind of funny i'm looking at this there's a there's multiple years where where they claim they have an unclaimed championship the, the year that notre dame does has a, a claimed one so like one of their unclaimed championships was 1977 hmm. the year that notre dame won it so yeah. uh yeah it's interesting very interesting so uh, good good question uh auburn is one so we just said that texas a m is another Third one, you said LSU. Yeah, I'm gonna I go. I where you're coming from with that. I, yeah, I would say. See, I, I have a hard time with unrealistic versus like unbearable. Like, <laughs> you yeah. know what I mean? Like, yeah, I would throw Florida in there as my third. Okay, in, when you're a team that fires Dan Mullen a year after he played for the SEC title and all and took Bama down to the wire a year that Bama won the title. And the two years before that was a 10 plus win team, and you fire him in the middle of year four because they're struggling. You are an unrealistic fan base. You have won championships under two coaches who were legends. You were a barely 500. They were like a their win percentage outside of the spur. Because I, I talked about this in a show or a show or on the message board one time. You know, or it might have been a show. Oh, it was the show I did a couple weeks ago, the midweek rundown. Okay. Where I was talking about like you need a dynamic coach to be a title contender more more often than not. And I talked about how Florida, outside of the Urban Meyer and Steve Spurrier, era, is like a 580 win percentage. 580 wow. win percentage. And they've been a football program since like 1911. Long time. Yeah. But outside of that Spurrier and Meyer stretches, they're like 580. Well, those guys were in the 800s. Mm -hmm. Right. So you're firing Dan Mullen in year four. After he went well, 11 games, 10 games, and then they went eight and four his second year or his third year, but they played in the SEC championship that game. And you fired him the next year, you're an unrealistic fan base. Flo Florida's in there for me. They're cool. absolutely in there for me. So that that would be one. You have any others? I mean, like you said, the, if we were to get into uh, <laughs> unbearable, that's a different right. list. Right. Very exactly. different list. And so I have a hard time differentiating, to be honest with you. So I'm going to keep my hate to myself on this one uh because it's it's strong yeah another super chat from rob osgood guys as the head coach how would you develop an attitude of don't take your foot off dominance and especially among the offensive linemen defensive linemen a mean streak y'all are amazing and sign up for the boards great intel thanks rob i think everyone should definitely do that at boards at ourbreakdown.com thank you right for that there. little plug right rob there at the bottom so a couple things, Vince. I think these are different things, but they kind of tie together. Sure. Right. So, so the first one is don't take the foot off uh, the gas type of thing. I think that's established in practice number one, where hey guys, there's no periods where we're not going hard, right? Because right. I've always I've always been a believer that I I never liked the whole we're going three quarters today thing. I would all say if we want to take some pressure off of them, then let's limit the reps that they're getting that the starters sure. are getting. Hey, uh, our starters are only going to get. 
uh, 15 team reps today instead of 30 or our starters are going to get 10 or they're going to go the first session of team. They're going to get, you know, five plays and then we're going to get the second and third and then they're going to get five plays. And then the rest of the team period is going to be second and thirds. I don't ever want a period where, you know, like a three quarters period, because right. now you're putting in their mind that it's acceptable for them to go three quarters at some point in time. Right. So I've never, I've too. never been, that happens a lot in college. And, and it's, at least where I've coached, I've seen it at Notre Dame. I just have, and I understand the thought behind it. Cause Hey, this is not a full go deal. That's fine. But then use this as a day where you're just going to get more reps for your younger guys or shorten practice, make it a shorter practice and go Sacrilege. hard for 45 minutes, but go hard yeah. and, and limit the reps and limit the length of the practice. So I, I think that's part of it. It's just, Hey, when we're out here, we're going uh, I think that there's things you can do, uh, little things like, hey, when we go from drill to drill, we're we're hustling over there. Now, you can stop and get your water once you get there, but we're going from drill to drill. And I would have practices that are just nonstop. Now, there's different times in a practice where, hey, the O-line can go down there and get a breather here real quick and get some water because we're doing special team. We're doing, you know, doing kickoff right now or kick return, and there's different times that those things can happen. But, guys, when we're moving, we're moving. And then when you get into games, you never you never change who you are. When you get into games, if you have a big lead, keep 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 playing. Yeah. Now you 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 know you put your backups in the game. Let your let your backup quarterback throw the football. Now, am I running, you know, a a sprint out right throwback trick play type of thing? As I've always said, no, I'm not running reverses. I'm not, you know. But will I run a jet sweep? Yeah, it's part of who I am. It's part of what we do. That's part of our offense. I want my backup slot to get some some chances on that as well. But I'm going to drop, step, drop back and throw the football. If you're a team that throws the football a lot and you put your backups in the game and you just hand it off the whole time, what, how have you prepared them to go play if their number gets called? Right? right, Those kids are busting their humps Monday to Friday, and they get a chance to play, and we're going to say, well, we're not going to let you run the offense. So I just think that's something that you have too. But it's got to be established Monday to Friday with just, hey, we're competing. You know, I, I like doing things where, I, you know – I. There's some things that some teams will do where they'll say, hey, look, if you're getting a handoff, you don't stop till you get to the end zone. I, I think sometimes you can do things that are a little bit, okay, that's too far because now, again, you're not doing something that's realistic. But when we do a drive, you know, we're not stopping until we get to the end zone or we're, you know, we're, we're, we're doing something like this. And the other thing too, Vince, is put some skin in the game, right? Like, hey, whoever wins this team period right here is – you know, getting out of sprints today or whatever the case may be. Sure. You, you, you where and that's something I like from Coach Freeman is that, yeah, that competition that all, there's thing. There's always right? competition. Yeah. So I, you know, don't ever lose that. I do like that. So uh, the mean streak is just developed with what you demand from them on a daily basis from a comp comp competing level, but it's also partly just who, what kind of players are you recruiting? Mm -hmm. And there's another sure. question that we have, Vince, that 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 kind of follows into this. That we'll we'll get to. Let me see if I can find it because it was a it was a really good question that kind of plays into this, and it was about the killer instinct and can you can you develop that and my whole thing is yeah but it's not me as a college coach that's developing that it's mom and dad it's uh, pop warner coach it's absolutely it's being developed way before i got here if the kid doesn't have that here, here it's a gamer here we go uh, vanilla chill asked can the gamer mentality be developed or is it just a natural occurrence of players it can be developed but not by me right. it's gotta he's already got to have that in and by the time he gets to me and that's developed at a younger age so, you know, those, those things are kind of, so recruit those kind of guys, recruit Absolutely. those type of players uh, that, that have that dom. I mean, Quentin Nelson didn't have that, that the, the attitude he had because of what Harry Heastan did. Harry Heastan brought out the best of him, but Q showed up with that desire to be a hard to worker and a, and a mean, tough guy. And then they were able to kind of bring out some of the vocalness, the leadership and things like that. But he had that, that mean streak was already there. And, and uh, so I, th I think you, I think you don't develop that. You just enhance it. It's like with anything you, you recruit players that have it and then enhance it once they get here. I will also say that one of the things talking about, you know, don't take your foot off dominance, et cetera. I think part of that is also you put a bit, a bit of the onus back on the players too. And it's, and it's a, it's a program developing thing, but ever when I was playing and when I was coaching, you know, the starters and the, the I shouldn't say the good players, but like the ones that understood how football programs are put together, they understood how important the the scout team guys were and the second team guys and the guys that helped them get better every day. And when you get up to like the Notre Dame level, the power five level, those guys understand for the most part, what a program is and why it's successful and all of those things. And so 
I, as a coach, would put it back on those guys and be like, look, if we don't take care of our business, then those guys don't get to play. And that's on you. And they want those guys to play. They want, have you ever seen, you know, like uh, on a basketball team when a bench guy gets in, he hits a three or something. Usually the starters are the first ones out of their seats cheering and all, they want those guys to be successful. Same thing in a football program, right? When a, a one running back scores a touchdown, the other running backs in the room are all fired up and pumped up for them, you know, all that kind of stuff, right? They want to get those guys on the field. So I put it back on the starters. I'm like, look, yeah, we're going to go out and do our thing. We are going to execute our game plan. And if you execute it with the way you're supposed to, then the guy that's been getting you ready all week long, he gets to get in and get on the field at Notre Dame Stadium and be a guy. That's on you. So I I think those guys can – I used to do that at the high school level. I know you can do it at the college level. Put the onus back on the players. It's your program. You want those guys to be successful? Put it on them. And so that's that's part of building the program and all of that. Good stuff, Vince. Good stuff. I wanted to pull something up to make you happy. Uh oh. In response to Tyler Evans talking about the three unrealistic fan bases, <laughs> Chris W said Michigan, the Wolverines, and the Maze and Blue. <laughs> it's like that is an answer out of Vince's own heart. Like, it was right at the tip of my tongue. Very well done, my friend. Yes, it very is. Very well done. So people said Ohio State. I don't think Ohio State's fan base is unrealistic at all. They win. They should absolutely be competing for championships. They've done it in the last decade. Yeah. They've been in the title game one other time. They took the defending champs this past year down to the wire, lost. If they hit a 50-yard field goal at the end from one of the best kickers they've had in a while, they're playing for a championship again and probably win it. So they're, they're a team that absolutely should have expectation. Now, if we're talking about unbearable fan bases, then yes, Ohio State's in my top five. Yeah, but if right. we're talking about unrealistic – I mean, the only way Ohio State can say that they're it's unrealistic if it's like if they're if it's the so well we should go thirteen and zero for seven straight years and yeah I mean <laughs> I mean everybody says kind of that but like they expect their right. team to be a championship team every year they expect to be Michigan every year well guess what they've done that they've won championships mm -hmm. and two mm -hmm. they went through over a decade where they beat Michigan every year so I don't think that's unrealistic at all I think they're unbearable they drive me nuts some of them <laughs> although right. I'll say this Vince. In the last four or five months, I've encountered a lot more reasonable Ohio State fans on social media and in our okay. chat. Like literally before Archer joined our show, I had literally outside of my family never engaged with a reasonable, like kind, thoughtful Ohio State fan. And keep in mind, I spent 18 years you of lived, my life yeah. living in Ohio. Actually, right. no more than that. So I, I lived there till I was, I was coaching 15, too. And then came back for a year to coach. So that's 16. Spent two more years there and then spent another year in, as an adult when I was a youth. So like 19 years that's of my 19. life, I spent in Ohio. So outside of my family, I have never met a Ohio State fan you could have a in Ohio that you could have a conversation with. We've actually had several in our chat that have had I mean, that, you know, a couple flamers and we've booted some people out. But we've had even more lately. I think Travis Shuttleworth is a guy that I see as Ohio State fan that'll do kind of the OHIO thing, but like in as far as he engages, very reasonable, likes to talk football, stuff like that. So I'll be honest, uh, I've actually engaged a few of them on social media lately that are actually like, I could talk ball with this guy. They're still the very small minority. <laughs> 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 they went from none to at least five, you know what uh, I mean? Which is right. nice. Well, I... But it is nice to know that they're at least out there. Sure. Right. So that's good to know. I, I, uh, I like to think there's at least a faction of sane football fans for every group out there. I actually know what I think. I would be curious if the people that I've met, like Travis Shuttleworth is one. So if you're Travis, if you're there, Travis, answer this question. If some of the others, Ohio State fans, do you actually live in Ohio? Because like Archer doesn't. Oh, I think I didn't that know kind that. of plays in. He lives, I don't think he lives in Ohio. So I think that might maybe that might play in it because you're not being fed the red meat by those or you know you're, you're not in the cult you know you're, you're you're a cult member but you're living right. away from the cult right so you're not as influenced I'm I'm kind of joking a little bit about that but um, I wonder I wonder I'm curious about that I, I will also that. say I have met very sane Michigan fans that I work with on a daily basis who I've coached with you know things like that. It's just, man, no, when they turn not on their Vince, they just <sighs> pretend to be yeah. in public settings. When they turn on but their Michigan, really man, it's hard. Yeah. It's hard. Yeah. yeah. It's hard. 
they keep it in for for you know it's it's all it's it's, it's all hidden. Yeah, it's all hidden. <laughs> there are no reasonable making. <laughs> that's probably that's the one thing to, we can know. How State fans nice. can agree with us on, right? There yeah, are no right. reason. There are no reasonable Michigan fans. I was trying to be nice, man. I'm trying to turn over a new leaf here a little no, bit. No, you're not. All right. No, I could I'm just not. see you cringing as you were saying. Oh, and, you're like, <sighs> and I've got like navy blue on right now. And it's all right. All right. Matt, but that's Notre Dame color, man. It's true. Because see, it's yeah. IB Nation, baby. It's a Notre Dame color. Saw an IB Nation fan today sitting next nice. to me in the barber chair. Very nice. I'm, I'm sitting there. No, quick story. I'm sitting there in the barber chair getting my hair cut. And I have my glasses off for obvious reasons because they're cutting my hair. And all of a sudden, this guy sitting next to me, he's like, so how was your vacation, Vince? And I'm like, what? <laughs> it was, all right. So we had a nice little conversation. I mean, it was good. But like, what's was, awesome is you get recognized more in public than I do. I don't know why. Awesome. It was just awesome. Yeah. It was funny. I saw him walk in. He kind of gave me like a look. And I had this shirt on, yeah. so I'm sure that helped. Because you rock IB uh, stuff everywhere, which I absolutely time. love. I absolutely all the time. Love. <laughs> I'm a walking billboard, baby. <laughs> what I do. I told you, I'll drive the car with the IB stuff on it. I will do that in a heartbeat. Uh, anyway. All Get right. Some IB stickers. <laughs> but yeah, Raymond Hort Harton with a super chat says, hey, guys, happy Friday. Hope we get good news after the barbecue this month. Go Irish. Well, we'll see. I mean, I think it's certainly possible. I, I, I wouldn't say that there's a guy that's coming to commit. I don't believe that that there's someone right now that I feel that way, but there's definitely a few guys that I'm like, if the visit goes well, I could see I could see something happening. Yeah, I, I was talking to Ryan actually this afternoon, yeah. and uh, he was asked if I was doing the mailbag. I was like, yeah, he's like, good. I got a lot of work to do. And uh, I made a joke. I was like, oh, you got to write all those recruiting, those uh, commitment stories. He's like, man, he goes, I just have a feeling I'm going to be really busy. I was yeah. like, my man. Yeah. Okay. Sounds good. So uh, take that for whatever you, you guys want to take it as, but uh should be fun. The, the, the barbecue should be fun. I know that Ryan is very enthusiastic about the 25 class. Yes. And for good reason. For good reason. There's yeah. a lot of talent in there, man. Pete Weber. And, and, and a lot of interest in Notre, uh, early interest in Notre Dame. Yes. Too. Yes, exactly. A lot of guys who love Notre Dame to begin with, which is awesome. So, all right. Pete Weber, the, uh, the all American bowler. I remember watching Pete Weber. All right. Thank you for the super chat, Pete. Very much. That's that real obnoxious guy that's always like, yeah, he's like, okay. Woo! Yeah. You know, the, yeah. That's the guy. I made bowling exciting. I mean, it's bowling. But anyway, Brian and I Vince, like thanks. Bowling. For, Don't hate on you, bowling. I'm a very good I bowler. I like bowling. I, okay. There's not many sports out there that you can like eat, you know, drink pops and have a great time and still do well. So. Eat pizza, go out there and throw I love, a strike. And I love greasy pizza, so we're good. <laughs> like, it's right up my alley, man. <laughs> so, anyway, thanks for the super chat, Pete. Uh, Brian and Vince, thanks for the great content and intel. Special teams was a major highlight last season. What have you heard about the unit for 2023? I mean, honestly, not a ton, just because the two the 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 primary specialist as far as place kicker and and uh, and and. Field goals has not been on campus yet. Romy, he, he's, at least he's for the there. spring, he is there now. He's there, yeah. I don't know if Bryce McPherson or uh, Ben Krim is going to be the starter. We didn't see a ton of Bryce this spring. Right. I think we saw him punting once. So not a ton. I think the one thing that I've heard, the only thing that I could say I've really heard from special teams is how athletic they they feel they are going to be in coverage in special teams there's a, I mean because you've got the rising sophomores are now going to get more opportunities and then the freshman class is going to have some guys can do that so I think other than that I haven't heard a ton honestly but I, and I'll be honest too I don't ask a lot about it to be honest with you like right. I only get so many times and go to the well with sources to ask them for stuff like you know how special teams is usually not right you know something that I really you know, because it's it's such a do your job type of thing. It, you don't really need elite a bunch of five stars running down to be good in coverage. It's like just do your job, yep. you know, kind of thing. So, just not I, something I ever think to. Right. Let me let me use this bullet on this. You know, <laughs> right, right. I was going to ask about how you know the freshmen whatevers are doing, but let's talk special teams. Yeah. Yeah. And 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 as much as I criti- I was critical. Or I question the the Marty Biaggi hire. I highly doubt that Marty Biaggi would be very welcome to me reaching out to see how what he thinks of the special teams. Highly doubt that one. But uh, I I will know. say from a special team standpoint, um, I got to hear Marty 
speak a little bit um, at the camp that my kid went to. And he talked about recruiting and he talked to the parents and, you know, all of those different things. And I, I like, I like him and, and he seems like he's got a good head on his shoulders. Seems like a really good dude. It, he it's understands, not personal. I just, he understands special teams. Yeah. He was a kicker. You know, he talked about his journey and all of those different things. And that's an area events where his teams have been very good. They're very good in the kicking and punting. Right. Like that's something it, it, the issues have been the return game and at times the coverage. Those have gotcha. been very inconsistent. Gotcha. But one thing we have consistently seen from him is his kickers and punters are usually really good because that's what he did. I mean, he, he exactly did that. You don't have a lot of special teams coaches that were yeah. actually specialists. Right. Uh, so, again, and I've heard nothing but great. Th- I've heard he's a good recruiter. I've heard nothing but good things about him. It's just my job is to look at what yeah, he's done sure. and give an honest opinion. Right. right. Whether I think he's a good guy or not. And. Right. I have my questions and concerns. I, I hope that he proves me wrong. I hope that Absolutely. he goes out there and he's a great special teams coach. I just kind of looked at it like, you know, there was one guy that I thought they should have made run a run at because of the results. And I do have a personal relationship with him. I don't hide that. But I was really hoping that they would have made a run at the LeVar Woods at Iowa. I mean, they're consistently in the top 10 in special teams. And I would have been like, man, I know he's an Iowa grad. I still would have made a run at it. And I don't think sure. that they did. But man, he he had been a good one. Yeah, so we'll see how. I mean, I liked. I saw the uh, the Schaefer kid uh, kick a little bit. It's got a got a good leg. You know what I mean. So mm-hmm. I think from a kicking and a punting standpoint, they're going to be just fine. I think you're absolutely right. I think from a coverage and a return uh, aspect, w- the jury's still out. I mean, that's not the stuff they're practicing right now. Like, right. it's just. Not. I mean, they are, but just not in a way that you're going to be able to evaluate. Exactly. It, right? yeah, that's exactly right. So we'll. We're not even really going to know much watching fall camp either. I mean. We just don't see a whole lot of special team. We see special teams drills, right? Uh, which is always riveting, uh, mostly because we get to see who's actually doing the returning. Uh, but other than that, how the kicks and the punts, we see a little bit of that. But we're not going to know special teams until the season starts. I mean, we're just not. I want to address a couple things here, Vince. One is a comment from Archer. Oh, uh, yes. That he said, uh, he said, I don't foresee Hartman being an All-American. It's not because he's not good. I just expect... Caleb and Drake to have two spots and then someone like Travis, Penix, Daniels, et cetera, getting That's the fair. third spot. couple things. I, I get your point, number one. Number two, I, I have a feeling Drake May is not going to have the production he did last year, and it's not because he's not really good. I just – losing Josh Downs, they lost some linemen. They've got a new coordinator. There's just some unknowns, and I'm just not quite sure how they're going to be. I hope that I'm wrong because I really like watching Drake May play, but I'm, I, I've just got some question marks about North Carolina this season, uh, number one. Number two – a lot of those guys, though, are kind of known commodities where they are. And those guys t- kind of get picked apart a little bit. If I were to make a preseason prediction for All-American, I would I would probably go Caleb Williams and Drake. I don't know who my third would be right now. Jordan Travis is definitely not a guy that I think should just automatically uh, get that spot. Number one, Sam Hartman is 3-0 and against Jordan Travis, and everybody just ignores that. Number two, Sam Hartman in each of the last two years has been si- significantly more productive than Jordan Travis, the difference is, is one guy's at Florida State and one guy's at Wake Forest. So when the guy at Florida State does something good, we all talk about it because we care about Florida State. But when Sam Hartman's putting up unreal numbers and becomes a – have you ever seen a quarterback jump into the top 20 of the all-time numbers and get so little attention as what yeah. Sam Hartman has done yeah. during his career at Wake Forest? You know, and and uh, leads Wake Forest to a big ACC title, and the only conversation had is, "Wow, how bad is the is the is the ACC that Wake Forest is getting to the to the to the championship game?" You know, no Clemson, no. How about we praise the kid who put that team on his shoulders, threw for forty thousand yards, and had fifty touchdowns? Nope, that's not the narrative, because so much of sports media today is narrative driven as opposed to just analyzing and providing analysis. You do those things at Notre Dame, however, and you're getting exactly. talked about. Yeah, and and so I I think that you're going to see that. So I, I, and then the thing that's going to hurt Michael Penix is the fact that he plays in Pac-12 and he's not Caleb Williams, and yeah. he's going to be overshadowed. I I think Michael Penix should absolutely be in the conversation. Jaden Daniels, I'm not as completely sold on because the again, the numbers aren't going to be there. I I just don't see him playing in an offense that's going to allow him to put up the kind of big time numbers you need to be an All American. I think there's some other guys that'll put up better numbers that will be in the conversation to me uh for that spot than maybe Jaden Daniels but I also I, but I also said I don't think I said he will be an all-american uh I I'm not predicting and I said it'll be harder with those guys where there's only three of them I said it'll be tougher for that but I think to just dismiss it as a possibility I think misses the boat sure. a little bit on 
what an All-American is, and it, it kind of gets to the fact that you know he's going to have opportunities against yes. one of those guys that you mentioned to go toe-to-toe. Let's just say hypothetically that Sam Hartman throws for 3,700 yards and accounts for 38 touchdowns, and he outplays Caleb Williams in a one-on-one. You don't think that there's a chance he could be a third-team All-American this year? Right? I, I think there is. I'm not predicting it, but I – Certainly there is. And, There's a and, path to it. And Jordan Travis being the first guy that gets mentioned, that's the one. I And I like Jordan Travis. I do. And I've talked about him being a top five quarterback, but there's just this kind of assumption that he's going to – like the guy hasn't – guy's owned three against Sam Hartman and has yet to have as many touchdowns or as yards, total yards, as Sam Hartman has had. So I just don't quite see that uh, – this assumption that that he's going to be – he's going to be better. That's number one. Number two – you know, I want to point something out, and I'm, I'm David Lowe. Please don't take this personally, but this is you. You always ask me why do I keep saying you're negative. I'm going to give you a perfect example. His question is, Brian, what record would be a disappointing season for you in 20? That's a negative question. Like, what's your expectations for Notre Dame in 23? What will it be, take for you to say they've at least hit the floor? But instead, and then that's just one, may not sound bad, but then the next question is the 22 linebackers were elite and 23 are very good. What in y'all's position do you think happened with this year's recruiting line? It's just always this kind of question. It's like, what happened? It's a bad linebacker year. Al Golden's not doing a good job. We have talked about this a lot. This isn't a new thing. I don't think Al Golden did a very good job, and it's not a good linebacker class. But number three is, last I checked, Linebacker recruiting's not over with yet. Last I checked, there's still a guy out there that's a top 100 player, in my view, and in view of others, that has not committed yet and is torn 50-50 right now between Ohio State and Notre Dame. So how about we let the class play out before we just assume it's going to suck? Uh, So what happened? Al Golden hasn't done a good job. It's a bad linebacker class. I'll I'll answer the question, but I just – I just, you know what it is, Vince, And, and it's not even just about David. There's just I'm going to do an article next week and my my midweek rundown next week. I already know the topic. It's why I'm excited about this season, because I think is what has happened in David's defense is this has been a horrible PR offseason for Notre Dame in a lot of ways. Right. Tommy Reese leaves for Bama. You have the Andy Ludwig situation. You know, Matt Luke turns them down. Harry Heastan retires. Coordinator left. You know, Brian Mason leaves for the NFL. Yeah. There's been the recruiting storylines, which, again, I think are misguided. Because, as I said, if you flip when guys commit and have C.J. Carr and Cam Williams and guys like that committing this summer, the narrative is completely different. You know, but it's like been a bad PR offseason for Notre Dame. It's just like the hits keep coming, right? When In reality, what's happening in Notre Dame is no different than what happens at other places. I mean, Nick Saban got turned down for jobs, right? And, you know, and he hires Notre Dame's guy that all the fans think is no good. Uh, but, you know, it to me, I'm ex- I'm very – even a good friend of mine who's a very reasonable guy last night was just like, man, I'm just – I'm not fired up about this season. And you kind of get to why. And it's, it's again, it's, it's just the negativity that's been surrounding the program. But I'm looking at this roster, Vince, and I'm like, dude, I'm excited about this team. Mm-hmm. Me too. And for a lot of reasons. Like, we had some of the message board – I'll read you the quote that he he said. I, I gave I did an article today at IrishBreakdown.com. I have the offensive version coming out tonight, but it's you know look for Notre Dame to be a, a championship team this year, they like they need stars to emerge. The, the 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 lead into the article says, hey, not every team with stars wins a championship, but nobody that wins a championship doesn't have stars, right? You need stars to emerge, and there's six guys that I think are capable of that at Notre Dame. Will they all six be it? If they do, then this team's going to win a championship. But I don't sure. think, you know, just they need some of them. And one of the ones I discussed was Riley Mills. And a response to Riley Mills was, he goes, uh, he's a solid guy, but nothing special. Just don't see it. I don't see the explosiveness, you know, these type of things. And I'm thinking like, you know, it's interesting how some people view certain things, right? And it's just like, right. And he talks about how he's not like Sheldon Day and Jerry Tiller. I'm like, I'm like, but he produces at a much better per snap basis than either one of those guys did. And he has more career sacks coming into his senior season than either one of those guys did. And I remember a lot of the whole, well, Sheldon Day hasn't broken out yet. So he just, he is what he is. You know, Jerry Tillery is a nice player, but he just has never been that difference maker. He is what he is. We heard that before the four, the 15 and the 18 seasons as well. And those guys broke out. 
But I think that's what's happened is, is I, I think a lot of fans have just kind of been overwhelmed with just the constant negativity. And it's really kind of soured the outlook for the season. And I actually get that to a degree. But the more I try to convince myself that maybe my expectations are too high, Vince, I just I'm like, man, I, I, I can't not do it. Like, I'm going to go watch this game again. And it's going to humble me and make me remind me why this team isn't that good. And then I watched them like, man, this team's actually really talented. They just clean up these dumb things that they're doing. They're going to be pretty good, you know. And uh, even the Stanford game, I'm like, this is terrible. But I'm like, but I know this isn't who that team is. Right. And and so, you know, I, I constantly like I, defensive tackle. I'm doing an article on the defensive tackle. They had more tackles last year as a unit than they've had since – Mike Elko showed up right by a lot. They had, this was the second most tackles for loss last year and the most sacks they've had or the last two years are the two best years Notre Dame has had in defensive tackle production. And a lot of the guys that have done that are responsible for that are back, you know? And so there's just a lot of things where I look at this team and I say, man, I'm actually really excited about this team. I, I really am. Uh, and, and what would it be that would disappoint me to that point, David? I think when you, to answer your question about what record would be disappointing it's really going to kind of come down to for each person, what are your expectations for the team? And for me, anything worse than 10 and two with no blowouts would be disappointing to me. 10 and two with a bad blowout to one of the big three or somebody would be disappointing to me. Yep. Yep. You know, that's how you get two, to 10 and two. Cause yeah, that's like if, if they go 10 the and two floor for me, and let's just say they go one and two against the big three and their competitive games, I'm not happy, mm -hmm. but it's at least a step. It's not where they need to be. They need to do better. Right. I'm not going to call it a success, but there's a difference between being some, saying it's not, it's a success or not, and saying I'm disappointed. Ten and two with two very competitive games against whoever you you know lose to be of the big three is man. You got to get better, but you know what? You took a big step. You went from eight and four to ten and two. You battled. Your schedule in 2024 is going to be much easier. Than, you know, at the top than 23, et cetera, et cetera. There's reasons to be optimistic. Anything worse than that, Vince, to me would be very disappointing. Because if you Agreed. go like nine and three, for example, either one, you lost to all three of the big teams, Which, or yeah. you lost to two of them and then lost to somebody else that you shouldn't be losing to. Right. That would be disappointing for me. But there are some people that think that the ceiling for the, this team is nine and three. So if, if that's your if that's your belief, then obviously you're gonna disappointing for you would be seven and five, something like that. But for me, I think 10 wins is the floor, the minimum floor for this yep. football team. Yep. And consider, it depends on how they get there. Right, they won. They lost eight games. They won eight games last year with a significantly inferior roster than what they're going to have this year, in mm -hmm. my opinion. Significantly, because the receivers are going to be significantly better, the quarterback is going to be significantly better. I think that there's more depth because the really good freshman class is now sophomores. They have another very good, for even better freshman class coming in with a lot of guys that are ready to play. I'm excited about this team. Yeah. I really am. And I'm going to give my, my midweek rundown is going to start next week with here are 10 reasons why I'm excited about this football season because, and, and they're not like BS, like it's just football and I love football, like where I'm going to break down this team and why I believe this team has a chance to be much better than even a lot of Notre Dame fans think that they are. This is probably the most, the least optimism I have seen about a team in a while. And I, from, I, I from part fans. of me just wonders yeah. if maybe some fans are just, I don't want to get excited because I don't want to get crushed again. I'm tired of getting crushed again. And I, I, get, I get that. that. Yeah. I get that. I completely understand that. I would just say, but don't deprive yourself of the joy that you get in the lead up, right? It's it's okay to be excited about this team. And if they're not good enough, then we can discuss why and they can get better. But don't, you know, you're going to feel miserable enough if they're not good, as good as you want, at least enjoy this part of it. Right? right. That's kind of my, that's kind of my thing, but I, I'm, I'm excited about the scene, but David, man, I, I do love you, man. But like, this is the kind of stuff that I'm talking about, man, where it's just like, both of your questions are, are premised in a negative, a negative. And it just is kind of like, that's kind of what I'm talking about. So <laughs> That is what it is, but uh, I do appreciate. He keeps coming back, man. I, he does. I, 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 I give him a hard time in the chat, and he keeps coming back. And he I keeps do, coming back for and more. I do very much appreciate that. I do, I do, because a lot of people, when you when you push back on them, you criticize them, they just tuck tail and run. But David doesn't. He comes back every day, and I do appreciate that. I do. Super chat from Nathan. Thank you very much, Nathan. What critical questions about Notre Dame coaches and players need answers? before you'd give Notre Dame the edge against OSU, USC, 
or Clemson? Well, I think Notre Dame has the edge against USC in, in a lot of spots. It just is going to come down to the quarterback position. Sure. And the head coach position. I mean, that that Lincoln Riley's proved a lot more as a head coach than Marcus Freeman has. It really comes just, down to that. There's sure. there's just a, there's more knowns on in in the leadership positions for that side of the for that team. But I think if you look roster, you know, go roster and break it down, I think Notre Dame still has the better roster top to bottom. I think USC is gaining on them with the way what they've done in the portal and, and some of the incoming freshmen they've landed. Certainly, I think USC has done a lot to improve their roster the last two years, without question. This is not even remotely close to the same team that Notre Dame played, you know, two, three, four, and five years ago, where their roster was like, you know, just not good. Uh, but I do, I do still think Notre Dame has the edge. And then this year, it's going to be at home. You're going to be better quarterback. You're going to hopefully you're not injured to the point where you know two or three of your three best cover players are out, which is terrible to be the reality right. when you're playing USC. Right. So we'll see. As far as Clemson, I, I think Notre Dame. I don't. I don't know that Notre Dame has answers that they need to find to beat Clemson. It's just keep doing what you're doing. I mean, you've literally right. beat Clemson two of the last three times you've played, and and your most recent game you you beat them convincingly. I mean, dominated them. You beat the so, out of them. and you just added a quarterback that threw six touchdown passes against them. So, I think the thing for me with with Clemson is you've got to make sure that you don't allow the changes that Clemson has made this offseason to the, for to have them to now leap you. So, it's not so much a, a question of what does Notre Dame need to do to get the edge. It's what do they need to do to maintain the edge. And in, in that regard, it to me, it still comes down to you've got to make sure you don't take a step back when it comes to line play. Because the difference between this Notre the re, when you when Notre Dame has been able to compete with Clemson in in certain areas it's 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 twofold. Number one, they were able to battle up front, and I thought in 2018 their defensive line was able to play well, but their offensive line didn't after the first quarter, so you got beat. Well, 2020 the offensive line played very well, and the defensive line is the unit to put that game away. 2022, you dominated them in the trenches on both sides. You have to do that, and that's not easy to do against Clemson because they're traditionally uh, pretty good on the defensive line, and then their offensive line has is, is not been as good lately. But you have to then, with Clemson, in order to maintain the edge, is you can't let them be way better than you at the skill positions, which they were in 15 uh, two in, in, in on one side of the ball. I think their skill positions on defense were better. And their skill at quarterback was better in 15. In in 2018, their just overall skill was better than Notre Dame's. Even though Notre Dame's was pretty good, it, it wasn't it wasn't significant. But the, what was the biggest difference that year? It was quarterback. And I guess that's probably that would be my third thing, Vince, is you've got to make sure that you're recruiting and developing quarterbacks at a high level. And that's been a, an issue because you're not going to be able to just go out there and pound them the way that they did last year every time. That was an anomaly. That's not – well, that's the new norm. Throw for 85 yards and run for almost 300 against yeah. Clemson. No. You try that again this year down in Clemson, and it's not going to go well for you. Yeah, you'll get beat. It's not going to go well for you. So it's maintaining the edge. And with Ohio State, Vince, it just comes down to – right now, Ohio State outplayed Notre Dame in the trenches last year. And what do you need to do? You need to reverse that. You have mm -hmm. to be able to at least stalemate, if not win, those battles. And that's a big thing. I expect the quarterback position to be this year to be one where Notre Dame should have the edge. Ohio State's got great receivers. Notre Dame's got great secondary. So the question there is, can your strengths, can your strength on defense, which is your secondary, especially your corners, can it cause their strength not to be dominant? Yeah. And that's what helped Notre Dame last year's. Marvin had some nice plays in that game, and Emeka had a long touchdown. But overall, they just didn't make the volume of plays they normally make, which is why the Ohio State offense had a tougher time consistently moving the ball. It's one of the C.J. Stroud's least productive games. C.J. Stroud made money plays, and then they beat Notre Dame in the trenches. He so what you have to do plays. is maintain that don't let them dominate you on the perimeter, but then reverse course on the inside. Is Notre Dame capable of that? That's a big question that we don't know the answer to. And that's what we talked about in the D-line breakdown we did the other day, Vince, and the O-line breakdown, or the O-line breakdown we did, I should say, is, yes, I think Notre Dame's capable of outplaying Ohio State in the trenches, but they've got to prove it because the last time we saw these two teams square off, Ohio State's defensive line whooped Notre Dame's offensive line. There's no other way. There's no fans or butts about it. Did they physically out, like, beat them up? No, that's not what we're talking about. They outplayed them. When I'm talking about whooping them up, they outplayed Notre Dame's offensive line. 
for 60 minutes. They weren't intimidated by Notre Dame's offensive line. They weren't intimidated by – they came out and they said, we're, gonna, we're, we're good too. Mm-hmm. And they outplayed Notre Dame. And you've got to prove to me that you can reverse that while not then losing ground on the perimeter even right. more. That's, that's where I'm at with those three teams, Vince. Yeah, I don't have a whole lot to add. The only thing I would add to what everything that you just said was – I also want to see what a game day with with Jared Parker at the helm call and plays looks like. You know what I mean? Because I I think we're seeing bits and pieces of what we want to see offensively and and what his philosophy is going to be in moving guys around and and using their talent and the RPO and all, all of that, right? But Notre Dame has been lacking the offense to compete at the highest of levels. And 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 a lot of that boils down to the quarterback. I, I I get I get that, but I also felt like in the past they haven't utilized the weapons that they've had offensively yeah. to the best of their ability. Yeah. You know what I mean? You know, coaching where you coached, coaching where I coached, man, you had to adjust to the talent that you had. And and right. sometimes from year to year, your offense would look different. You know what I mean? Uh, from a scheme standpoint, from a play calling standpoint, all of that. So. I just want to see Jared Parker and what he's going to do with this offense to maximize the talent that they have. Once I see that, once I get some questions about that answered, it's yeah. going to answer like a lot of other questions. And, and that's that's what I wanted to bring this this comment from Tim Prangley up, Vince, while we're talking about it, because it fits what you're talking about. Is I mean, I think that's probably the greatest question a lot of people have, and it's understandable, sure. is is there any concern about Jared Parker's inexperience will hold Hartman's production this year? Sure. That's very fair. All yeah. I'm going to say is the last time Notre Dame had a first-year offensive coordinator, they went to the playoff, and, and their quarterback finished in the top 10 of Heisman voting. Right. I, I mean, Tommy Reese. It's true. Right. I mean, you know, we've seen years where first year coordinators for Notre Dame have done very well. I mean, Chip Long in his first year completely turned around that offense in his first year. Now, the difference is, is Chip had been an offensive coordinator at Memphis. I get it. So it's a little bit of a different situation. But, you know, Jared Parker's done some things that an offensive coordinator is going to do. But I could sit here and talk, talk to you until I'm blue in the face about why I think he's going to be very good. And that's something I'm going to talk about next week. But at the end of the day, we still need to see it, and until right. we see it, it's a question. Yep. Right? So it's all a I can question. say is, here's why I think it's going to right. be good. But if someone's going to say to me, I can't get excited about this offense until I know what Jared Parker's going to be able to do, I think that's a very fair thing to say. Yeah. Uh, I just, you know, whether you have your you, – and even if you're optimistic about what he can do, that's a fair thing to say. And right. now as far as will it hold Hartman's production this year, I, I don't think that's really how it works. Uh, to me, Vince – if you're not a very good coordinator and your team has better talent than nine of the teams you're going to play, you're still going to have pretty good numbers unless you are terrible at your job against most of the teams you play. So it's more about will his inexperience hurt them in let's say the four toughest games I think you're going to play this year, which to me is NC state, Ohio state, USC and Clemson. I think those for different reasons are going to be the toughest games that Notre Dame's going to play from an offensive standpoint. Now, Louisville and Duke will be tough games, but that's more so for the defense because they're playing really good offensive teams. You And I'd probably say Duke is number five when it comes to toughest games in that regard, too. I don't count Pitt because by the time you get to Pitt, he's going to have a lot of more sure. experience in his belt and played in some pretty big games. I think NC State's the first real test, yep. and Tony Gibson road. plays a really unique 3-3-5 defense, and then, of course, the other three are obvious. So those are very fair questions, and but I, I still think the production is going to be very good. The question is, so like the, the year-end production is going to look fine, but it's it's like 2019. The year-end production in 2019 looked great. Ian Book had 34 touchdown passes. Chase Claypool had a mess of yards. Cole Komet had a mess of yards. They had their highest scoring average since like Lou Holtz was coach that year. But but what happened, Vince? They just beat up on a lot of teams. They had way better players then right. and then got dominated and averaged, what, thir- 15 and a half points in the only two good teams that they played all year. Right. That's more of the, the question will be for me. And, and that's the key. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Correct. Correct. It's, so, it's Tim, competing. to your question. Yeah, having that offense compete yes. at that high level against yes. top-level competition. Yes. I haven't had that. Having said that, I will say this. I have mentioned the word unknown more than an experience because I'm going to say the same thing about Jared Parker that I said about a lot of coaches in the past, most recently Clark Lee. Mm -hmm. I'm a big believer in this business 
unless you're 22 years old and fresh out of college and never done it before. And that was kind of my knock on Tommy Reese is, is you may have the chops, but you're not ready to where those chops are going to manifest itself yet because you're only 27 and you've only been coaching for two or three years, right? Jared Parker's not in that situation. I've always believed, Vince, and this is the argument I made for Clark Lee. You remember me doing it you, 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 when we when we had these conversations when I, my, the other place I worked. If you got the chops in this business, you got the chops. And in, in experience can be is, is never a bad thing, but it's, ne- it's not a prerequisite for success. So whether or not Jared Parker succeeds this year won't be because he lacks experience. And if he and if he thrives this year, it's not because he has experience. And and so when I talk about he'll have some experience under his belt, there is a level of just the, the day-to-day doing it. But right. really when it comes down to it, Vince, if you have the chops, you have the chops. Clark Lee had the chops. I was confident in that. And he kept the defense rolling after Mike Elko, including the fact that he was not having to reinvent the wheel because you're still running the defense that Mike Elko installed. Right, right. If, if Jared Parker has the chops, and I believe that he does, we'll find out for sure then he'll be fine. If he doesn't, if, if, if Sam Hartman's production takes a big hit this year because of coaching, it's because Jared Parker just doesn't have the chops, right? It's not be, and meaning it's not going to all of a sudden get better. And in two years, they're scoring 45 a game, right? I mean, Joe Brady never was asked to do what he did in 2019 before he was nothing but a receivers coach for an NFL team, but he had it here. And when he was finally given a platform to do it, he showed what he can do. Right. And that's I've always felt that way about coaching. And so we'll find out. I, I don't think Jared Parker's issues is you're going to be experienced. They're going to be. Is he good enough or not? That's right. what it boils down to for me. Because uh, Al Gold's got a mess of experience. Right. And, so, and, right. and to him, actually, I think his experience hindered him. Yes. I it was think his NFL needed, experience. I think. Yes. That, like yeah. scale it back a little bit. Right. Right. And so uh, he needed to go on a trip we'll down memory out. lane about what it was like to be a college coach. Yeah. <laughs> Yep. Yep. So uh, that was a good addition there. Uh, good question there, Tim, that kind of led to that off of that, that conversation, Vince. Th- there's a lot of reason to be yeah. excited. There's, but there's also very fair Absolutely. reasons to be cautiously optimistic or concerned. Sure. I get those. I, I guess the concern I don't have as much, the cost cautious optimism is, is much more understandable. Sure. Much more and understandable. And I think that's where I fall because I said it yesterday when we were in a mailbag and I was like, I think this offense is going to be lighting up the scoreboard. You know, right. it's going to be, it's going to be like a, um, um, oh, what do you call it? I don't know. Pinball. Story. Pinball. 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 There we go. Yeah. See, I was doing my silence. It was uh, the, the <laughs> pinball, uh, like a pinball machine with the, all the blinking lights. Like that's the scoreboard. That's yeah. the scoreboard I think for offense. Sure. And so like, sure. I'm confident, but well, when it's we still were kids, a question. Right. That's how cartoons were. You know, you just see the thing, the, the <laughs> points rolling up. Remember right. that? You know, exactly. Like, yes. No, yes. I, because you're someone who believes that Jared Parker has the chops, but you're right. also someone who understands, but now I just need to go see it. Exactly. Which is very fair. Yeah. The only the only thing that I don't think is a is reasonable is people who think they're gonna they're gonna be similar to what they were last year. And and I don't see any yeah, I don't see any justification for how that could be other than just I'm gonna I'm just gonna assume that they're gonna suck. And if right. they're better, I'll be happy. Right. Which is fine. I just that's, I refuse to live that that's way. That's how some people just, live. Like that, and that's, and that's okay. fine. I that's love fine. you. I just that's right. for me, for me, I just can't live yeah, that way. I me just neither. <laughs> I just don't you know, you get those people that just like being miserable. I'm not one of those people. <laughs> no, I, I'm I, not either. I am not. I am not. <sighs> okay. Uh we got a super chat from Andrew. Thank you very much, Andrew. If Marcus Freeman left next year, why? Why? Uh, choose a head coach from each Power Five conference and one Group of Five coach to replace him. I'm gonna I'm gonna change the question a little bit because I want to answer because it's fun. It right? is fun. But let's say this: fun. we are starting a new a new school. There we go. Okay, I like that. Yes, thank you. Because remember, we were talking about the Driscoll School and all. So we have started a new university. Nice. Okay, and we are starting a football team, and we are uh, Elon Musk, uh, <laughs> Warren Buffett. Peter Thiel have all donated huge swaths of money. So, so we have the resources to do whatever go. we want. Yes. How about that? It's a much the better art. premise. Okay. What's the one head coach from each power five conference that I would, I would uh, push for. So that's, 
that is a very so we're um, making our short list of correct of coaching so like, candidates right so we we can and we can only pick one from each co- okay. of the power five conferences oh, man you're okay. gonna be better at this than i am but so this is gonna be interesting so i'll i'll my 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 one from the acc is gonna surprise is gonna surprise some of you because it's not Dabo. And the reason is, is because number one, I love Dabo. Uh, I think he's a great coach, but I think he would tell me no, number one. <laughs> and then he would okay. use that to, to recruit against me because he's smart like that, Ooh. right? Number two, I don't think Dabo's one of those um, generational coaches that can just go win. any. Like Urban could win anywhere. He just was unique that way. He could win sure. in Florida. He could win in Utah. He could win I don't think you take Dabo and put him in LA or put him in South Bend, Indiana, and he has the same ability to definitely not LA things, right? He's not an LA guy. Correct. No. Saban, you could kind of put anywhere, you know, and he could he could win. So it's I don't not, think Dabo is a great fit for what we do uh, it, at, at our new school because our new where school we, is we in located? South Bend, Indiana. Okay, okay. We're, we're in, our new school is in Granger, Indiana. You know that oh, big old field yeah. right there with all the stupid. Solar panels that just yeah. ran. I'm tearing all that up, and that's where we're building our new school. You so know Notre Dame owns there. those, right? Okay, it's figures. <laughs> um, you know, so so we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna because hey, we got money from Peter Thiel, Elon Musk, and that's right, and, and uh, Warren Buffett, so we can buy that out. We're gonna yeah, build our I new like campus it. and all that right out there. Okay, I like that commute time. That's gonna yes, be great. Me too. <laughs> I'm using some of that donated money to buy me a little golf cart right, to exactly. to and from campus. Uh, so my 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 ACC one would actually be Mike Elko. Now I'm taking a risk. Ooh, yeah, that because is because he's a first year coach, but he knows the area, and we're going to be an institution that very very much values being a, a high academic institution. <clears throat> okay, right, and he would understand that. He would. He's a Penn graduate. He's been at Notre Dame. He's yeah. at Duke yeah, now. Yeah, right, he would, he would understand it. that. Yep, and I think he's young enough to where if he wins. He would be here for a while. Okay. Yeah. Right. So Good he's call. a guy that I'm looking to really like. I don't want to bring in Nick Saban. He won't be my SEC coach. I'll tell you that right now because I want a guy that's going to get the thing off and running, but then establish it and be here for a while. So sure. I don't have to, you know, a guy come in for three years, do your thing, and then leave. And then I got to start over again. I want to really bring a guy in that we can be patient with and give him time to build it up. And Mike Elko is my pick in the ACC. Okay. Who else would you it. look at? Like I Mike Norvell, that. I would consider. Okay. He's someone I would have considered. Uh, he's about the only other ACC coach that I would consider. Not a big Pat Narduzzi fan. No, Jeff Brom I would have considered a few years ago, but he just he 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 disappointed me a little bit at Purdue with yeah. some different things. Dave Clawson is not someone I would look at. I would I would at least maybe have a conversation with because I have a lot of respect for Dave Clawson, but I just don't think he's dynamic enough right. to be that. I think he's hit his ceiling. And, and he's I at a perfect place for him. That's what I'm I saying. I think Mike like, Elko yeah. has more upside right. as a big school right. coach. I think, I think Dave, I think Dave Clawson, you're right. He's in the perfect situation. He the expectations where he's at are not where they would be at, at our school. And I don't know that that's right for him. He needs to be right where he is, where he's like an eight-win season most of the time. And then you dip up, but then you dip down, and you eight win, you know, like that kind of I think that's perfect for him. I think it's perfect. Mm-hmm. Got to fly under the radar. It's yep. a quirky offense, you know, the whole thing, right? I, I, I agree with you. Yep. Yeah, I think I think we're in good shape. I think we're in lockstep okay. there. Yeah. So let's go Big 12. <clears throat> this one's going to be a little bit more interesting. My my candidates for the from the Big 12 are it's a it's a shorter list. Okay. Uh, Chris Kleiman is on my list. Steve Sarkeesian's on my list. I would look at Lance Leopold as a guy yes. that I would consider. But my number one pick in the Big 12 would most likely would, would when it came down to it, my number one pick would be Dave Aranda. I think having noticed two two defensive coaches in a row, because I, I I one of the things that I believe in is it, especially at a new program. Okay, <laughs> since we're cheating a little bit now, we're doing. I want someone that's going to bring in and bring toughness. I don't necessarily want someone that's going to come and try to out scheme everybody, and that's all fine and dandy. I want someone that's going to instill a foundation of we've got to win in the trenches, we've got to be smart, we got to be well coached. And Mike Elko and Dave Aranda, from just an intelligence standpoint, are two of the smartest human beings that are coaches in college football, in my opinion. Okay. And that's something that I value to place like the school we're creating, which would also fit at Notre Dame, Vince. Hmm. Hmm. So uh, Dave Aranda would be my pick for the Big Twelve. Who, who would yours be? You know, I I like what uh, it, it's Leopold that's at Kansas, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah. I I like his is the first name that came to mind 
I, I would definitely bring him in for an interview. You know, turning around Kansas, yes. that that takes some cojones, man. Like, he's doing something right over there. Let's see if they can sustain it, obviously. Yep. Uh, and he's but, been in the North, right? Yeah. He was Wisconsin Whitewater for a long time. He won, right. guy won a Buffalo Vince. Exactly. Like, that's a guy I would want to talk to, you know, yeah. at the very least to have that conversation, you know? So he would be my, I think, I'll say it. I think he would be my pick. Like, he's he's guy I would bring. Because if we're bringing in one from every conference, that doesn't mean I'm, you know, that means I want to talk to all these guys. So, yeah, he would be a guy I'd want to talk to. So, uh, Lance Leopold in the Big 12 for you, Dave Aranda for me. Let's go Big 10. This one is a little tougher for me because I'm not in love with some of the Big Ten coaches, <laughs> and some of the ones that are there are a little older. They are so I I don't I don't I don't love the Big Ten options to be completely honest with I'm you. I'm going Vince. through them in my head. I mean, and no Jim Harbaugh, are... right? Uh, Ryan Day is a very fine coach. But it kind of goes back to what I just said. I want someone who's going to bring in toughness, and Ryan Day has not established he can do that. I would have to strongly consider him because he is a winner, right? Yes. I mean, what's the record's pretty impressive. Correct. But I just, you know, He's again, walked they, into a pretty good situation. They whooped, though, right. But they got whooped by Michigan the last two years because they're just not a really physically tough team. Sure. Yeah. Uh, so they did better against Georgia. You know, no to Mel Tucker, no to Tom Allen, no to. Greg Schiano. I don't know enough about Ryan Walters to have an opinion there. Uh, Brett Bielam is probably the best coach to fit what I would look for, but I just don't like him. To be honest with you, like as a as you know, I don't know if he would fit what I would be looking for. And you know, if, if we're going to try to be like Notre Dame, then Brett Bielam, I don't know if it's necessarily the greatest fit for that. Heck no to PJ Fleck. Oh, you don't want to row your boat. Yeah. I heck no, I'm rowing no boats. Uh I'm buying a I'm buying one with a motor. Okay. Because who <laughs> rows these days? Um because we're not uh yeah, I'd probably have to go Luke Fickler Matt Rule to be honest with you. Mm. I, I mean mm. you know Jim Harbaugh's not coming and 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 just no. <laughs> just, no, no no I know no. he'd win, but I don't want to. Yeah, I just we don't, don't want to. We don't need winning with a side of crazy. <laughs> no, like that's not no. necessary. That makes no. our job as administrators harder. Okay. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. Hard yes. Pass. Yes. So I'd probably I, go Luke Fickle or Matt Rule would oh, be man, you know pick. Right. I, I mean, it's pick between one of those. The know. choices are not great. I I would I would probably bring in Ryan Day, knowing that I wasn't going to go with whoever was representing the Big Ten. You know sure. what I mean? That's Use your token interview for the Big yeah, Ten. Right. Okay. <laughs> Correct. And look, he is the best coach in the Big Ten right now. It's just yeah. it's just it but just there are some not disturbing a, trends. It's not a fit yeah. for what I would yeah. want to be sure. at this school and sure. it wouldn't fit what Notre Dame does either, if we're being honest. Yeah. Let's go to the Pac twelve, Vince. Who would be your pick in the Pac twelve? There's really two for me that it comes down to. And the, the the my my the, well really three Jonathan Smith is definitely getting consideration from me okay uh the guy at Oregon State I think he does a very good job again toughness I got mine in, you know all those type of things I think that uh, he would do he would fit well Kyle Whittingham would make a lot of sense in a lot That's of ways mine. but he's yeah. an older guy and I he don't is. know that he's got another decade left in him he is but that would here's, be my guy here here's who it would end up being for me and he, and and he's the exception to my rule of what I'm looking for and it's Kalen DeBoer I mean he gets like hardly any conversation as far as being like you know one of the everybody talks about Dan Lanning and how he's this coach and I'm like has anybody actually looked at what Kalen DeBoer's record is as a head coach I mean, the guy was as at Sioux Falls, right, which is an NAIA school, and he went sixty-seven and three, and won four straight NIA championships. He goes to Fresno State and goes nine and three in his second year. His first year was the COVID year. Can't can't really talk right. about that. Right. He, like he leaves Fresno, and they go in the tank. You know, beginning of the season, they rebounded later and won their last several to finish the top 25, but they went in the tank early. Also hurt that they didn't have Jake Hayner. And then last year he takes over a Washington team that was a train wreck based on everything that went four and eight the year before, and he takes them to 11 and two. And then let's not forget what he did at Indiana as the OC. This guy is a great offensive mind and is a, a very successful head coach that is from South Dakota. He's coached in Indiana 
He's he's going to have recruiting base out west. Kalen DeBoer's my pick for the Pac-12, Vince. And, and Lincoln Riley's a no because I just don't like Lincoln Riley. No, I wouldn't bring I don't him. I personally nope. care much for him. Never even made uh, close to my Great list. coach. Don't get me wrong. Great coach. But he, I just don't care much for him. Exactly. Uh, Kalen DeBoer would be my pick in the Pac-12. Interesting. Yeah. And, he, and he's if, young. If Whittingham was about eight years younger, I'd consider him more. Fair enough. And I think Jonathan Smith is a heck of a coach, but I think he's just the – he's like – he's that guy that I don't know – if he can win outside of the Northwest, just because that's who he is. That's his background. I mean, he played sure. in the Northwest. He's coached in the I mean, that's just who he is, right? So I'm, I'm going Kalen DeBoer. Yeah, because he's like six years older than I am. Who uh, is? I'm Kalen DeBoer. Like, yeah. I'm looking at his kind of – He's a veteran his, guy. Yeah. yeah, but I mean, he's, you know, he's in his 40s. Like, right. okay, you know, he's 48 years old. Uh, he'll be 49 in the middle of the football season. But uh, you make a very compelling case. So it would be between him and Whittingham for me. Yeah. Uh, but I would want to talk to both of them. Yeah. You know what I mean? I would want to talk to both of them. I will say that once I said I didn't know anything about the history of Kalen DeBoer and, and that his history lines up with what I would like. You know what I mean? He's an offensive guy. He was a wide receiver in high school. I mean, in college and, and high school, obviously. And just the way he's kind of worked his way up, and he has recruited and coached in the Midwest since he was at Indiana. So he's got some mid, you know, a little bit of a Midwest tie. At least he understands what Indiana is like, uh, even though he was only here for right. a year. But he was also at Eastern Michigan for a few years. So mm-hmm. I mean, in Southern Illinois. So I mean, like he gets the Midwest. So there's a lot to like there. Actually, um, there's a lot to like. I, I, that would be a fun conversation to have for sure. Yeah. Last one, Vince. SEC. Yes. Who is your pick in the SEC? Man. This one's I would, tough. I wouldn't bring in Saban just because I think he's on the latter half of things. Correct. And I don't – he's not going to be – say what you want to about how he is at Alabama, and I get it, and I'm not, I'm not debating that. But it took him a while to get things to the way he wanted them, and now it's a – now it's a thing. Like he doesn't have to be doing the day to day. I'm sure he does, but he's not going to be building a program from the bottom up. That's not where he's at in his career. So it would not be Nick Saban. Um, I know somebody else who it won't be. <laughs> you're right about that. I'm not pulling anybody from the boot. That's for sure. Well, it, it, there's just some guys, Vince, that are just non starters for me, just from a character standpoint. I, Lane Kiffin's a non starter for me. Okay. Uh, Hugh Freeze is a non-starter for me. Just you, you're not passing my background check of what I know about you. God <laughs> forbid what I find out about you when I actually do a real background check. Right. You know. So that's a that's a big no for me. That's fair. Elia Drinkwitz just seems like a just not a person I would ever want to spend any time around. So uh, he he would not be on my list. The guy from Mississippi State just doesn't have the experience. Sam Pittman's a good old boy. I, I like him, but he's an Arkansas guy. He's not He's not ready for the prime time of what we're trying to do there. So it, then it comes down to, uh, okay, Jimbo, big no. So no it basically way. comes down to what I try to steal Kirby away from Georgia, and I kind of feel the same way about Kirby that I do about Dabo. He's a Southern dude sure. that can win in the South that I'm not sure his slick – you know, thing that he does that works so well down there, it works at, you know, here, right? Sure. And, and you know, and I don't know that uh, we will not allow him to do some of the things that he's right. doing at Georgia to win, and we'll just sure. leave it at that, okay? Uh, Josh Heupel would be in consideration for me, okay. definitely. Okay. Uh, but I would need to know who your DC is going to be and how are you, you know, going to run right. the ball better. Shane Beamer's in the conversation for me, but he's just a little bit too green and a little bit too whiny. As a coach, mm-hmm. to be the guy that I would go with, I think that would Mark, be, that would lessen as he gets older. Yes, but. Mark Stoops definitely is getting an interview from me, uh, and then another guy that I would seriously look at is Clark Lee. I mean, I I would I would consider Clark Lee. I would. I probably wouldn't be my pick. I'd probably lean towards more towards Josh Heupel or Mark Stoops for me. That's okay. probably where I would go. Okay, if I had to. I've got so but if I Kirby actually, wanted the job, I'd have a hard time telling him no. Well, I'll just fair. say that. Like I, mean, I don't know if fair. I'd pursue him, but if Kirby was like, "Hey right. man, I want to get out of here," I want you know, I'd be like, "Right, mm, man, this." <laughs> I don't know why. Because let me say this: because as much as I don't like certain things about the fit for Kirby, 
everything I said I want this program to be toughness, discipline, sure. fundamentally sound. All, that's what Kirby's Georgia's teams are like. And, and Kirby's gone through some of the similar things that Saban got undersold on. It's like, oh, you're you're just winning because you have highly ranked recruiting classes. Okay, yeah, they have highly ranked recruiting classes who play really physical, fundamentally sound football. They're not just out there throwing the ball out with these really great athletes and they're just out towning people. They are a well coached team, in my opinion. And uh, he often gets, he doesn't get enough credit for that, in my sure. opinion. We'll see if that can continue in the post Todd Munkin era. That's a question with anytime you have a, a, a changeover coordinator. But uh, he, a lot of things that I like, he would fit. It's just, I don't know if he would fit, if right. that makes sense. So, I know this goes against what you were saying, and uh, this is allowed because you're the one making the choice, not well, me, I know. not me for your for your situation. Oh, okay. So I've got my own universe. You can pick your, right. yeah. I mean, or it's uh, like if I'm in charge, this is what I'm doing, and if you're in charge, this is what yeah, you're doing. Yeah, that's fair. <clears throat> I've got like this vision in my head of you and I starting university together, and I'm really enjoying it. Uh, so I actually, um, with all the lead up to the bowl game last year, I really enjoyed listening to Shane Beamer and mm -hmm. kind of how he runs his program and the things that he was doing and, and things like that. So I would want to talk to him. My curveball to you, though, and why not? I'm going to make up my own rule here. I am bringing in Mike Denbrock as an interview. And I know he's not a head coach, and I know that wasn't the question, sure. and I don't care. He's an offensive coordinator. I like Mike Denbrock a lot. Yeah. And I think he deserves a shot at a head coaching gig. I don't know that that's what he wants, but I would have a conversation with Mike Denbrock about coming back to Notre Dame. I think you know me well enough to know that I'm not pushing back on that. Yeah. I think you know my feelings on Mike Denbrock well enough to know that I would have no pushback on that. Yeah. So yes. that's why I threw a curveball at you a little bit, but I dig it. You know, I if I'm bringing it. somebody from the boot, it would be him. <laughs> I dig it. Somebody said this, Zach Martin said this, and I want to clarify this. Uh, Zach Martin said, I don't think Urban thought he could win at Notre Dame. My oh. my point is is Urban Urban didn't think he could have won at Notre Dame because he wasn't going to get the support. Anytime you talk about a coach winning, he can only win if he's going to get support. Correct. Like no coach, in my opinion, I mean maybe Lou Holtz is the closest you could find to that, but even he got some support in certain ways, like with Tony Rice and some of those guys. But uh, I don't think any coach can win without support. And when coaches turn down jobs, it's because I don't think they're going to support me the way that I think you need to be supported to win at a place. Yeah. If Urban thought that Notre Dame was going to do what he thought they should do to win, I think he would have strongly considered taking that job. And then it would have come down to money. And his wife. But, I, but I think when he looked at Florida versus Notre Dame, Florida was willing to do whatever yeah. it takes, and Notre Dame was not. I think right. that – so I, I think that's why – I think Zach's right that Urban didn't think he could win at Notre Dame because Notre Dame wouldn't allow him to right. do what he not thought. Not because he, he didn't think he could Correct. win. Yeah. Correct. I don't have the chops. And, I, and yeah. I'm assuming that's what Zach is – Zach is meaning what we're saying, which is yeah. – is that? But I want to make sure when when you hear me say a coach can win anywhere, it's anywhere that that has certain resource, like any part of the country. That doesn't mean I think he could go to Wash Nick Saban go to Washington State and win a title, right? Because the resources aren't there. But he could go to the Pac-12 and compete for a championship, the Big sure. Twelve, the Big Ten, the ACC, the SEC. That's more of what I'm referring to. Where some guys are just regional coaches, and there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, right. Lou Holtz could coach. He coached at Minnesota. He coached at Arkansas. He coached at NC State. He coached at Notre Dame. He coached everywhere, right? And won. Everywhere. South Carolina. Right. Uh, so not all coaches are that way. Some guys right. are just, you know, they're more regional guys. And there's nothing wrong with that. It just, they fit really well there. And I don't sure. know that they could go other places and be as successful. And that's where I'm, that's, but you have to have support. Like, why did Dabo win? He had the chops, but also because Clemson was bought in. They were going right. to do what they needed to do. The perfect to support scenario the football program. for him. Right. And there, then they had a coach time. that could do it. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Really fun questions today, Vince. Let's get a couple easy ones out of the way. Here okay. we go. <laughs> uh, seek and destroy. I like that. That's good. Mm -hmm. uh, Chips Ahoy or Oreos with or without milk? Well, I used to be an Oreos guy, but I don't eat Oreos anymore. Uh, haven't for a couple years now for reasons. Uh, but when I had Oreos, it was always with milk. I mean, I could eat Oreos no matter what, but yes. I always liked them with milk. So that that's what I mean I either favorite. one, but they always have to be with milk. I could do it either way, and the Chips Ahoy has to be the original, like the the, the thin chocolate chip Chips Ahoy original cookie. Uh, but I'm gonna go Oreo all the way. Oreo is my favorite. Oreo goes in the ice cream. It goes in the milk. It goes in my mouth. And that's my favorite chocolate chip cookie that you can buy 
like this, right? Yes. Like a, a store bought chocolate chip cookie that I don't need milk for is, and it's just my favorite period is famous Amos chocolate chip huh. cookies are phenomenal. I love those. Okay. Love those. Absolutely love those. Here's another easy one. We're going to knock out some of these easy ones. so We can actually maybe have a shot of getting through <laughs> the, all the questions today. <laughs> From Joe, what, in your respective opinions, is the worst Notre Dame team during your time as a fan? Wow, that's an easy one. Uh, the worst Notre Dame team that I as my is two thousand seven by a thousand miles. Really? Like I know the two thousand sixteen team had a, only had a one game better record, but that team won almost every other game they played in. Like the only game that they weren't competitive in that year uh, was the USC game, right? That that's it. But even then, they had an early lead. I mean, that, that 2016 team should have beat Texas, lost in overtime, should have beat Michigan State, right, had a chance. They, they, they got outplayed that game, but they Michigan State sucked. They should have beat Duke. They blew a 14-0 lead. They should have beat NC State. They had a halftime lead over Stanford. They should have beat Navy, gave up points at the end, should, blew a big lead against Virginia Tech. I mean, the only two games, the only two games really got outplayed I would say so. I'll add two. Michigan State outplayed them. Notre Dame made a late charge late. They made a charge late, but they got outplayed by Michigan State uh, and, and USC. So they were competitive in the in those games, Vince. That was a talented team that just was poorly coached and no leadership and all that. They were not terrible. The the 2017 team, they lost by 30 to Georgia Tech, oh, 21 so to Penn bad. State, 38 to Michigan, 17 to Michigan State, 14 to Purdue. 13 to Boston College, 38 to USC, 17 to Air Force, and they were the first team to in, lose what, 40-some to years to lose to Navy. That was depressing. Right? That was a terrible team. And and the three teams Notre Dame beat that year, two of them were even worse than Notre Dame was. Right? <laughs> so so you beat Duke that year, who was 1-11. You beat Stanford that year, who was 4-8, and eight, and had that fluky win over USC, but they weren't good outside of that. And then you beat UCLA, who was a six and seven team, but they were like with like their third string quarterback or something like that in that game, if you remember correctly. So that 07 team was awful. The 16 team, if they had better coaching and leadership, would have been an eight, nine win team minimum that year. There was no way. I don't care who the coach was. That Notre Dame team, looking back hindsight, was not not a bowl caliber team that year. And they weren't even close. They weren't even the only game they were even what competitive in. Would you say Vince that they lost was what Navy? I mean, they, they got dominated in every other game they played. I mean, they weren't competitive yeah. that year. So yeah, oh seven by a mile. For yeah, me. looking back, I think I just blocked that out of my brain. The oh seven days. I'm it. looking through here. I, I remember some of those games, and it was like, and you know what the funny thing was. The year before both of those seasons, so 2006 and 2015, team was 10 and three, and then you go and have that season. Like, you want to talk yeah. about coming off of a good year and having some good vibes moving forward, and then you just get pooped on. Like, because that's what I remember about that's what I remember most about 2016 is I remember going into that year thinking that they were going to be good, like good enough. You know what I mean? Like. It, nine ten wins you know moving forward blah 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 and that obviously did not happen and then i look back at the 07 team or the 07 season and i'm looking at some of these scores and i'm, I'm remembering these games and it's coming back to me like a nightmare and i mean they started out the season what oh and five mm -hmm. oh and five what and year was that oh in in 2007 yeah i mean Oh, and, and really, five. honestly, Vince would have been 0 6 if UCLA did, didn't have their quarterback sure. wasn't hurt. And then, and, and of course, I think the, 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 the antithesis, the thing that pushes me over the top for the 2007 team is the loss to Navy. Like that yeah. was, that was, I remember it so well because I was on the field and it was in the overtime and it was the old school overtime rules, right? And they would be at one end of the field and they would do their thing and then it would go to the other end of the field and do it and then the other end and we were running back and forth back and forth like on the field behind Notre Dame uh bench and just running back and forth to why and then to lose that game the way they did and to lose period I mean that was heartbreaking and that just put a bow on the season and then they came back the next week to Air Force and lost 41 to 24 like yeah that was just a punch to the gut man so yeah. I agree with you it's got to be 07 
Yep. Uh, here, here's another easy one, Vince, for me. Uh, Archer, will you watch Suck versus Eli in their cage match? No. Uh, if you could not pick any two celebrities to duke it out, who would your dream matchup be? I could not care less. No, that's something I that just... I don't. Number one, cage matches, MMA, it's not for me. I, I'm just not a fan of it, and so I wouldn't watch it. And yeah. then to watch two dorks go at each other, like that doesn't do anything no. for me, so, obviously, no. either. And I don't care if celebrities want to no. fight each other. Whatever. I don't care. I'm I just I'm not a celebrity worshiper. I just don't care. Okay. I just, you know, I'd rather fight let, Ryan. Let me watch the movie and move on. <laughs> so Bayside Tiger Six with the super chat. Thank you very, very much. Which position coach do you give the biggest benefit of the doubt with recruiting? To me, it's Mickens. A lot of time developing under recruited guys at smaller programs. He has an eye for who can play. It's not even close. I mean, he Bayside Tigers nailed this one. It's yeah. it's Mike Mickens. The results speak uh, for themselves. Yeah, I mean, in like you know, Chancey Stucky's doing a really good job recruiting, but he has a lot to prove because I think the premise is, like he said, under you know, developing under recruited guys. And I like how he said that under recruited, not like guys who aren't talented that he turned into good players. It's under recruited guys, right? He has an eye for who can play. I think he nailed this, Vince. I I, I don't need know that we need to add more to it. I mean, I think he's right. spot on, dude. He's absolutely I agree. spot on. I think it's Mickens. And I don't know if there's a number two right now. I think it's just Mickens. Like, yeah. No, well, what about? It's just Mickens. Now, if Harry Heastan was still here, he'd be my offensive pick. Sure. Uh, and if I had to pick one for offense, I'd go with Dylan McCullough. Would be okay. my pick for offense. I, you know, and I was going to say the two on offense that jump out to me are Chancey Stuckey and Dylan McCullough, but Chancey Stuckey's too young in his career. Well, he's got to prove they can develop. I think the that's what I'm saying. Here that he's yes. talking about is not just develop. You know, the, the the proven eye for talent. Chancey Correct. Stuckey hasn't proven that he has an eye for talent. He's gone out and gotten really talented players that we all know are talented. Right. And you know, so there's no benefit of the doubt needed with Jaden Greathouse or Rico Flores sure. or Braylon James or Cam Williams or Micah Gilbert. You, we, we all know they can play. Caleb right. Smith's the only one that you could say. There needs to be some benefit of the doubt given because he's not as highly ranked, but uh, I think he's a pretty good player. Dylan McCullough is a guy that if if when if he were to go out and say, "Hey, I really like this three star running back," you're like, "Okay, cool." Yeah, because I know right. he's not lazy, so he's not he's not going to be afraid to battle Bama and whoever else. I mean, this guy convinced Richard Young to come play. You knew he, you know, he knew he had very little chance to get Richard Young, but he's like, "So what? You, you lose all the battles. You you don't fight." Right, absolutely. right. That's how Dylan McCullough has shown himself to be at Notre Dame so far. And guess what? That that's allowed him to win some big battles that maybe they wouldn't have fought in the past. Sure. Uh, so so he'd probably be my pick on offense. And and if Harry was back, he yep. he he would be he'd be the other one that I would go with. But as far as the whole team, it's Mickens, definitely Mickens, and not just what he's done at Notre Dame, what he did at Bowling Green, what he did at Cincinnati, and what he's done at Notre Dame. Sure. So yeah, very very good. He's question. got the track record. Absolutely yeah. agree with that. Very very good question. ND football nerd over the past decade, what positions or type of player does Notre Dame recruit the best on the defensive side of the ball? Second, does Notre Dame's defensive philosophy mesh well with its recruiting strength? All right. So what positions does Notre Dame recruit the best on the defensive side of the ball? It's, you know, it's, it's, it's been different at different times of the last decade. Depends on who's there. As I a mean, coach. at times they've been very good at linebacker at times they haven't at times they've been pretty good uh at defense i'd say probably the position that they've been here's what's funny i think the position that if i had to go the last 10 years so that's the see 23 22 21 20 19 18 17 16 15 14 so starting the 2014 class probably defensive line or linebacker probably be the two best uh, because there were some years that cornerback was very iffy Yes. Agreed. But other years, it was really good. I mean, the, one of the best individual classes Notre Dame has signed in the last decade was that corner class with Julian Love, Troy Pride, Dante Vaughn. And I loved it at the time, you know, and sure. Safety's had some guys here and there, but a lot more bad than than good yeah, as agreed. far as the number of years, not, the you know, the players. So, I mean, like, what does their safety de depth chart look like in, in eight, 17 and 18 or 18 and 19 if Alohi Gilman doesn't transfer from Navy? They're in trouble. You know what I mean? And so... Yep. Um, does Notre Dame's defensive loss mess with its recruiting strength? Uh, to answer that question, yeah, I think so, because we're talking about I think the front seven is where they've had the most success. Now that's changing recently. Now, if if some of the if these coaches stay together for a while, then you're gonna start talking about cornerback being that that deal. But even then it fits with what they're currently doing. They're recruiting long, rangy, athletic corners that can play man defense. That's what they've been doing the last couple of years, and that right. fits with what they're trying to do defensively. So yeah, I think so. Yeah. You know, it, but again, I don't, I don't think that I would say that 
the answer could change when we see this season. If, if Al Golden goes out there and tries to play a lot of two gapping, read and react with your front to open up blitzers and stuff like that, that, then sure, I don't. I think then we'll say no because to do that you need big boys up front, and they're not recruiting. They, they don't, don't have. Them. I don't think their name's going to ever consistently recruit the big boys. Yeah. So that <laughs> would be no. But if if he keeps with the sort of the and that's one of the things I think hurt Clark Lee at times. Clark, I wanted to see Clark Lee turn the defense loose at more. That was my big knock on Clark Lee. Is I think it's a very good football coach, but he was really thoughtful, intellectual, and all this kind of stuff. And sometimes I just wanted to say, man, just turn them loose. Just let them go. And that's what I loved about Mike Elko. Mike Elko was was not afraid to take a chance. No one I could give up a big play. Clark Lee was like, we're not going to give up a big play. We're not going to give up a big play. We're not going to give up a big play. To the to the point where like he would do that bend but don't break stuff. Right. I, it's just not my style. And I don't know that they always had the personnel for that. I but when they when they were at their best, like 2018, is when he just let them pin their ears back and let their his defensive line attack. And then it kind of went away from that, like nineteen and twenty, and and was doing a little bit different stuff. And but yeah, I, th- I think I think certainly um, possible, possible to get there. Coach Bent five seven four. If you could guarantee that you could keep one coach from each side of the ball on staff for the next five years, who would you choose? I'm thinking D is an easier choice than O. Yes, is, is I mean we just this? talked about it, right? Okay. Um, I didn't see, I didn't okay. see the, the second question of this, Vince. So what? What time? No did, problem. Did, did this one? Hold on a second. He is at twelve thirty-seven, so I'll try to find it. Uh, so uh, defense, obviously for me is Mickens. Yes, yeah, so if I can guarantee no. that Mike Mickens is on the staff the next five years, I will be happy. I'll be like, where do I sign? Yeah. Where Where do I sign up for that? Yeah. Absolutely. Now I hope that we're at least having a conversation about it next year. That'd be nice. Right, but um, there is a second part. The second part said, "Who would you? Who would be your choice if you could only keep one coach total aside from Coach Mark, Coach Marcus Freeman?" So Ooh. I'm gonna stay with the original question, which was, "If you can guarantee that you can keep one coach from each side of the ball on staff next five years, who would you choose?" On defense, we talked about this. I'm gonna go Mike Mickens. Mm-hmm. On offense, that is a really good one. I would probably go with Coach Stuckey, and I'm I'm gonna say it this way. The reason I wouldn't say Jared Parker is because if Jared Parker's not on the staff in five years, it's one of two reasons. One, he didn't do the job and he got fired. Or two, he does a great job and somebody tries to hire him away as their head coach. And that's never bad for Notre Dame. Sure. Right. When someone takes your coordinator to become a head coach, that's a good thing for your program. Because that, that means the guy you're going to bring to replace him sure. is, going to be, is going to be someone that, hey, I, I, I have a path to for success if I go to Notre Dame, right? For me, it would be Chancey Stuckey because I would okay. love to be able to have some. I would love to be able to have some continuity on the perimeter of the defense. Part of me wanted to go Dean McCullough, but running back's a position that I don't. I, I I just wonder if man, do you really? You know, g- give me a good coach there, and, and and you'll be okay. Someone who work hard. You don't necessarily need someone as great as Dean, and he's left a great. He'll leave a great situation. But the other two is just selfishly. I just I, I feel bad for that one if I were to say Dean because I know he wants to be head coach. Right. And sure. I kind of feel like if the next five years go by and he's not a head coach, then it he's might've... missed his window yeah, exactly. to be a head coach because he'll be in his fifties by then. Sure. So I just refuse to to force him to <laughs> lock into that type of thing. So I, I think Coach Stuckey's still pretty young, and and if I could guarantee the the level of coaching or de- recruiting, and then I, what I think he's going to do development wise in the next five years, I would Notre Dame's going to have a very talented perimeter situation, no doubt about it. Let me throw a curveball at you, Brian. And I, I I say this hesitantly because I he's a new he's new to the staff, and so I'm not exactly Neither sure. But if the development is what I think it could be, and the recruiting matches it, because I I don't know, I might say Gino Gadouli. Oh, because, I thought you were gonna go Joe Rudolph. Okay, interesting. No, because well, we and, and, go ahead, Vince. Sorry. I was gonna say because we've said in the past that Notre Dame's been a quarterback away and a development a developed quarterback away from being a national championship level offense right. if i can guarantee if if, if gino gaduli is the quarterback coach that i think he could be and i could guarantee that he's going to keep bringing in top level quarterbacks and developing them from the time they step on the on on campus then i'm guaranteeing you that we're going to have a high level quarterback which makes everybody else around him better so yeah. i might go that route. see that I also think he's someone that if Jared Parker does a great job and if Jared Parker gets taken by somebody, then Gino Gadouli can also slide right into the coordinator position 
because he's done it before. That's a good call. And so that's another thing is that that would, that would continue uh, keep the continuity right. where you want it to be. Yeah, to be. Yep. Two Alpha says, "Hey, just picked up a dark Heather Gap closers T-shirt. Thanks, IB. You are welcome. This is one of my favorite ones because he's got the uh, shooting target as his avatar. Oh yeah, I like very much. I've seen this one before. Two Alphas. That looks familiar. Yep. All right, let's get back to some more questions here, Vince. We got Skylar Indy. Brian or Ryan or Vince. I was watching highlights from the Bush Push game. Bush had an all right NFL career. Do you think it would be better for him to be drafted in today's NFL? I mean, wasn't he kind of in today's NFL to a degree? I mean, I, I think Reggie would fit very well in today's NFL. He got yeah, drafted I, I, by I mean, the I, Saints, and I think. I think he would be better off now than he will even it was kind of transitioning when he came into the NFL to what it is today. Yeah. But there was still a heavy dose of bell cow running backs when he came in. Last the year NFL. was 16, but by that point in time he was 30, 31. So right. his With, prime years, 06 to 2012, 13. Yeah, I mean, yeah, if he if he could come into the league now in his prime, I mean, he's Jameer Gibbs, you know, right, top 13 exactly. pick and Right. Yeah, I I I I see where you're going, Skylar. I would say yes. Yeah. We've yeah. talked like we talked about that with like Rocket, like if Rocket could play in today's yeah. era, that kind of thing, but right. yeah. Yeah, I think Reggie would benefit from that, certainly. Me too. Me too. Certainly. All right. And the SMA Trucking LLC. If you were able to use Notre Dame rosters from 13 to 23 to build a Notre Dame offense to best beat Georgia in a championship game, what would your ideal roster by position by, be by position by position? So if you could use any wow. position from 13 to 23, if I could take any position group. So uh, quarterback, I, I think... I'm taking the one they have now. Okay. Running back, I'm... Okay, hold on. Let me let me do running back last. Offensive line's an easy one. I'm taking the 17 offensive line. Sure. And actually, you know what? I'd probably take the 15 offensive line, actually, because that was a more dual threat offensive line. They can run okay. block and pass block. The best run blocking unit was the 17 line by a mile, but the 15 line was pretty good at both. And so I'm gonna yeah. take the 15 offensive line. Tight end, I'm gonna go with the 2019 tight end room. Cole Komet. You had Tommy Trumbull was a sophomore. You had George Takis. And then, of course, you had Brock Wright in that tight end room as well. Uh, you could be – we'd be perfectly fine also taking any of the rooms with Michael Mayer. With Michael Mayer in it, right? Yeah, right. Uh, but for me, the reason I'm not going with that is because I want a tight end that's good, but I don't want my tight end to be my number one guy. He doesn't Receiver, have to be your number one guy to huh? who the quarterback is. Well, he would be. I mean, yeah. if you got Michael May out there, he's hard not to throw to. <laughs> Fair enough. At wide receiver, see, this is a tough one because my my initial gut answer is 15. But I really liked that 18 receiving core, especially if they had a coach that was doing a better job of developing the younger players. Because remember, we know about – we remember Miles Boykin and Chase Claypool – and Chris Fink, but that team also had Kevin Austin and Braden Lindsey and Lawrence Keys and Michael Young, some guys they just didn't play enough and didn't develop. And so 15, I'd probably go 15 because I'd have my Will Fuller. Uh, yeah. yeah, I'd have Will Fuller, Chris Brown, and I'd have Amir Carlisle, and I'd have you know, I'd have my freshman that year where Equinemy St. Brown and 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 those guys were were my freshmen that year. So I I think you had Chase Claypool was was uh came the next year so you had equanimius in 15 you had cj sanders in 15 so that was a pretty good i'm gonna go 15 for receiving core okay. some back and forth so 23 quarterback 15 offensive line 15 wide receiver i'm gonna go 19 tight end room and then so the last one is is quarterback or running back yeah, right? running back yeah that is a that's a tougher one because part of me wants to take if i had to if I had to take one from that era and I've got this current coaching staff, I'm honestly probably going with last year's running back room. I was just going to say, anyway, and a healthy Jadarian price would be nice. Well, even room. if, even without him, if, sure. if I, I feel like this coaching staff would better utilize Chris Tyree. Okay. That's you know what a I'm good saying? point. And they yeah, would use right. like Notre Dame would actually back, turn Logan Diggs into a downhill power runner. That's not Logan Diggs. Be Logan Diggs right. is a, guy that also needs to get on the perimeter run some outside zone be quick be elusive he has some of that wiggle to him a little bit i, I didn't feel that they always used the running backs correctly last year but i i 
part of that necessity because of who they had to be. So I understand I'm not criticizing them for it. I think it was a necessity. But if you could take this running back room with that other group, Sam Harbin, a quarterback, the 15 offensive line, the 15 receivers, uh, that's where I would be. And also to beat Georgia, I, I need to be able to pound you up the middle to open up, to, to try to condense your alignment so mm-hmm. then I can then get the ball on the perimeter. But if I could get if I could have Logan Diggs and Audric Estime hammering teams with, and then Chris Tyree speed in, in some 21 yeah. looks with Will Fuller and <laughs> Cole Komet with Sam Hartman throwing to him, that's a pretty darn good football team right there. Yeah. Fun I, these are I mean they're so unrealistic, but they're fun I really they're fun questions. I enjoy, <laughs> I enjoy answering these. But what it goes to show to me is Notre Dame has had a championship caliber unit everywhere. Sure. At some point in time in the last decade. They just haven't been able to put it all together. Right. And that's the, you know, that's the frustration for me. Like the defensive line and the front seven in 2018 was good enough to win a title, in my opinion. The cornerback room last year, the cornerback room in 18, the defense as a whole in 2018 was championship worthy. So the offense wasn't, you know, and, but you put the 15 receivers or you put, you know, if, if Deshaun Kaiser could got his head screwed on straight. Right. And then on that 18 team, or if, you know, if you could take Sam Hartman and put him on that 18 team, I mean, They've always had the units. They just have never been able to put it all together at the same time. And that's why I've never accepted the whole, they can't recruit well enough. Well, yeah, they can. They just got to be able to do it at the same time and not be strong here and not strong there. And that's been the maddening thing with Notre Dame and over the years. And and still now is you go out and get a dynamic recruiter positions. You haven't had one in a while, like receiver and corner. And then you start slacking at, you know, other positions that you should be better at. And it's just like, man, this is frustrating. Right. It's very frustrating. And they put it all together. Exactly. 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 <sighs> Coach Bent, if Notre Dame goes undefeated, Hartman would almost definitely be a Heisman candidate, but who would be the second choice? So the second choice from Notre Dame, is that is that what we're talking about, or the second choice overall? I mean, I I, I think I'm going to go with Notre Dame, Vince, because okay. I mean, number two overall, I'm going with the returner. Right? Yeah, right. Or, well, let's answer both. It's Caleb Williams if I have sure. to you know, take another one. Uh, second choice for Notre Dame. I mean, it would it, to me it would probably be Audric Estime. Yeah, that was going to be mine. You know, if no if Notre Dame goes undefeated, th- there's a chance that Audric Estime has like a 1500 yard, 20 touchdown season. You know, that's a part of it that could could put him up in that conversation. That I don't see any of the receivers putting up the numbers to like. I mean, Devontae Smith won the Heisman Trophy as a receiver because he put up insane numbers. I mean, when, when before him, when was the last time a receiver had won the Heisman Trophy? I'm trying to remember. Oh, it, had been, it had been a minute, right? Uh, oh, so yeah. yeah. Devontae Smith at receiver. The prior to that, the last time a receiver had won it was I'm in the I'm in the two thousands now, still nobody. Um I'm in the nineties now. Tim Brown. Desmond Howard in ninety <sighs> one. Okay. So you have to go back to 1991, although I would argue that Peter Warwick, I'm shocked that Peter Warwick didn't win it, but he would have been the Ron Dane year. So I get that. But yeah, Desmond Howard, I mean, receivers don't win it. Right. Well, what did it take for Desmond, for, for Devontae Smith to win it? Well, number one, you had a year where two of the major Power Five conferences played a half a season. None of those guys were going to be legitimate Heisman contenders. Yeah, good call. I forgot he won. Not the real Heisman season. contenders. So that limited the field a little bit. And that year, he had 95 catches that year. Well, actually, no, that's actually what he did in, in the NFL. I think he was at 98. Devontae Smith, college stats. Let me look this up. I was looking at his NFL stats. I was like, that those numbers are low on, on yards. He had 117 catches for 1,856 yards and 23 touchdowns. That's like, It took an insane numbers. year. Yeah. There's nobody at Notre Dame that's going to come close no. to that kind of production. No way. No, no. no way. So they and, and an offensive lineman's never going to win. If Orlando Pace can't win the Heisman Trophy, then you know, then no no offensive lineman's ever going. Have they even had? I mean, have they legitimately had defensive guys as finalists recently? Uh, well, Manti, well, and, I, uh, I was two thousand a couple years ago was okay, number two. Yeah, 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 right? yeah. That's right. So, but that was also. What was that? Was that 21? That was a 21 year, right? When Hutchinson was was that guy? Yes. That was after but, the 21 season. Yeah, like Orlando Pace finished fourth in Heisman Trophy voting. I mean, he was the best player in college football that year in 96. He just flat out was. Uh, but you know, yeah, Jewel, yeah, so so you had Manti in 2012, you had Aiden Hutchinson in in, in 2000 in, in 2021. 
So you've had a couple events, but it's not often. And and I don't know that Notre Dame would have you gotta have a would... special season to do yeah. that. Because I'm I'm looking at it here. So that let's so Hutchinson was number two in 21. And you also had Jordan Davis finish ninth. In 20, there were no defensive players. Chase Young fourth in 2019. He was fourth with 16 and a half sacks. Yeah. But that also was the year that Joe, Joe Burrow won it. So he could have had 30 sacks and he's not getting it. Uh, in 2018, Quinn and Williams was eighth. Uh, Roquan Smith in 17 was 10th. Uh, let's see. Jul- Jabril Peppers was fifth, but he was also a played offense and return kicks. Jonathan right. Allen for Bama was seventh. 15, you had a defensive player nowhere to be found. 2014, Scooby Wright finished ninth with 15 sacks. He was from Arizona. Year prior to that, no defensive players. Like 20 to 14, 13 is a perfect example. You had six, seven quarterbacks and three running backs. I mean, that's basically what the awards turned down to. Manti was second. Jadamian Clowney was sixth that year. And Jarvis Jones from Georgia was 10th. So they had three defensive players that year. 2011, Tyron Matthew was fifth. 2010, no defensive players, nothing but quarterbacks and running backs, one receiver. Here's an example. Justin Blackman that year had 111 catches for 1,782 yards and 20 touchdowns, and he finished fifth in Heisman voting. Wow. Those are silly numbers. Yeah. Uh, 2009, uh, Indomitian Sue was fourth. I mean, and okay. Sue was phenomenal. Right. He, he had 30. Yeah. He had 12 sacks. I, I, let me I forget what his tackle for loss number. He had 20 and a half tackles for loss and 12 sacks as a defensive tackle. That's nuts. Right. And you know who, did you notice who was missing from those years, Vince? No Aaron Donald. True. Right. I mean, and, and Aaron Donald had insane numbers because, again, it comes down to, you know, you've got to be at a big school or something like, you know what I mean? Like, or, or have some kind of name. It, Aaron Donald in 2013 as a defensive tackle had 28 and a half tackles for loss and 11 sacks, got zero, zero Heisman votes. Like, so no one from Notre Dame is going to do anything close no. to that. Right. So, and the only reason, let's be real. The only reason Manti got, was there in 2012 is because Notre Dame had nobody on offense that was remotely close to being. Correct. You know, they had to have somebody from Notre Dame as a Heisman. Because they were player. undefeated. Right. Yeah. Right. And he was the face of that team. Right. Tyler Eifert didn't put up the numbers to be there. None of the running backs did. The quarterback didn't. I mean, it was none. It's it was going to. He had to pick somebody. And Manti had some some great some great moments. And if Notre Dame goes undefeated, it's going to be because Sam Hartman has a crazy year. Right. Audrick's the only other one that I could think of. Yeah. If he has fifteen hundred yards and rushing and three hundred yards receiving and twenty touchdowns and Notre Dame's undefeated and he's their clearly the best player, he'll have a shot. But it's still probably going to Sam Hartman because it's, it's still going to be a long yeah. shot. Yeah. Andy football nerd CJ Procise had an elite burst speed, in my opinion, for a 220 pound player. Jay Love has been compared to Procise skill wise, but how does his strength potential compare? Very well. I mean, he was a 220 pound guy by the time he was a senior. CJ was a little thicker than Jeremiah coming out, but not by a lot. And and I don't know that I would say that CJ Procise necessarily played strong. Like I don't remember him running dudes over all the time. He he had yeah. a strong lower body, but I don't know if I'd say he played strong, if that makes sense. But I, I think that's a very fair I mean I think that's the best comparison I can think of. Length and speed and all that. I think Jeremiah's got a very very similar strength profile when it comes to how he plays the running back position. That's that's how I view it. So, thoughts, Vince, or are you ready to go to the next one? Yeah, I think I'm ready. I, the only thing I was going to say is I'm thinking about CJ Procise in my head, and strength, like running with strength, is not what jumps out at me when I remember him running the football. Right. I, and I'm not saying that he wasn't. I'm just saying that that's not the memory that I have when I think of CJ Procise. So, yeah. but that's all. Domer Grizz, happy Friday. What is the best part of your jobs other than the Friday mailbags? And what is the hardest part? What is the best part of my jobs other than the mailbags? Well, the best part is I just, I get to talk football all the time. I mean, my job is literally, I get paid to break down film and look at stats and all that kind of stuff. The hardest part is just having enough time in the day to get everything I need to get done. Because my job is is not just putting out content; it's running a business, 
and it's spending all day returning emails and and reaching out to people that have questions or problems and then all and doing proofing everybody's articles as best I can. And even then I'm sometimes like, I don't have time to proof it just public, you know what I mean? Which sucks, but that's just the reality of where we are, you know? And, and, um, just run, running the business part is, is the hardest part. It's not bad. I, I love doing it. I would, I would want to do nothing else as far as this, this, this job. But it's definitely the hardest part. It's just not having enough time in the day. I mean, Vince, you know what time I go to bed every night. And it's not because I'm just hanging out watching movies, you know. So <laughs> that's the hardest part. And, and like, there's yeah. just things I can't do content wise that I would love to do that I just can't because I can't not put out the content that we're putting out from a volume standpoint. I got the business stuff and all that. So uh, I'm hoping over the next year I can, there's a, a hire that I'd really like to make over the next year that if we can make that. Uh, would be really big. Not sure if it's going to happen or not, but um, you know, we, we'll, we'll do some things here. We're getting close enough financially to the point where I can start hiring some other things, other people to do other things, which will free me up. But um, yeah, that's the harder part. But that that'll you know, it's basically I want somebody. I want to hire some people that can handle the volume standpoint of of the content on the on the website. And then I can focus on this platform and then also doing some of the yeah. more detailed film breakdown stuff. Cause like, that's a, if I'm going to do like a film breakdown, it's like the Sam Hartman thing I did. It took like several days to go through all the film of his games to make sure that number one, I found the clips to use, but number two, that my uh, opinion of him wasn't just take four or five clips that back up a preconceived point. It's the point needs to come from the, the, the deep dive into the film. And that takes, hours upon hours upon hours if you're going to do it right and have any credibility in doing it. Yeah. And so it's hard to do that when I've got all the other things that I have to do on a daily basis, you know, cutting up. So like when we're done with this four hour podcast, I then got to cut it up, edit it, you know, upload it, put the ad breaks in and, and that's another hour. So, I mean, it ends up in, in, at least of, of preparation. And then, so it just, it just not having enough time in the day is really the hardest part. Of, of doing it all so hopefully that'll change someday but for now it is what it is it's where we're at you know let's go to the next one christopher crosby does the big 12 pack 12 play themselves out of the playoff i don't buy texas washington is good but their second half schedule is brutal usc has to show they can beat utah plus a loss to notre dame i think so i i think that Vince, you and I have discussed this. I, I know I discussed it last week, I think, on a show with Ryan, but I, I love the depth of those two leagues. So, so it's from a fan standpoint, I I said this to Bill Bender in a text yesterday. So I cannot wait to watch the Big 12 and Pac-12 this year because there's just going to be some great games in those conferences. But for a Big 12 team looking at the playoff, it, it, it does make it harder. I mean, USC could be a heck of a football team this year and lose three games. Yeah. I mean, seriously, I mean – it, that's just the nature of the schedule. I mean, they have to play Notre Dame on the road, right, which is not going to be easy this year. And some of the teams they didn't have to play last year, they have to play this year. They have to play Utah. They have to play at, you know, they have to play Washington. They have to play at Oregon. Then they have to play UCLA at home. So let's say that they're able to go, you know, two and one against Notre Dame, Washington, and Oregon. There's still a chance they got to play either Utah, Washington, or Oregon in a rematch in the Pac-12 title game. Mm-hmm. You know, like that's a that's a tough run. Let's say they're able to beat Notre Dame, but then they lose to Oregon or Washington, and then they got to play somebody. You know, it it's not an easy deal, man, to to have to beat teams twice. Of course, Utah makes me look foolish for saying that because they've literally done that the last two years. They beat Oregon twice two years ago and USC twice last year, but it's not that easy, right? Uh, Texas beat Oklahoma one year a few years ago. I think it was 2018. Texas beat Oklahoma. They played in a rematch, and Oklahoma whooped them. I mean, I whooped them, but beat them. Yeah, they were the, definitely the better team that day. So in the Big 12, is, I mean, literally, Vince, every team in the Big 12 except maybe Iowa State can beat any other team in the league on any given Saturday. And even Iowa State last year had a couple games where you know, they gave decent teams a run for their money. I just I just think that their talent level has just uh, – boy, the the, the – the gleam is off that one, right? With Matt Campbell, I mean, the way that they were last, how bad they were last year. Yeah, no kidding. Uh, you know, yeah, yeah, they had a three point loss at Texas, so I mean, they they did have a, 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 a that close loss. But yeah, it's it's going to be fun leagues. But to Chris's point, Vince, they definitely make it harder for them to be because it's hard for me to. It's going to be hard for a one loss or Pac twelve Big Twelve team to make the playoff unless it is Texas. 
or Oklahoma because they're just not going to get the benefit of the doubt yeah. over a one loss. And you know, you know the media is going to do. If there's like a two, let's say Alabama loses a loses a game the regular season but beats Texas, and then they lose to Georgia in a 35-31 shootout, you know people in ESPN are going to be like, no, nah, they should be in over whoever the one loss team is in, oh, 100%. You know, in the Pac-12 or, or the Big 12. The, there's only two teams that have a chance to get in with one loss, in my opinion. That's USC and Texas because they're blue bloods. That's it. Now, I'm right. not saying that's right. I'm not saying that's fair. I'm just saying that's the that's the challenge that they're going to have. Sure. Unless there's a bunch of two lost teams in the leagues. And, and I'm not saying a two loss team would get in, but that's going to be the cry that you're going to have. And it's just sure. it's going to be hard to run the table in those two leagues. It, they are very quality, deep leagues. And because there is no truly elite Georgia, Ohio State ish type of team, but even Ohio State, as good as they've been, has, have literally lost a, a conference game each of the last two years. So, um, you know, Ohio State beats Michigan and beats Penn State and then beats Michigan State when they're good, and then they go out and lose to Purdue or go out and lose right. to Iowa. Because if you have an off game against teams like that, they can beat you. And that's what makes the, the Pac-12 and the Big 12, in my opinion, entertaining and why I'm looking forward to watching them play this year. Thoughts? I, I mean, <laughs> you pretty much went through it, man. I don't want to I don't want to rehash what you just said. Okay. The problem is, is the depth. And yeah. it's a great it's a great thing for us. It's a bad thing for anybody that wants to move on. I mean, that's that's just the bait that you know they're because they're going to beat up on each other. And unfortunately, the Pac ten slash twelve whatever has been that way for a long time. I always feel like the Pac is always beating up on itself, and then they also run the problem of not a, they don't get enough eyeballs on their games. And so people look at records and then they're out. Yeah. To me, Vince, in the past, they would beat up on each other because none of them were any good. Well, that, and the right. difference For now sure. is there's a lot of really quality teams like the Pac-12. Sure. And this is what's frustrating about USC and UCLA leaving is if they would have stayed, I really think the Pac-12 was just from a pure football standpoint, is sure. getting ready to enter into a great era of football because, you know, obviously Kalen DeBoer at Washington, Lincoln Riley at, at the, and Chip Kelly in, in L.A., you, you, Arizona's coach is doing a really nice job. Judd Fish, uh, Jonathan Smith is really building up Oregon State. Oregon's already really good. I love the higher wash state. Like, they're getting ready to an, an era where, like, man, if the Pac 12 could stay together, that's going to be a really good football conference. Sure. And the NIL has helped them, you know, some of those teams be able to kind of buy some players, which they need to do to get some of those guys that are not from their region to come there. And it is what it is. And you look say, more this this league would have been if USC and UCLA didn't do the money grab, this would have, this league was yeah. on the verge of taking off from a pure football standpoint, and that's what sucks about it. It's not driven by what's your football league, the quality of your football league anymore. It's developed by well, what's your what's your TV revenue potential? And if you don't have a good TV deal, then teams are just going to leave conferences they've been in for over half a century, and I I can't stand that. And it, it just kind of sucks for the Pac-12 because I really feel like if they would have stayed together, that conference was going to make a run and start getting a lot better, in my opinion, moving forward because there's some good coaches there and some schools that are willing to invest in the programs, or at least some boosters that are willing to invest sure. in those programs. But it, alas, it's not going to happen because after this year, the Pac-12, as it currently is constituted, yeah. will no longer exist unless really barring tough. a miracle. Jordan Schreiber, chances Sam Hartman throws for 4,000 yards and 40 touchdowns. I think that's a little high. Does yeah. he have the ability? Yes. I just don't think he's going to have the opportunity to have that kind of a gaudy stat line. If Notre Dame plays for a championship this year and they get to 14 games, then maybe. Okay. For sure, maybe. Because that would be an average of 285.7 yards per game. Definitely we have possible. seen a quarterback yeah. do that at Notre Dame. It's Ian Book. I mean, Ian Book basically did that uh, back in 2018 as a starter. Now, for the entire year, Ian Book didn't average that much because he came off the bench and, you know, he only had like, what, three attempts against Vanderbilt. He played against Michigan but had no attempts. Played against Ball State, had no attempts. So that drags his numbers down. But if you look at Ian Book as a starter that year, Vince, especially in the regular season, I believe, if I remember correctly, Ian Book was over 300 yards per game uh, over the course of the entire season. So let me just check this real quick. Do the math. Minus 13 equals divided by what did he play? Uh, let's see, six, eight starts in the regular season. Yeah, Ian Book was at 306.9 yards per game. Now, again, that helped that he only played eight games. Sure. There might have been, the, you know, who what, would he have thrown for over 300 against Michigan? Probably not. It was a pretty right. good defense that year. 
So, I mean, there's some other things that factor into it. But the point is, is it's not unheard of to see a quarterback do that. The the But it's harder to do 300 yards at 13 games when you don't miss Florida State and Michigan and teams like that. For a quarterback to throw for 4,000 yards in 13 games, you have to average 307.7 point yards per game. Again, that's close to what Ian did. But that was over eight games, and they didn't play a lot of their better. You didn't, you know, the best team that they played in the regular season that year. Ian didn't have the best defense they faced. Ian didn't have to throw a pass against, right? Right. So it's doable, but it'll be tough. To Vince's point, it's much easier if they, if I I would be, if they play fourteen games, it's definitely doable, very doable. And uh, forty touchdowns might actually be a little bit tougher because it's hard for me to envision forty touchdowns when you've got all your estimates your running back. And that's the issue. If Notre Dame forty rushing touchdowns or forty it, total forty total touchdowns, Vince possible forty passes. Right, it's a little tough. So if Notre Dame's running game was not as good as I think it's going to be, or if the defense isn't as good as I think it's going to be, then these numbers are possible. But I think the run game is going to take some of the production away. And I think that the defense is going to hold teams down uh, from an offensive standpoint, a point standpoint. And so, so therefore, there's going to be a few more blowouts, things of that. And it's not going to be like a shootout, right? And so I think Sam Hartman's going to be riding some pine towards the end of some of these games. And so I don't think he's going to get the opportunity to, to really – However, in some of those games, he may have 300 yards in three quarters. Definitely, we'll we'll have to see how the offense plays out. Right, right, for sure. But for is it doable? Yeah, it's doable. I just think that there's a lot of. I think last year's more what he did last year. Vince, you say last year's more likely because he got to over 4,000 yards of Wake Forest in 2014, but or 2021. But again, that was in 14 games. Sure, because he if he doesn't play 14 games, he doesn't throw for 4,000 at Wake Forest, and that was a team that threw the ball all the time. Right. Last year they played twelve games. He was at three hundred and uh, three thousand seven hundred and one, and he would have got the four thousand if he played a thirteenth game. But again, that's a he played on an offense that they he averaged thirty five point seven yeah. attempts per game. That's I just lot. don't see that at Notre right. Dame this year, right? Because they had to do that at Wake. They had the shootout. I mean, right. he had, to, had to throw to. the ball all over the place. Right. And that's, he had yeah. what's he one two three. For five games, I'm sure he attempted over 40 passes. Yeah. I don't see that happening more than once. Right. Maybe twice at Notre Dame this year. Maybe. Right. I hope I hope it doesn't happen at all. Exactly. Right. But yeah. So good good questions. Good, good questions. We got a couple few super chats here, Vince. Excellent. Thanks, Mike, for the super chat. Really appreciate it. Power says Minchie is the future and top 100 agree. Well, considering I had Kenny Minchie ranked in my top 100, you maybe look at my ranking and you'll see that I agree with that. So, yes, uh, since he was in my top 100, I would say I agree with that. Tyler Evans with a super chat. Thank you very much, Tyler. Fellas, what is your favorite decade in sports? 80s, 90s, 2000s, or the 10s? For me, it's 80s easily, Vince. Really? Like, easily. Because think about who my teams are. Notre Dame, Boston Celtics, Denver Broncos, Cincinnati Reds. And at the time, Michigan basketball, who won a title in the 1980s, right? So Notre Dame won a national championship. The Celtics won three national championships. Notre Dame won a national championship. And the Broncos lost, but they still went to three Super Bowls, and I got to watch John Elway play every day. So, And the Reds weren't great in the 80s, but they were still good and won a World Series in 1990. So, yeah, the 80s for me – was phenomenal. Now the '90s started off good, and then it ended well from an NFL standpoint. But so, like, it started off well with Notre Dame being really good, and then the Reds winning the World Series. But the middle of the '90s sucked. The Celtics weren't <laughs> good anymore because Bird had retired. The Reds went downhill pretty quickly. The Broncos had some rough seasons in the middle, and then Notre Dame basically was like the Bob Davy era is how I finished the night. The middle and the late of the '90s. So it ended up. It was just inconsistent. 2000s, trying to block it all out of my head for all of them. You know, I mean, just – and 2010s was okay. I mean, the Bron- you know, Notre Dame's had some good years. The Broncos won a, a Super Bowl. But I stopped watching baseball, stopped watching the NBA. I just don't care as much about it anymore. So I have to go back to the 80s for me. Was, again, Vince, you you probably barely remember the 80s. Right. So it's the you 90s know, You're a lot younger me. than I am. 
Yeah, it's right. the 90s for me, uh, just because now the Cubs always stunk until 2016. So that's not really a thing. Uh, so you can't really count them. Uh, the Bears weren't very good, but I did enjoy very much watching the Bulls play. Uh, I was a, a, a Pacers fan as well, and they, they were battling there in the 90s, you know, with Reggie Miller and that whole group. And so I enjoyed watching them. Um, trying to think of what else. I mean, I, I from an NFL standpoint, I kind of uh, adopted the Niners as my team. And so I, I they were good in the 90s. You know, they, they were really good because it was hard to root for the Bears because they were just terrible. And so, you know, you root for a team that's really good. And I hated the Cowboys. Who is a cowboy? One of the Cowboys' biggest rivals of the '90s was 49ers, and so I, and of course Joe Montana, and then Jerry Rice, and the whole thing. So I really enjoyed watching the 49ers play. So the '90s were good, and I think a lot of it also has to do with just the nostalgia of the fact that I was like 10 to 20 years of age during the '90s. Like that was mm-hmm. my, and that's when I was just in love, like with sports. You know what I mean? Sure. It, it was that's when I really fell in love with sports and all of those things. So I think that's part of it. I look back on it. You know, you look back on some of your childhood memories and they're probably better in your head than they actually were in reality. That's how I look at the nineties. Like that was my high school years and middle school and all that stuff. So uh, it's the nineties for me. Well, that's why the eighties are for me convinced because it was that good. Like I said, the Celtics won three (laughs) titles. The the Broncos were in three super bowls. The Notre Dame won a national title. Like they were that good, you know? Um, I'm thinking of the teams I rooted for, they were four championships and three champ. Well, actually, there were four, there were four championships. And then let's see, um, 89 for Notre Dame. You have two others for the Celtics where they made the NBA finals and lost to the Lakers. So that's two more. And then the Broncos had three Super Bowls. So six years where they basically finished second. My team's finished second. Right. And so. Um, although I'll be honest, I don't remember the Celtics first title. It was only three. I, I remember yeah. the 84 on titles sure. more so uh, than the 81 title. But still, I mean, it's like when I started recognizing the Celtics as my team, because they were my dad's team, they were phenomenal. Right. right. And so, uh, yeah, it was 80s. That, But that, like it, it was that good for me. Right. I mean, I got to watch Larry Bird and John Elway playing the same decade. That was pretty cool for me. I mean, it's two of the greatest to ever do it at their positions. So, yeah, it was fun times, fun times. I hope that the 2020s ends up becoming that decade for yes. us moving forward. Man. Let's do nice. that. That That'd sounds very nice. great. It's still early. It's still early. There's a chance. Super chat from Travis. Thank you very much, Travis. If Sam Hartman's season ends with him as a Heisman candidate, what is the highest you could think he could get drafted? I don't, I don't know that a Heisman season will necessarily move the needle for him, but I, I, I'm still someone that believes the same. I, I yeah, I'm still someone who believes that if Sam Hartman comes out and balls out for Notre Dame this year, it's going to boost his draft stock a lot more than some think. I just don't think it puts him into like round one, but I think it could put him into like look. If Ian Book can be a third round draft pick, Sam Hartman can be a third round. Draft I'm going to be really I'm disappointed sorry. if Sam Hartman gets drafted lower than Ian Book. Well, I, I think part of that was just Sean Payton fell in love with Ian Book for some reason. I, yeah. I don't know that anybody else takes him in round three. Talk about buyers, but he probably Morris. would have been four or five at least. You know, so. Yeah, they they the buyers remorse they got that real quick. <laughs> they got Man. that real. That Sunday night football or quick. Monday night football it was one of those prime time games. I can't remember what the one that he started, and it yeah. was went down real fast. <laughs> it was, it was rough. Good. Irish blooded favorite OC and DC of the Kelly era. Favorite OC is Mike Dembrock, both as an OC and as a human being. Yep. Favorite DC of the Kelly era. Um, with all due respect, to Coach Freeman. Because I view him more That's as that coach. True. It's 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 Mike Elko. Elko again as a coach and a person. I I got along well with Coach Elko very well. Still occasionally chat with him. Like he's a good guy, good man. Coach Lee was also a very good man. I just his style of play on defense is just not mine. I, it's not what I prefer. I, I like I like a more aggressive, a sound but aggressive defensive scheme. And Elko was that way. And that's why I just thought. And, and he was and and Elko is also a much better recruiter than Clark Lee as well. Yeah, so Den Brock, uh, Den Brock, and um, and Mike Elko is the one for me. Those would be my choice as well, but it's a it's a close second to Chip Long. Uh, yeah, from an offensive coordinator. Chip standpoint. Chip's the person I got along well with best. Yeah, right. Personally, but the offense is the fifteen offense is still the best one Notre Dame has had. 
like in in the Kelly era, and that was a Denbrock offense. So, yep, good questions. I gotta remind me to tell you a story about Mike Denbrock later okay. on. So about current events, Mike Denbrock. Okay, interesting. So, yeah, somebody I know very well was invited to stay at their house for a couple weeks. So okay. Cool. Anyway, uh, Rob Osgood with the super chat. Thanks, Rob. I'd pay money to see Scott Satterfield versus Brian Driscoll in a cage match. Scott didn't love the Ole blocks in high school. Yeah, uh, I think I think Rob, if I remember correctly, like played with him or against him, and he wasn't really well liked by his teammates. Is what he's referring uh, to. I believe is the scenario here. Okay. Um. Sure. I no, mean, why are you cage okay. matching people, man. Like, I don't know. <laughs> I'm not a big fan of Scott Satter. And the thing is, I really liked that hire when Louisville first made it. I really did. Yeah. But he was a huge disappointment. And not just record wise, but just how he carried himself and how he conducted himself was just kind of cool, you know. All right. Mike J with the super chat. Thanks, Mike. Is there a bigger playoff game than Notre Dame versus Michigan? Well, not for Notre Dame and Michigan fans. I don't know about so, the I mean, country. I, I, I would say I would rather see a playoff game between Notre Dame and UM if we're talking about Miami. I, I, that would mean Ooh. more to me than Michigan because there's there's at least a tra- you know the tradition of playing four championships against them. Uh, yeah, there'd be a lot of bigger playoff games. Playing Alabama would be a bigger playoff game than playing Michigan. Right. Playing Georgia would be a bigger playoff game than – Playing, if we're talking about it from a Notre Dame standpoint, or I feel like playing standpoint. Ohio State would be a bigger playoff yeah. game than Notre well, Dame. I, the only reason I would say no to that one, Vince, is just because at least they've played recently, where Notre Dame and Michigan haven't played since 19, I guess. Is, but look, the bigger playoff games for Notre Dame are going to be against Bama and Georgia. That, that's, sure. And, and I would say if somehow Notre Dame and Texas both got in the playoff, that mm. would be an even – if we're talking about from a national brand standpoint, that right. would be much bigger. If we're talking about from a national standpoint, two playoff games against two northern a, – a national a playoff game or a title game against from with two northern teams playing each other does not have the same appeal as right. regional powers with, you know, blue bloods from different areas. Yeah, agreed. So, yeah, that's um, – yes, there would de- there could definitely be bigger playoff games than, than that one. So, yes. Uh, here, here's another one that I, I, I'm going to answer quickly because I don't have an opinion, Ben. So I'm going to ask it in case you have an opinion. But Joe okay. Medina says, any thoughts, any thought on Sam Harmon's mom planning to turn Sam's surgically removed rib into a necklace? That was the plan for a long time. Like I, I, I heard that months and months ago. So, um, okay, it's pretty kind of a savage move, I guess. Sure. Uh, I but I don't, I don't have an opinion on it. It's just no, like that, I mean, that's a, to me, that's a personal thing and I don't yeah. really care about people's personal. Okay, lives, so. cool. Sure. Yeah. Football, ND football nerd, the Notre Dame front was inconsistent stopping the run last year and lost a good edge setter in Foskey. And now Mills has moved back inside. How can Notre Dame fill the void and improve in setting the edge defensively? Well, number one, I think that they're going to be better against the run with Mills inside than they were last year. Uh, so I think that's one thing. And the, and the reason I bring that up, because you're asking about the edge, is if you're more disruptive up the middle, it makes it easier to set the edge because you force the bounces quicker. So you force the backs to declare quicker. Uh, I don't, I don't, I didn't think that Jordan Patelho had any issue setting the edge last year when he was in the game. And I think Javante Jean Baptiste is, is the bigger question mark. Cause he just, he didn't play a ton against the run at Ohio state. I mean, he did, but he didn't play a ton period. Definitely didn't play against the run. Not us pretty good at setting the edge. I think what it comes down to is how can you fill the void is it's really just comes down to effort and, and proper coaching, right? So, Hey, here's the angle you got to play. Here's the, you know, you got to use the wrong arm, right? The, the, the excuse me, the right. proper arm, you know, play this leverage. Don't allow yourself to get sealed in this. I mean, it just comes down to executing your assignment and then doing it with force. Uh, you know, so it, it, it setting the edge is, is you have guys that are great at it because they're great talents, but you don't have to be a great player to be good at it. It's just, you've got to have some level of athleticism that you're not getting reached and those type of things. And you've got to, you know, play with good pad level and you've just got to fundamentally execute it correctly. It's really you know what it comes down to. So the question that I would have that is going to be more determined by the losses is will they be able to be as productive as they need as as they need to be from a a run game standpoint. I think that's kind of a bigger question for me. Yeah, I felt like they got hurt more up the middle than they did on the edge last year and moving yeah. Mills inside and a uh 
a better play from the linebackers as well should prevent that from happening. So, yeah, yeah I think they're going to be fine, hopefully. I mean, look, the run game is the big question mark defensively because that was their that was their biggest weakness at times. They haven't been, they haven't been great against the run yeah. in a while. Right. I mean, it's been a minute. since Really since 2012. It's right. The last time they so it's a really question mark. I totally understand where, where you're coming from, nerd. Uh, but I, I – I, <laughs> You said that in such a way that it sounded like an insult. Nerd. <laughs> I know what you mean. Well, it's, it's, I didn't want to say the whole thing. I know. Uh, but uh, I understand where you're coming from, but I don't think it's going to be as big of an issue as people think. Yeah. Agree. <laughs> Nerd. Agree. Uh, here's here, We'll get some quick ones, Vince. Let's knock out a few quick ones here real quick. So we can okay. T-Guns is one touchdown, 100 yard. Oh, for every 100 yards, a good ratio. I think so. Yeah. So like 300 yards passing yeah. for, uh, you know, and a touchdown for a quarterback, I would say for a running back, it's, you know, I always kind of feel like hundred for two is kind of the way that I sort of look at it is a, is a little bit more of a ratio, maybe one and a half or for every hundred, if, if that makes any sense. Meaning like if you get to 150, you get that two. You, is that, that's what I mean by yeah. one and a half. And so like per hundred, so 150 means two touchdowns, but it's a little closer to two for a hundred yards as a rusher. Uh, for a receiver, it's it's a it's a very good ratio for a receiver. I feel like that's the position that more than any is that way. Quarterback, it's close to that. I mean, you know, if you're 3,500 yards, you're 30 to 35 touchdowns. I mean, that's that's close to it. I think rushing would be the one that can skew it a little bit. Sure, that would 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 be there. Well, because they're yeah, rushing is yeah, because you can have some short yardage touchdowns and some. Right. Some things of that nature. But you could also be a guy that gets 200 yards and you get like like Barry Sanders. If you look at his touchdown numbers in his career compared to his rushing numbers he didn't have the same production because the way the lions would use him they would sometimes bring him out in goal line situations because he was a smaller back right right so i mean he had over 10 touchdowns his first three years but in his last seven years he was single digits in four years and then the other three years he was only 11 the year that he had 2,000 yards he only had 11 rushing touchdowns that year that's crazy yeah, exactly. And I, I, and I bet I if you looked at him, complaints about it. You know, I'll bet you if you looked it up, those 11 touchdowns were all probably all long, somewhat long runs. longer. But you yeah. look at Terrell Davis when he rushed for 2,000 yards, and this is the point is he had 21 touchdowns. Right. So it, just the way that they were used. Right. Yeah, uh, it really had a big factor in it. So, yeah. A couple more quick ones here. Uh, Indy Football Nerd, who's the most athletic quarterback on the 23 roster? Say probably the best athletes, probably, probably Sam Hartman. Actually, uh, Sam Hartman's a much better athlete than people give him credit. Go yeah, back to rushing as a freshman, and yeah, he, he's a pretty <laughs> decent athlete. He's not a runner, he's right. a good athlete. Right, uh, Kenny Minchie probably second, Steve Angeli third, but they're all very close. There's not a, a sure. lot of separation from an athleticism standpoint between the three quarterbacks on the roster. Now that changes in 24 when CJ Carr shows up because he's without question better, a better athlete right. than all those guys. Yep, agreed. Um, so, yeah, I would probably go Hartman. But if you were to make a case for Angeli or, or Minchie, I wouldn't necessarily argue with you because they're all kind of close, yeah. in my opinion. Jordan Schreiber, if Kenny Minchie wins the backup role, do you think Steve Angeli transfers or sticks around after the season? I don't know. I hope he stays. I mean, I, 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 enough I, about Steve. I, I want him to get the degree. I, I think he really likes Notre Dame. I, I I don't know. I don't like to project that. I, I can all I can say is I hope he stays. That's mm -hmm. about all I can say is I hope I hope that he stays. Yeah. Yeah. I just don't know enough about Steve the person to, to right. say either way, to be right. honest with you. I get the Meaning, world we, we don't know in. his goals and right yeah, exactly. and, and the world that we live in right now. If you're relegated to third string consistently, I get it. If you want to play, I mean then you're going to transfer. So right. uh, it, it just all depends. Yep. Ryan with the mailbag question, injuries are part of every season. So which position group do you feel most confident can survive injuries? And which do you feel least confident aside from quarterback? Thanks guys. Have a great Friday. So this is a depth question. We had another depth question. And we'll get to here later. Uh, position that I, I'm most confident can survive injury aside from quarterback or uh, uh, that I'm on offense. It would be, probably wide receiver because I think the freshman could easily step in and start. There's going to be backups that are good players running back. I'd say no, because there's already like injury already some injury issues there. Yeah. O line. It would depend on which O lineman, right? 
right? If it's Joe Alt, eh, you right. know, just because right. there's going to be a big drop off. But you know, if one of the guards goes down, I think it'll be okay. Sure. Uh, I just want four, one of the five tackles, guys right. competing for two spots right now. Right. Exactly. Uh, defensively, the position where I'm most confident that they will be okay is probably corner. I'll go in this order: corner, D tackle, linebacker, D end, Viper, especially safety. Uh, flip flip side of that, which do I feel least confident? So on defense, it's safety, right? Because if they lose one of this, they're, they're, they're in some trouble. Offensively, aside from quarterback, it's running back. If and it's more so Audric, I right. The, because I just have so many questions about the health of the other players in the roster. And every guy behind Audric has an in checkered injury history. You know, Devin Ford's got one. DeBron Payne's got one. Jadarian Price has got one, right? Jeremiah Love's the only guy that doesn't have it because he's a freshman. He's never been there. So, right, that would be a bit of an issue yeah. for me. The only other one I would say offensively, if you were really going to split some hairs, would be tackle. Yeah. Because, that, like yeah. you said, it would be a big drop-off. And I, yeah. and I know that's not offensive line, but – not every no, offensive lineman can play every spot. So, yeah. well, and that's what I hinted at earlier. Like, I'd be a little nervous if one yeah. of the tackles went down. Yeah, uh, especially Alt because he's more yeah. established right now. For sure. So, yeah, that's a that that's an interesting one. Good question. How many catches and yards do you think each of the freshman wide receivers, Great House Flores, James, end up with at the end of the season? Do Great House and Flores burn their red shirt? I think they do. I, I, you know me, Vince. I'm not a big fan of redshirting receivers, so right. I, I would play all of them. Uh, how many catches and yards do I think that they'll have? I'm going to go 35 catches for at least 550 yards as a as a trio. I think that's okay. what they'll do. Okay. Because I have Jaden. You know, I have Rico. I, went, I took the over for Rico at 15. Right. I think Jaden will be similar, if not more. You know, but but so I don't want to put too much on Jaden Greathouse right away. Right. He yeah, might no be doubt. 15 to 20 perhaps and sure. then maybe five ten for Braylon maybe five for Braylon because I think he's the one that needs the most work fundamentally of the three even though he might have the highest ceiling I sure. still think Braylon James has the high ceiling but we always knew he was going to need work route wise and stuff like that so uh but um I, I would I would burn all their red shirts honestly I, I wouldn't red shirt because if Braylon James is the for example uh or Rico Flores or Jenga if any of those guys are who you think they are then they're not five year players and if they are five-year players, they're not necessarily guys that you're going to necessarily want to use the roster spot with. And if they are coming back as a fifth year in a situation like that, it's more so going to be because a guy missed his junior year or something like that with an injury. Right. And then that's where the fifth year comes from. But they're just – they're not going to be guys that you redshirt as a freshman and then you're going to want to bring them back. It's because that means that they're not getting drafted high, which means they're not impact right. players. <clears throat> uh, you know, and, so it just yeah. – it would be a little bit of a different situation for me. From Christopher Crosby, is this finally the year we can stop saying Notre Dame can't get into a shootout with blank team? Confidence level Notre Dame offense averages 35 to 40 points per game. I have a very high confidence level. There'll be minimum 35. I mean, I'd say like eight on that one, right? Like I'm pretty confident. Is this the year? We'll find out because here's the thing, Chris. I understand where he's coming from because they'll they'll have a they'll have the ability to score better. But there's a difference between scoring and being clutch. And that's what we don't know about this team. Right. And 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 honestly, that's what we don't know about Sam Hartman. Because in a lot of those shootouts at Wake, they lost. And I'm not blaming him for that. But if you're in a shootout, it's because your defense isn't making stops. So you may be able to stay in a shootout, but can you win? We don't know the answer to that. Does Notre Dame have money players the way that C.J. Stroud was for Ohio State last year or the way that Stetson Bennett was for Georgia or, you know, guys that can step up and be that – the way Hendon Hooker was against Bama last year, uh, that type of thing. We don't know the answer to that yet. And Sam hasn't had a good enough team around him to be able to go answer that question yet. And so those are different aspects of it that you look at and say, we, we there's a lot of things we still have to learn about winning a shootout. Now, can they get in shootouts? Yes, because the premise before about how uh, Notre Dame can't get in the shootout is they're not good enough offensively if the other team is scoring right? to be in the game. Now right. they are to be in the game. But does that mean you're winning 58 to 55 
or losing, which is something that Sam Hartman's been a part of. And sure. again, I'm not blaming Sam Hartman for that because if you if you if you lead your team to 55 freaking points, you should win unless it's a multi overtime game. And it wasn't. They just got beat right. by North Carolina, even though he let you know. So I don't blame him for that. But I'm just saying is it's not up to the quarterback to win that game. I mean, Deshaun Kaiser leads Notre Dame to a, a, a touchdown with 30 seconds left against Stanford. What else can he do? Right. Well the defense goes up and gives a field goal drive in less than 30 seconds. I mean, right. Right. So there's just a lot that goes into it, but uh, they can at least get into, into more shootouts this year. I just hope they don't have to. And that's, that's the, that's the kicker, right? I mean, because the last few years, have you ever been confident that Notre Dame could go score for score with a team when they needed to, you know what I mean? Like Mm -hmm. I just, I never, it was rare that like the, uh, the other team would go down and score. I'd be like, all right, Notre Dame just got to score. They're going to match it. No problem. Like it was like, man, hope they can uh, match a score with a score here. You know, it, it, it's a different feeling. And my feeling that I think I'm going to have as I'm sitting there watching the game is that, okay, Notre Dame's going to go down and score here. It, it, it's more going to be, okay, Notre Dame needs to stop them here. And I think they can, but yeah, I, I'm going to have more confidence in the offense. I will say that much, that mm-hmm. they can put points on the board. Let's go to uh, here. All right, fun hypothetical from Robert. With Coach D as offensive coordinator and Ryan as defensive coordinator, you are starting another IB staffer on the current ND roster. Who takes the field and what scheme results in impact plays for them? I mean, Vince is my is my kicker. <laughs> I, mean, <laughs> um, I don't know about that. Uh, who That's takes the though. field and what scheme? Man, results I mean, and impact plays for them. I mean, I'm blitzing Ryan because I don't know if he's fast enough to make plays without running. Uh, okay. What scheme allows me to make impact plays? Whichever one requires me not to have to run that much. <laughs> so, um, what scheme would allow me to be an impact quarterback? Uh, oh no, as OC, okay, because the, there was another question about us as players. I'm sorry, OC. Oh, okay. Uh, honestly, the, so Vince is my holder. That's where Vince is. I Vince is my that. holder, so that's can, an easy out there. I can do as that. OC. I mean, honestly, I'm I'm kind of a a, a shotgun pro style guy, like a spread pro style guy. Mm-hmm. Uh, I like a lot. I mean, so my offense would look somewhat like Tommy Reese's did at times when he was really mixing up the personnel, like, so like the North Carolina game, my offense would look a lot like what it looked that his offense looked like in that game, mix up personnel, a ton movement, you know, getting multiple guys involved, uh, stuff like that would look a lot like, but I'd, you know, be more RPO oriented. I like RPOs a lot. I mean, we were doing stuff like that back when I was co- pass game coordinator, seeing you back in like Oh four and Oh five. I mean, we were doing we were doing similar stuff off that. So I mean, way back then. So I mean, we were doing we did Wildcat in 05. You know what I mean? Like with Kazim Burke. I mean, we were, you know, we did so that none of that stuff's new. It's been around. It's just more prominent now. So mm-hmm. but the point being, as I would have evolved as a coach, that would have become a much bigger part of what I was doing. So um similar to that. Ryan is DC. I'm not sure what he would want to do. I mean, I Ryan said in the past he's a four two five guy. Yeah, he has he said likes four two five. So uh, scheme wise, but what we do scheme wise, I don't know specifically with inside of the four two five what he would want to do. And we don't have twenty two guys on staff, so we can't really yeah. uh, you know put together right. a whole team. Here was the up. second part of his question: was how do results change if Coach D is also playing quarterback uh, and starting linebacker? Uh, it'd go zero and twelve if I was playing quarterback. I'm forty five <laughs> years old and right. I'm way out of shape and uh, was was not a Notre Dame caliber player to begin with. So. Yeah, how would how would results change? I would just pray that we can run for 300 yards a game. Yes, like that's just what I'll to hand the ball off to SMA. with everyone knowing we're still handing it off. Correct. Yes, that that would be our. Home and then game. I get to trot out and hold the extra point. Yes, I'm fine there with you that. go. On the one so, touchdown drive we'd have during the season, hey, whatever. <laughs> just just put just put Dylan on. How staff, would the results change if I was the if I was quarterback one? Here's what I would say to do: If I'm the Notre Dame coach and I'm starting quarterback, is put me in against Navy. Let me hand the ball mm. off against uh, to, uh, against Navy, and then bench me for the rest of my career. That <laughs> would be the best thing to do. <laughs> if you're the coaches at Notre Dame, and I'm QB one uh, to great. start the season, <laughs> that's absolutely <laughs> bench uh, me. What, bench me after I hand the ball. Like, you know, let me get a first series, right? Like, right. Let me do like a little bootleg so I can get a, an, an attempt under my belt. You know, 
uh, get a little slide route dump off to Audric, and then you know let Audric just lead us down the field like ten straight runs, two play actions yep. that I don't have to throw the ball more than two yards down the line of scrimmage, and then I tip my cap, hang it up. That that's the dream, right? <laughs> that's leave, the dream. But don't ever play me again. Yard line. <laughs> don't ever. We got the ball at the forty going in. You know, don't ever play me again if you want to win games. Oh, that's that's funny. the best way to go about it. So, uh, that's fun funny. question. That's a good one. It's a good one. Ryan, let's say Navy comes out with the same defensive game plan that they had in the second half from last year. How would Hartman be able to take advantage in ways Pine couldn't? This is where experience helps, right? Yeah. I mean, Drew hadn't really seen a defense like that that was just blitzing from everywhere. Sam mm -hmm. Hartman has. Uh, he'd be able to recognize the blitzes a little bit better, set the protection more effectively to make sure you're sliding to the side where the pressure's coming from, uh, have a better idea of where you're throwing hot. Notre Dame doesn't isn't a team that had hot routes, but you have hots, right? I mean, I don't have a quote-unquote hot route because a hot route to me is, hey, you see blitz, you slant right behind it, right? Like that's a hot, a hot route to me, Vince, and I don't know if you view it the same way, is you're breaking your route off because this guy blitzed. Right. Yep. Notre Dame didn't do that. What I mean is throw hot means if this guy blitzes, I know that I've got to quickly get the ball out to this. You've got a safety valve. Is what Correct. Some and it's, call it, but, yeah. it, but it's already happening. So right. my crosser, which it's is my in. check down route, is now my hot route. Right. Or my pivot route that was going to be my read deep and then come to the pivot is now my hot route or my swing to the back is now right. my hot route. Or I check out of it and say, hey, we're doing this. They're walked up. Even if they smoke, I know with that center, that free safety right over us on the inside hash, they're in cover one. I know they can't cover him outside one-on-one. -on -one. I'm sure. banging that go route where Sam Hartman will have more of a freedom to do that, that Drew just wasn't as a first-year starter. So it would be those ways, Vince. So protection, better protection checks, knowing who the hot is, throwing off that guy, uh, making some of the open throws that are there. I mean, if he hits Michael Mayer on that wheel route in the third quarter, Navy's not blitzing anymore because the game's over, right? Yeah. I mean, it's basically over at that point in time. So uh, those are all things, Vince, that I look at and say, it's those little things sure. and just it, that, that really come from experience. And there was no way to replicate that for Drew last year. I, well, and I would even just wasn't. Yeah, I would even say that Drew would have more success against it if he was doing it this year as he did last year. Yes, because he'd be more prepared for it. Because yes, he that's saw That's a great it. point, Vince. Yeah. That's a great point. Drew would handle that from Navy better today, this Correct. year, in August 26th, than he did last November. Yeah. It's a great point. Great point. Oh, and it came up. I didn't even yes. see it flat. Okay, here we go. Jordan with a question. Do you think with Stucky being at Notre Dame, we start to see receivers get drafted again? What players have a legitimate shot at the first three rounds well i mean they had a guy drafted at receiver not that long ago i mean chase, chase claypool, claypool was a second drafted. rounder and uh boykin got and, drafted and, and ben skoranek got well Ch uh boykin got drafted the year before claypool oh okay uh ben skoranek was in the was drafted in 2021 he wasn't drafted high but he was still drafted by the rams uh yeah of course of, of course look kevin austin would have been drafted if he didn't have the injury issues yeah. And some of the background issues from early in his career. There was a lot of red flags for a guy right. that had very little production for his career. Mm -hmm. That's just the reality of it. Uh, if he would have come back and played in 2022, I think Kevin gets drafted. I agree. Like that's just my opinion. Yep. So uh, you know that's kind of where where I, uh, I come from it on that one, Vince. But yeah, I mean the town will be better. The development will be better. And and like yeah. Avery Davis would have got drafted if not for two devastating injuries. I, I still feel like Avery Davis would have been a day three pick if he doesn't have devastating injuries. I so there's a there's been some bad luck. I mean, we can we can like I'm no Dell Alexander fan. Everybody knows that, but he, he can't control some of the things that happened. Like Kevin Austin stuff. That that wasn't that, that Kevin Austin's injuries were not Dell Alexander's fault. Avery Davis's injuries were not Dell Alexander's fault. If if those guys didn't have those injuries and some other things going on, I think they're both drafted guys in my sure. opinion. I just, you know, so I just I'm I'm not I'm not going to I have a lot of issues with Dell Alexander, but he coached Chase Claypool all but one year of his career in in, in at Notre Dame. I mean, outside of his freshman year, Dell was his position coach the next 3 years. Sure. And he you know, he became a second round draft pick. Uh so I, 
you know, I, I think it has more to do with the talent wasn't as good. And I mean, Braden Lindsay would have had a shot at getting drafted if they used him correctly. And he actually wanted to, cause he mm-hmm. would have tested very well. So, you know, he, he might've been a seventh round draft pick, but um, yeah, that's, but yes, yes. The answer is yes. But I just, I don't think it's because Stucky's here per se. I just think they would have had more guys get picked because they have better players. Even mm-hmm. some of the guys that are going to get I, like the next guys that get drafted from Notre Dame probably won't be guys that Chancey Stucky recruited. That's going to be guys that Dell Alexander or That's Chip true. Long slash Tommy Reese recruited. Right. Right. Bulesfield Financial Services Inc. Brian, thank you for the t shirt. I'm a yeah. gold club member for life. So JP upgraded to the gold club recently. And so as part of that, if you are a part of the Irish Breakdown Booster Club and you can sign up at boards.irishbreakdown.com, you can, if you're a new member or if you're a current member that's monthly or annual and you upgrade to the uh, the Shamrock Blue or Gold, you get a you get free merch. And so since JP is now a gold club member, he got merch. the free IB Club shirt. So it kind of looks like this, but it's a green. And instead of saying nation, it says uh, gold club. On nice. It. And it's Vince's is even more telling because this type of this blue does not exist. It's more of the green, I the traditional shamrock. And instead of na- saying nation, it'll say gold club. And then you get the IB uh, mug. So like the, the IB mug you guys have seen me drink out of, it's that, but it says club on it. IB club that o- it's not available for sale. The gold club shirt's not available for sale. Vince doesn't have one. I don't have nope. one. Ryan doesn't have one. Those only go to to to, sh- to booster club members. IB booster club members and JB. My man JP is one, or JB awesome. is one. So I appreciate you for that very, very much, buddy. So thank you. Just Brady talking, Brian. If you were the head coach at Notre Dame, you 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 have been you have been given head coach and offensive coordinator responsibility and QB one and, and QB one. I mean, this is a, this is a good day for you. Yes. Uh, he says, if you were head coach at Notre Dame, is there anybody from the IB staff you would bring on to the Notre Dame staff with you? It can be a very minor role. Or a large one, it's up to you. Since this is a, a not realistic and I don't want to piss anybody off, yes, I'd bring them all on. Um, <laughs> <I bet. laughs> Vince is my Vince is my kicking coach. No, stop uh, the kicking stuff. I don't want to be the kicking coach. Sean I want Davis, to be the director of ops. Sean Davis would absolutely be my my hype man. Uh, <laughs> he he would he would absolutely be that. He'd be my Brian Polian. Um, he <laughs> I don't know that that's a compliment. <laughs> It's not. <laughs> it is for Sean, but it's not for Brian Polian. Uh, Sean Styers would be. Um, I would bring him on, but I would have him take over the. Uh, uh, I would. Per- I would have him take over the calling oh, game yeah. during the. You know, he'd be my announcer guy during games. Heck yeah, uh, he would definitely be doing that for me. Uh, Ryan would. Um, I don't know what I would have Ryan do, but I'd have him do something. He'd be an analyst for me. No, he, no actually, honestly. Pretty. I would have no, actually, I would have him doing. He'd be in my advanced scouting department. Okay, he'd be working with Matt Jansen as part of my event, like having him breaking down film and players and sure. stuff of future opponents, like in seriousness. Like that's what I would have him doing. Like not even joking. That's what I'd have him doing for sure. I want to be so. director of ops. I want to be, you know, controlling things. Well, you got to be there because you got to be that person would have my back. Yeah, you know, uh, you you always need that guy that that uh, is always going to have your back in the that's office, me. and that would definitely be Vince. Yeah. So. You'd be my Ron Paulus, and you'd be better at the job than <laughs> Ron Paulus. All right. So yeah, that's what you'd be for me. I would. I would actually love that job. Yeah. Uh, Jordan Schreiber can Sneed take reps away from Marist at will? Possibly. I don't think sure. Will's the position he's going to be at to start fall camp. But it's look if Marist is your third best linebacker, either him or Jack's going to move to Will. And I could see Marist doing that. Certainly, he played some Will in the spring too. But yeah, I could see that. I could see him or Nolan Ziegler, either one of them. T- I could yeah. see Nolan Ziegler, Jalen Sneed, or Jack Kaiser taking snaps away from JD Bertrand at will. Yeah. I was watching a bit Take of the BC game. Yeah, I was. Uh, that's yeah, that's what I meant. I was watching the BC game last night, Vince, and I got to the fourth quarter, and it just reminded me again of I still can't believe they moved to Junior Tuilamak away from Mike because he was playing Mike <sighs> in that game, and I was like, man, he's really good at that. Man, but is that what it still is. Shocks me too because yeah. I thought he was molded. For Mike linebacker, yep. I mean, Agreed. just mm. anyway. Irish Guardian, not if the offensive starters all had to play defense and the defensive starters all had to play offense. What would the lineups look like, and who would win? There's some interesting questions today. Uh, if the defensive <laughs> players had to play offense, okay. 
Uh, my offensive line, I, I I would have Gabriel Rubio playing offensive line. I would have Aiden Canaana playing offensive line. Um, I, I honestly can't even think of. I, I, that's the problem, though, because We're offensive line hours and defensive in. linemen I, are like way too. I'd have different. Xavier Watts playing receiver, Cam sure. Hart playing receiver, Benjamin sure. Morrison playing receiver. I'd have oh, Drake Bowen is at running back. Him and Micah Bell are my two, my Thunder and Lightning oh, at running back. Interesting. Uh, I'd have probably Press and Zinter being a fullback, like H back type guy. Kaiser could be your quarterback. Yeah, Kaiser. Kaiser. Yes, that's true. Because Ka- I'm trying to think of who played quarterback in high school. Yeah. It would be Kaiser or Josh Burnham. One of the yeah. two would be my quarterback. Um, see, defensive line, <laughs> Rocco. Um, I don't know, man. Emil <laughs> Wagner. <laughs> right. Cooper Flanagan, for sure. Okay. Uh, he'd be one. Uh, corners. Linebacker. Audric would be your middle linebacker. Yeah. I don't know because he's just a big body. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. My brain's a little fried right now to think about that. It's a a fun question. Honestly, because I know who this is, this is a much better message board question. That would be fun, yeah. Like, this would be a really fun message board question because I could think it through and have some fun with it, but – yeah, my mind's. I mean, if you if you're going starter for starter, you got to put Hartman at like free safety. I mean, you've got to have him kind of in the back. I wouldn't want him running with wide receivers or anything. He's got to play center field, right? I would think. Um, but I don't know. Yeah, but, yeah. Message board it, buddy. Definitely a message right. board message board question, my friend. PQ, what to do? What did what did it do? I think that's the name. Okay, we all expect Notre Dame to be good this year, and a big part of that is Sam Hartman. How do you think the 23 roster stacks up compared to recent Notre Dame teams when you remove quarterback from the equation? See, I know that Sam Hartman gets a lot of the hype, and he is a big reason for the excitement. But the reason for the excitement because you get Sam Hartman is not because he's Caleb Williams, but because you finally have a quarterback that can kind of utilize the talent you have everywhere else. Exactly. That's really what it comes down to. And so when I look at it, you know, I think this team is very talented. It's, it's you know, look, we, we went through the different years and, you know, I, the 23 running back room would get consideration if I knew they were all healthy. I expect the offensive line to be very good. It's very deep. It's young, but it's very deep. Mm-hmm. I think this is as good as Notre Dame has been from a talent in the starting lineup plus depth standpoint at corner. Uh, I think the safety position is going to be good this year. I, I love the town at linebacker. The depth is young, but it's good. I think this is as deep as Notre Dame has been at defensive tackle in a very long time, very long time. You know I mean? Like I'm sitting there thinking about it, like Tyson Ford might not get on the field much as a freshman or sophomore, whereas Kurt Heinish and Myron Tungvaloa played a bunch as freshmen and sophomores. Why? Because there was nobody else. Whether they were ready or not, they had to play. And they held their own, and they did good things in those roles, but they had to play. Tyson Ford's like, dude, he's got to beat out like six dudes to get on the field this year. Same with Donovan. Like Donovan Heinish is, be- to me, at the same age, is, is more athletically gifted than Kurt was. But Donovan's going to have a tough, tough time getting on the field the first two years where Kurt played a ton. Is that because right. Kurt's better player? Not yeah. necessarily. The opportunity was easier because yeah. there was nobody else there. Right. And Kurt took advantage of it and, and, and more than held his own during his Notre Dame career. So please don't take those as insults to him. It's just it's such a deeper unit now. I mean, there's a chance Josh Burnham's going to be your third string Viper this year. He's arguably the best pound for pound athlete they have on the entire team. The position that I'm concerned about is an injury at safety makes me very nervous and big end. Those are the two positions I'm most concerned about because we need to see that Javante Jean Baptiste can be that guy. If he's not that guy, yes, I'm a little yeah. nervous about that position yeah. because I think Nana's more of a rotational guy. Sure. Now you're getting into freshmen needing to play there. So. That would be the only one that I'm really curious about. But I love the town of receiver. I love the town at tight end. There's some injury questions at tight end and running back. But I, I really love – this is partly why I'm so excited about this team. I love the town as football team. I do. I think this is a very talented football team. And we started to see it at, in flashes late last year. Yeah. And and that was still with a lot of flaws. You know, it's like it's it's funny. There's like Notre Dame fans say, well, you know, the South Carolina win didn't mean as much because they were missing X amount of players. I'm like, their name was missing so Notre Dame. Austin, Michael Mayer, like the two best players right. they had. They didn't have Cam Hart. Right. It's like three of your very best players that, you know, 
you had a quarterback playing that hadn't played in three months. This well, they had eleven players out. Like not all those guys were starters. Not all those guys right. were even healthy at the time that they were quote unquote out. That was, a, and, um, that, was a, that was quite the narrative during that game too. So weird. They just kept playing it over and oh over and over, and it's like Notre Dame was missing. They Notre Dame ended up missing a, a, a handful of guys, not the just those two, three, but there was the a two best handful. players that didn't play in that game were Notre Dame kids. Correct. I, Absolutely. You know, I mean, flat out. You didn't have Cam Hart because of injury. I mean, there was a lot of Notre Dame guys. I, Tobias Merriweather got hurt in the first quarter and played and played through it the whole game. It just it's a weird narrative, but right it, to me, it's like this team has a lot of talent, and I'm very excited about this football team. But what the bowl game showed us is with some of those guys out, it showed that the guys behind them are pretty good. Jordan yeah. Patello stepped into Foskey's role and was really good. Uh, Riley Mills already slid inside for that game and was really good. He had a one and a half sacks, and then he had two and a half tackles for loss. Uh, Mitchell Levin stepped in for Michael Mayer, played really good football. You know, so some guys that stepped into important roles played pretty well in that yeah. game. Xavier Watts played very well in that game. Jaden Mickey played probably his best game of the year against South Carolina, in my opinion. You know, so uh, and JB Bertrand was much. So I really like the talent of this football team. It's not just. Oh, Sam Hartman's going to make all these mediocre players around him better. Well, no, he's not because he couldn't do that at Wake Forest. Right. Right. It's you're inserting a really good quarterback, smart veteran quarterback on a talent, a Ross that's very talented everywhere that they just need that quarterback to be that guy. And that's basically what it boils down to for me. So, yeah. So uh, we got a super chat down here, Vince, from Lucky Ducks. Nice. Thank you very, very much for the super chat. Love the fact that if a freshman is playing a ton, it means they beat out a talented guy rather than having to play because we yes. need them to. Yeah, Absolutely. I, and that's true. I would say everywhere except except receiver. One freshman has to play a receiver this year. Right. Has to Agreed. play. Now, I think they're in a fortunate situation where the guys that quote unquote have to play are already ready to play. What they would have played, played regardless. Anyway. Yeah, correct. Exactly. But to to his point, there's nowhere else where a freshman has to play. Maybe big end, maybe. But I think what you'd see there is they would just move somebody out. They maybe bump Riley back out, or maybe put Jason Onye back out, or Tyson Ford back out, or something like that. I'd even consider putting Donovan Heinish out, depending on where his weight is, uh, in certain looks. But yeah. I, yeah, most positions, I think you're absolutely correct. And that's the point we were kind of getting to just now when yeah. we're talking about defensive tackles. There's been a lot of the freshmen that have played. It's because they had to. Right, exactly. And in this situation, that's not really happening. At least you hope it doesn't, because if it does happen, that means there's been some pretty significant injuries pretty in some positions. Significant, yeah. Yeah. From Jordan, which true sophomores that haven't made an impact yet makes the biggest impact in 2023? So offensively, I think Tobias. that to me is yes, hundred percent an impact. He had one catch. Correct, <laughs> correct. Uh, defensively, it's the linebackers to me. Jalen Sneed and Nolan yep. Ziegler are yep. the two that pop out to me first and foremost. They they are the ones that I think you know because because I, I part of me wants to say Jaden Mickey, but I kind of feel I, like. That was the name on the tip because of my tongue. Because he did play a lot last year. Right, right. You so know? Like, what's your definition of made an yeah. impact? You know what I yeah. mean? Yeah. Because he was the yeah. talk of spring ball when he was a true freshman, right? And then he played a bunch. He played a right. bunch last year. So Right. And 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 he had some <clears throat> bad moments, but Jaden Mickey was had some good moments as well. It's just sure. like with any cornerback, you don't ever talk about the good moments because you don't see them unless you're at the stadium and you're actually, for some reason, watching right. the corners play. Most people don't. Most, even at the stadium, most people follow the ball. Right. Absolutely. So they're, they're watching the line. What do you think about Jadarian Price? He could – well, if if it wasn't for – if you said, okay, which true sophomore not named Tobias would be that guy, then I would put Jadarian in that conversation. i put him in that conversation. i put Holden Stace in that conversation. Okay. And I'd put Billy Shrouth in that conversation. Like Billy Shrouth's the other Duh. one on offense that I could yeah. see Duh. being that yes. guy. Absolutely. That could make an impact. So <clears throat> those, those would be it. Defensively – we talked about those guys, you know, maybe t hopefully, hopefully someone we're not thinking about. I could see junior Joe Amaka being that guy, especially if there's an injury, Josh Burnham, Tyson Ford. Uh, so there's going to be plenty yeah. of candidates in the sophomore class. It's a very good class. It's It'll have a shot. Class. Yeah. And in past years, it would have been, it would have been uh, even more involved. So yeah, it, it's, it, it'll be interesting. It'll be very interesting. From Christopher Crosby, am I remembering correctly that you gave Cole Mullins a four and a half star upside grade? If so, 
What do you need to see from him to get to that, that five star? I'm finding it hard to find holes in his game. To me, I just – I agree with you to to the point of there's not a lot of holes in this game other than just he hasn't played a ton of defensive end, right, because he's played a lot of linebacker. The reason I don't quite put him into – I don't know that there's anything he can do to have a five-star upside is twofold. Number one is I'm trying to be a little bit more picky with the five-star upside grades. And number two, I, I, I'd I need to see him give me more of a burst athletically this year. Like, I think he's a very good athlete, especially for his size, but I just would need to see him take a little bit more of a step forward from an explosiveness standpoint uh, before I'd put him in a five-star. I, I think he's kind of four and a half stars right now where I would project he stays unless for some reason we go out there this spring and I'm like, wow, his step, his get off is even more, even more explosive, like way more than it was last year it would be the, be the way for me to get him there. That, that would be my, my take. I'm going to ask this one, Vince, because I don't watch enough NFL to answer Uh-oh. this. If you could add any in it, two NFL players to the to this year's Notre Dame, oh, to this year's Notre Dame team, never mind. I can answer this one. Uh, <laughs> who would you not in QB? Who would you pick? Mine would be Micah Parsons and Justin Jefferson. Well, that would be pretty great. <laughs> I, I would only take Notre Dame players to be completely honest with you. So, like for me, I would only say. It, but here's one. Here's a good one. I I would take Quentin Nelson and put him right at left guard, mm-hmm. and then put Billy Shrouth at right guard. And say, try and stop me from running the football. Yeah, you'd be pretty nasty. And my my nasty. one on defense is also an easy one. Um, excuse me, Harrison. <laughs> uh, do you got you? Can you come play for us this year? Right. So yeah, Quentin Nelson and Harrison Smith would be my picks. Two couple well, all due respect guys. to Zach Martin because I I mean you you're not wrong with Zach Martin either. I'd be fine with sure. that too. Yeah, I'm just I'm just got this thought of left side, you know, with Quentin and because Zach plays right, right guard in the NFL, right? He does, yeah. So, but you're, you want to bring them both back. A little couple book end guards. Well, Just if those were your both. two picks, I mean, that'd be fine. Yeah. I mean, if, if, if your two picks were those two guys, but I'm, well, I'd, I'd love to see Harris Smith back. Yeah. He, I'm he would, uh, this team. he would take the safety position and I wouldn't be worried about it anymore. Agree. <laughs> With Agree. an X back there. I Agree. Be, yep. I just right. saw NFL and thought, oh, I can't answer that because I don't watch enough NFL. <laughs> yeah. But I can do that one. Uh, for Vanilla Chill, favorite video game growing up? This is easy for me. Well, it depends on which part of growing up we're talking about. So, okay. like, when I was a little kid, I had different games I liked. You know, I liked playing Legend of Zelda. Mario Brothers was pretty awesome. Uh, Contra was pretty awesome, especially when I finally figured out the up, up, down, down, left, right, left, right, A, B, A, B, select, start. You know, which you get the <laughs> unlimited lives, basically. Uh But uh my favorite, because I am I grew up in Nintendo, my favorite... Yeah if I can only pick one, it's Tecmo Bowl and Super Tecmo Bowl would be, would be at the end of the day, the ones that I went with. Now, as I got older and I was in high school and college, it was NCAA football. Mm-hmm. I mean, it was, that was my favorite game, but those, those are my favorite. I and mean, there's a lot of fun games I played. Uh, there was a game, uh, RBI baseball was pretty fun, but the other one that I really liked was baseball legends. I mean, my dad would play this, right? Vince, and you could create your own team and you could build up your own team. Here's the only problem. They didn't have memory back then. Nah. But once you turn the game off, it's it over. Gone. It's over. So we would leave it on overnight. So we could come <laughs> back and play it the next day. Love and it. then when it would like all of a sudden it would like start flickering. Remember when it went out? And you're like, no. Oh yeah, I remember. But, uh, baseball Legends was pretty cool. That okay. was a fun one too. Yeah, th- those are. I think it was called Baseball Legends. I think is what it was called. But yeah, those are those are RBI Baseball is fun. Those are. But but if I had, can only pick one, it's Super Tech Mobile. Growing up. Mine uh, was that I had the most fond memories playing. I was always a sports video game guy. Uh, and this was before NCAA football came out. There was a game called College Football's National Championship. Okay. And it was from the early 90s. And my buddy and I just played the mess out of that game. And it was old school, uh, but it was so much fun. And we would just play that for hours and hours and hours on end. Uh, but it's college football. It's college football's national championship. Great game. I can't even remember what system it was. Uh, it hmm, it might have been a PlayStation Two, but I think it was too early for that. So it might it, when it wasn't Nintendo. I don't think I don't know, but it was great. I love that game so much uh, growing up. So that's mine. Good one. You got a baseball question out here, Vince. I wanted to get Ooh, to here okay. real quick. From this is this name is hilarious, geriatric. That's hilarious. <laughs> very funny, very good. There's a couple you, baseball questions that, that we have down here. Do you think any of these MLB records will ever be approached? 
uh, Ryan's 5,714 strikeouts. Cal's 2,632 game streak uh, playing in a row. Henderson's 1,406 steals or Cy Young's 511 wins. If so, which is most likely? Well, I mean, I, I think I think all those records are basically unbreakable the way that baseball is played now, right? Like steals are not a thing anymore. Like n- no, it, nobody nobody does that anymore, really. They are coming back now that they made the bases bigger, but, but not not to the not degree that it was when hundred was playing. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Right. Uh, so no, I mean you'd have if you played fourteen years, you'd have to average a hundred stolen yeah. bases per year. I right. mean that's just and he played so long. Like, right, I mean, career was I mean, so long. Vince, last year the the guy that led Major League Baseball in stolen bases last year had forty one. Right. What is it this right. year? Because there were some decent numbers at the All Star break. Do you have that? I mean, You're I so much faster at looking things quick. up than I am. Uh, forty three. Okay. And forty-one, and then after that, it's twenty-eight. So you have yeah. two guys that are there, but they're over half the. They're already played over half the year. It's eighty-five and eighty-nine games. Okay, so yeah. they're on pace for like seventy-some steals. You know, R- Ricky Henderson had, I mean, what hundred? I mean, he would steal hundred bases a season, and like you said, he he played so long. I I just feel like you don't see guys playing that long anymore either because right. they, they, they make so much money. Them. They make so yeah. much money now, and and it's 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 like it's like NFL and, and NBA. It's just become a, a younger man's game. Sure. I'm not saying it's a good thing or a smart thing. That's just the reality, right? You know, but you look at Ricky Henderson. He played forever, but he also stole a lot of bases. I mean, his first three, four full years, he was 156, 130, 108. He had 80, 87, 93, 77. But he did. It. I mean, he was 39 years old and he sold right. 66 bases. I mean, he exactly. stole, stole 31 at at the age of uh, 41. You're just not going to see that anymore. Nope. Uh, nope. Some other, you, you'll never see Cy up, Young's but... win record ever again. Like, nobody, nobody pitches that much. No. Like, no. no. You win every right. start that you make, and you may not get to 511 right. wins. I mean, think about this, Vin, Vince. Uh, if you – 511 wins, if you pitched for 20 years – You'd have to average 25.6 wins per year. And 20 wins a year is a thing of the past. Basically, yeah. Nobody's getting 20 wins a year anymore. Right. Like, that's not a thing. Because you're also – because of – for a host of reasons, but mainly because guys just the, – the, the, I mean, it used to be when you started a game, you finished it. Correct. And that's just – but look, here, here's the all-time wins leader, and, and tell me how far we got to get to to get anyone even remotely in the modern era – Cy Young, Walter Johnson, and by the way, Cy Young's almost a hundred ahead of Walter Johnson. <laughs> Grover, Cleveland, Alexander, Christy Mathewson, Bud Palvin, Warren Spahn, Kid Nichols, Greg Maddox. So, other than Greg Maddox, the next oldest player, I believe, is like Warren Spahn, mm-hmm. who played in the '60s. I mean, all those other guys played like pre World War One. Yeah, exactly. You know what I mean, like. 300 Nich- yeah. wins is, is now like yeah. unreachable. Kid Nichols played in the 1800s for most of his career. <laughs> Pud Galvin died in 1902. You know what I mean? Like Christy <laughs> Mathewson played in the 1800s. Uh, Grover Cleveland Alexander played in the early 1900s. He died in 1950. Uh, Walter Johnson uh, pitched in the early 1900s, right? I mean, so... These are guys that played in a, I mean, the, the game is not really so recognizable different. compared to yeah. where it is now. And that's also so, why you're never going to see nobody, anybody break Nolan Ryan's record either. Correct. Just because they're just not guys pitching just, as much. Right. It's just, it, you're just not, you're not, they're not putting in the innings to get that many strikeouts. Right. There's just no, nor, way. nor do they, do you see the, the same longevity right. now? Cause he pitched uh, well into his forties. Correct. Correct. And he was, and he was striking guys out well into his 40s oh. and, and it's another one it's like yeah. when you're when you're when the record is when you're so much further ahead of anyone else with the record it's it's hard to break he's almost a thousand strikeouts ahead of number two <laughs> who's number and, two randy, randy, johnson? randy johnson yeah and and number four he is 1600 ahead of the number four guy steve carlton yeah like that's just Right. That's nuts. There's just no way. Right. And and here's the thing. He pitched over a thousand more innings than Randy Johnson. Right. Like Randy Johnson actually had a better strikeout K9 rate than Nolan Ryan, but he didn't pitch as long. Right. He pitched like five fewer seasons. And 
the end of his career was in a time when he wasn't in the era where you were pitching 300 innings. I mean, that's the other part of it too, is, is Nolan Ryan had over 300 innings twice in his career, had over 200 innings. Let's see, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 times. He was over 200 and he was over 130, like over 20 seasons. So it's just, it's just a different era. It really is Vince. Oh my gosh. Yes. You just, you're but just pitch you're counts not and yeah. all that stuff. It's just from a pitching stand. There's just me, no the way. leader, Vince. The leader in innings pitched last year was San, Sandy Alcantara with 228. The next closest was 205. Yeah. If you look at Nolan Ryan's career, he had more than 228. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten times in his career, mm-hmm. and then two other times was in the 220s. <laughs> so it's just it's just such a different era right. and so that so if i were to rank them and then with the the streak it's the same thing it's war, load management load management exactly right not going to see it yep. you're not going to see it anymore that's why so, it's hard for me to go to uh, a professional game baseball basketball whatever not not so much football but the other ones it's like what if my favorite player is not playing but that right. would suck right and you don't know going in so what I would say in those records, Vince, the one that could potentially be broken if the is is stolen bases is the most likely to be broken because the game could change and right. evolve back to where steals become a thing again. And and the, it's the, the game is not going to yeah. change because there's so much money involved and you're investing so much money. The in reason arms. you would have a guy pitch nine innings every time is because if you if he if he couldn't go, okay, well. We're not we're not investing anything. I mean, you didn't pay players right. back then hardly anything, so it wasn't a loss to you. Just turn out the next guy, right? I right, mean, exactly. you also weren't pitching full, from what I understand. And again, I didn't watch games in the 1800s, but you weren't pitching full <laughs> velocity and full effort like you are now sure. as much. You know what I mean? So you could throw 200 pitches in a game and your arm not fall off, you know, but you're never going to do something like that with a modern player. And, nope. and rightfully so, because I'm investing $250 million in this guy. Yep. I didn't make sure I keep him healthy. Absolutely. Right. And so you're going to sacrifice certain things. I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm just making the point. That's uh, what it is. That's it is what fact. it is, right? Yeah, it's just a fact. Uh, so, uh, so to me, the streak could be second, is the second most likely to be broken. Correct. Because, again, you could just get that guy that says, hey, I don't care. I want to play right. every day. I don't care, especially now that both leagues are in the DH, now that there's a DH in both it leagues. Could be so a DH. You, correct. You could take your star batter off of the field and DH him. And he's still now. playing in that game. And so I would say that's, I would actually pay, say that's number one. Uh, but you could argue that's number one, but again, there's such a longevity to that. Yeah. I mean, so to so how many years is that divided by 162? Yeah, right. And that's 16 straight years plus of never yeah. taking a day off. It's hard right. to play 16 years enough. Correct. Uh, strikeouts would probably be number three. And the wins record will never be touched. Never, never be touched. I don't think either one of the pitching records will be Agreed. touched. Agreed. The only uh, the only reason I could say the strikeout one is because again I could see evolution in the game to where the way batters play strikeouts sure. skyrocket. Well, like and that, that is actually you know I mean? kind of what's going on right now. Is it's either right. strikeout or a home run. Like base hits right. are down this right. year. I'm mean, not this year, but like in this era, base hits aren't a thing. You could you know, find some I mean? rubber armed guy that just pitches for a long time in an era sure. where strikeouts are high that maybe could touch it. But, Man, but again, I got to pick between one of the two. And the reality right. is, is there's the, the win record. There's a, like, here's, here's why I say it, Vince. Number two and three of the strikeout record are somewhat from this generation. Mm-hmm. Randy, I would consult Randy Johnson and Roger Clemens of sort of uh, from this generation. Sure. Meaning they played eighties or later. Yep. Based is how I look at it. And you've got Max Scherzer, for example, is 12th all time, and Justin Verlander's 13th all time. I mean, you could somewhat see it, even though here's the crazy thing is Max Scherzer has more strikeouts than anybody in baseball right now. He's 38 years old, and he's 2,500 strikeouts away from Nolan Ryan. <laughs> so, but the win wow. record to me is just so crazy because there's no one in the modern athlete. generation that uh, ha- has come ever close to i mean greg maddox yeah. is the is the closest to it he's like and 300 something doesn't he yeah he had 355 yeah i mean he's 156 away from it right i mean 
who's the who's the highest guy now? M- m- the most wins of a current player. I don't see. I don't. I mean, there, you're a bunch of guys. Justin Ver- Verlander's two oh eight. Yeah, I mean, like he'll never how get long he's played. He'll never huh? get to three hundred. He's on the he's no. on the down like the way down yes. side of his career. Yes. So I wonder how updated this is. I wonder what Justin Verlander's current stats are. I wonder if that's actually an updated uh, updated win loss totals. Actually, real quick, let me just check that real fast, Vince. Where is Justin Verlander right now? Stats, all time wins. He is at 247. So this is a bit of an older list, but I, I believe he's still the highest of the mo- most wins in the current. I think that'd game. be accurate, yeah. And he is still ha- not even halfway to where to where Cy Young right. is. Right. I it's going to yeah. be a challenge for him to get to 300. Correct. I, I heard somebody debate: Will there ever be another 300 game winner? And that's that's a legit debate. I could see that. I could see that happening. I could see that happening. It's obviously much more yeah. likely than a lot of these. Be- because but. the thing with Justin Verlander is, I mean, he he started. He had some years where he had some injuries. He went through a stretch where he had some injuries. He had he only pitched five games in seventeen. Only pinched one game because of 2020. You give him those two full seasons, and let's see, he averages 15 wins. He's over 260. Sure. Now you're now you're like, okay, I, I want to keep pitching to get to 300. I could see that, right? I could I could see that. He had another year where he only pitched 20 games because of an injury. Okay, so right, so I mean, I could see a guy that that pay, plays as long as Justin Verlander, but doesn't have the three lost seasons. One because of COVID, and then two because of injury, sure. and he could get to 300. I think that's more doable. Uh, but the the strikeouts and the, the career wins will never be touched, never come close to being touched. Next question was, uh, what's the next most unbreakable record? It might be the consecutive games hit streak by Joe DiMaggio. I'd put that over Ricky Steele's, especially over Ryan's K's. Strikes are more than ever in, uh, I, in MLB. The I mean, strikeouts are more than ever, but they're still nowhere close to where Nolan Ryan is. I would also say the over 400 uh, batting average. I don't know that we'll ever see that again. Is it possible? Sure. But with the way things go with batting and the way certain things are emphasized, base hits aren't a thing and averages aren't a thing. So I don't see the 400 bat, the, the 400 hitter happening right. ever again. And, and the reason I don't agree with the strikeout thing too, again, is because you just don't see guys playing as much as long. Right. I mean, last year there were, there were only 11 guys last year to have over 200 strikeouts. The leader was Garrett Cole with 257. Just for comparison's sake, I'm going to go back to Nolan Ryan again. Nolan Ryan had one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight years that were more than 257. He, you know what I mean? Like he sure. had one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 years of over 200 strikeouts, and then two more in the 190s. It's just again because he he. Pitch he pitched so much, right? I mean, guys just don't pitch that much anymore. So even if your K nine is a lot better than his because of the era, it's about opportunity. Yeah. The opportunity's not there. I could see someone breaking Joe DiMaggio's record before I could see someone breaking the four hundred. In my opinion, yeah, I agree. But that's a lot of games. That's man. a lot. In the closest, I think it was what Pete Rose got to forty four, right? And that's I think so. Now the crazy thing about Pete ago. Rose is he went 44, got it broke, and then went like on another like 20, 30 games with a hit. It's crazy. That was the crazy thing about that. But yeah, I just because of walks are so prominent now too, because on base percentage is emphasized. You know, you're just not sometimes. Well, I assume I don't think the game has changed that much in the last three years since I've stopped watching it. It's still about on base percentage and all that stuff. It's still a big thing, right? That's why it's like strike walk, strike out, or home run. From what I understand, is still kind of the way it's played. So I, I think I think that'll be one. I, yeah, here's a record that I I mean I think home run records are ones that could could fall. I, I think sure. those are still much more reachable, especially oh, sure. now that the DH is in both leagues. Yes, there's just more DH opportunities for older guys to play longer. Like Aaron, when Aaron Absolutely. Judge stops being able to to play play outfield, he's going to move to DH and play five more years. Hundred percent. You know, a guy like that kind of thing. Uh, so the home run records, like I mean, Aaron Aaron. I actually think Aaron Judge obviously is is has had one of the more impressive seasons statistically. You know, again, I, I didn't necessarily watch it a lot, but statistically, because he hit what well, he hit sixty home runs a couple years ago, right? Yeah, I think so. Um, well, he you know he yeah because he broke the Yankee record, uh, which is right. sixty one, right? So. And so he hit sixty two, and and honestly, to me, that's that's the record for me. Aaron Judge to me is the all time home run leader. 
because if Aaron Judge was on steroids like Mark McGuire and Sammy Sosa and Barry Bonds, he would have, you know, he would he could have maybe hit 70 as well. I, I just I I'm I'm one of those ones that I completely ignore the steroid era. I just I do. But um, you know, I mean, you, you could see that. I mean, you, we just saw a guy hit 60 home runs, right? That's pretty impressive. You know, Aaron Judge is how old is he? He is 31 and he's got 239 home runs. And that's a guy that missed, you know, if not for COVID, he's over 250. I mean, you know what I mean? So I could I could see something like that where a hitter could get there. But like the 300, the 400, the the 50 game hit streak. The baseball's got so many stats, so many records that are just going to be hard to, to yeah. beat because the game has changed so much. And, and it's the complete opposite of NFL, where the NFL, the, the modern game is the more vo- voluminous from a stat standpoint. Absolutely. Right? Where in, in Major League Baseball, it's the, ori- the origins of the game where when the statistics were so insane at certain right. positions. Right. right. Home runs, but more so the pitching stuff like the pitching, the pitching stuff, like the pitching records, will, like most of those will never be touched yep. uh, for starters, for starters. Correct. Right. I don't know. Relievers, maybe not, but for starters. So. Well, things like, uh, you know, the fastest pitch or, you know, things that like right. saves, maybe, you know, those kinds of things. The sure. fastest pitch isn't really a record. Yeah, especially right. But- we don't really know how fast guys pitch back then. I mean, we've heard stories That's about true. Walter Johnson and all that. I mean, you know, who knows? I mean, Sandy Koufax was getting his uh, – how fast he pitched evaluated literally on a cop speeding thing. You know what I mean? Those – those. I mean, we don't really know. But, yeah, actual statistical ones will be tough. They'll be really tough because it's just – like you said, the game has changed so much. Let's get back on track to some football questions here, Vince. Connor Grant, what would surprise you more, Maris Leofile being an All-American this season or Audrick Estime winning the Heisman? Maris being Maris. an All-American, Yeah. I mean, oh, we, no. we talked earlier about – now, would I be – does Maris have the potential to be that? I mean, sure. I mean, we we, we he's got ability. It's just I don't see that happening. Sure. Audric, we talked about who would Notre Dame's two best <laughs> Heisman candidates be this year. It's, he's number two. It's Sam Hartman and Audric. Yeah. You know? and I, I don't think either of them are going to do it because I don't know if Notre Dame's going to have the gaudy numbers to right. win a Heisman. But if Notre Dame's undefeated, they'll have a shot. You know, right. they'll have somebody in there. Super chat from Connor. Thank you very, very much. Which is the better team? Sam Hartman on last year's team or Tyler Buckner on this year's team? Well, I, I just think this year's team still better, a better team. I think last year's team might might have had a better record, but I still think this year's team would be better. I, I look, we've Vince, we've been talking about 2023 for a while now. Mm-hmm. So if, if Tyler Buckner was healthy all year last year, then then I think this team would still be better. There's yeah. no doubt. Yep. But more pieces. If you could tell me that he was going to be healthy for 12 games, I think this team would be very good. I don't know if they'd be as good with Sam Hartman, but, you know, like with Sam Hartman on this year's team, like I don't know if this year's team is better with Tyler than it would be with Sam. What I'm saying is this year's team with Tyler is still better than last year's team with Sam, is what I'm saying. That's so it's an interesting question. Uh, another super chat from that one guy, one five. Since we're all talking a little baseball, thoughts on Ellie De La Cruz? I've only seen a couple highlights on Twitter, but he seems to have an incredible swing. He's got a he's a big he's big. Yeah. I mean, he's a big, strong kid. He's athletic. He's you athletic. Watch, all, watch him swing. Yeah. He's got a really athletic swing. He's athletic as all get out. The you know the night that he stole three bases on two pitches, basically he stole second, third, and home, uh, which. I mean, I, I I put that more on the Brewers being stupid than I do on him. But, but he took advantage of the athletic dude to take advantage of it. Right? He took advantage of it. They just decided not to cover third base twice in the same pitch, and uh, he was able to take advantage of it. But uh, you still got to do that, and he did. And I hope he's not a flash in the pan, you mm-hmm. know, because obviously he was a midseason call up, you know, all that kind of stuff. But man, he's a big, strong dude. Well, he was considered a top prospect, right? I mean, so yeah, it's not I, like I he believe came so. Nowhere, so yeah. he's he's. He is a, he's an athlete, man. He looks like a football I player. I haven't watched him play yet. I've just seen some highlights, but he sure. seems to play with some swagger too. And I like baseball players to have fun. Like I grew up watching Ken Griffey Jr. And he would put his hat on oh. backwards and had fun playing the game. I, I, sure. I like, I enjoy that. Well, and he, that. he seems to play hard too, from what I'm he told. He does. He plays very hard. And I, they try like uh, one of, they're playing the nationals and they tried to say that he was using a corked bat. 
right? And so they had his bat and they were looking at it. And what he did was he kind of carved the um, the heel of the bat into like a point at the bottom. Mm -hmm. Does not help you hit, but whatever. They were looking at it and whatever. Finally, he goes and gets a regular bat. That that at bat, he hits a freaking moonshot. And that's where we pointed the second the bat. And he points at the bat and then starts running. Like that was <laughs> like that. perfecto, yeah. man. Like I saw the tweet about that. Yeah. That, that was, was awesome. He's like, hey, there, it's this one. Okay. And then he just starts yeah. running. Then he starts running. Like I, I, I dug that. That was good. Yeah. I like that. All right, let's uh we got hey, got a first timer, Vince. Oh, baby, Benjamin Fleming. First question ever for you all. Who is the one recruit or transfer in the past 10 years who has impacted the program and or the Notre Dame family the most? Oh boy. So we're going back to basically as we talked before, the 2014 class essentially would be the last 10 years. Oh, the man. first one that comes to mind would be Aloe Gilman. Yeah, that's definitely the transfer. Him and Jack Cohn. Are the two transfers because I don't know how Notre Dame's 2021 season would have gone if Jack Cohn's not here. Oh my goodness. I really Abs completely agree. And he doesn't get enough credit for that. Mm -mm. Nope. So, but I'd, I'd still have to go with Alohi because he was here for more years. He was part of a better team. And he was a great leader. I mean, yeah. 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 Alohi had a big impact. Yes, he did. Tra the recruit, I mean, because you could, Quentin Nelson's one that pops in my head. Uh, he was a great player. That's a good one, man. I, I don't know if recruit, I could just narrow it down to one. I mean, look, the best player, in my opinion, that Notre Dame's had in the last 10 years is Quentin Nelson, mm -hmm. in my opinion. Yep. So I'd, I'd, have to, I'd have to go with him. But yep. I'm, I'm hoping when we do this question on July 14th next year that the answer was Sam Hartman. Yeah. And that he, and that he impacted the program so much that they won a national championship. Like that yeah. would be, then he yeah. vaults to the top of that list. But yep. as of right now, he has not done that. And so he's not on this list. Yep. Here's a here's one from Holtz My Beer that I, I wanted to get to, Vince. Holtz My Beer. I like that. Brian, is the clearest path to a Notre Dame national championship to follow the Clemson route like in 2016 and 2018 in that it's going to come down to us landing an elite quarterback like Lawrence? Well, I don't think it has to be an elite quarterback. I just think it has to be a really good one. Sure. Like, I, I don't think Trevor Lawrence is the only quarterback that could have won a championship for Clemson in 2018. You know, I mean, that, that team was loaded. Sure. Like, but now they would have needed a really good one to compete against sure. Tua and Kyler Murray and guys like that. But look, the, the Clemson path, I was, I'm with you on the Clemson path. In but it's that. different. It's different. Right. It's Clemson has not recruited a lot of highly ranked classes, meaning Bingo. like top two and three. And the best class they ever had is part of their most recent team, which is underachieved yeah. compared to past seasons. It's look, you've, you, you, you got to go out and get the elite players. What Clemson did great was sometimes that elite player was a highly ranked recruit, like a Trevor Lawrence, a Deshaun Watson's, or Deshaun, you know, Sammy, Sammy uh, Watkins, uh, Dexter Lawrence. You know, there, there's plenty of highly ranked guys, Christian Wilkins that they've got, T, T. Higgins, Justin Ross. But then there's also being great evaluators and getting the great team guys, right? The guys that aren't elite players, but are just great team guys. You know, you think of a lot of their offensive linemen, you think of James Skalski, you think of you know, uh, players like that, then you've got to be great evaluators, you know, get those guys that, that turn out to be stars, but maybe people didn't think they were going to be stars when you got them. When Trevor, Travis Etienne committed to Notre Dame, it's Notre Dame, I wish, uh, committed to Clemson. <laughs> he was not considered an elite recruit. He was, some people had him as a three-star even when he signed. Yeah. Uh, uh, Isaiah Simmons was a three-star recruit when he picked Clemson, right? They've had guys like that too. Uh, that were not highly ranked guys that turned out to be really good football players. And so it's it's evaluation is the key. And the key is get great players. I don't care if they're three stars, four stars, or five stars, get great players. And and so that's the path. And 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 also it's about team building, not always about getting the best player. When Clemson started focusing on just landing big time recruits all the time, that's when their program took a step back. That hurt Urban Meyer at Florida as well. He just started loading up on best players he could get from all over the country. And those guys all came in with different agendas and things like that, and their team faltered after Tim Tebow left. They were never the same after that. When I say Tim Tebow, it's him and his group, the Brandon Spikes, the guys like that, right? That sure. were the heart and soul of those teams. They were never the same after those guys left because it became a it's, – it's, it was about me and how Urban Meyer recruited. And, and so it, it's about building the team the right way. I don't think you're going to recruit the number one to two classes like Alabama and Georgia do. Uh, which means your five-star receiver needs to be a Will Fuller, not a Julio Jones. 
right? Meaning a guy that isn't a highly ranked recruit that you identify as a guy I really like. It means your five-star defensive end is going to be Isaiah Foskey, not Keon Keeley. It means your five-star cornerback is going to be Isaiah is going to be Benjamin Morrison, not Kool-Aid McKinstry, meaning it's I love the talent, but he's going to need develop. He's not, he's an under recruited guy. Like we, like the earlier question, it's finding guys like that. And, and on top of when you can get a key on, get a key on, I'm not saying don't recruit those guys. You have to recruit those guys, but if you're going to get to the point where you can win a championship to start getting those players, then you need to hit some home runs with your evaluations. Like you do with Tyler Eifert, like you did with Benjamin Morrison, Joe Walt, Isaiah Foskey, Jeremiah Wusukoromoa, Will Fuller, on and on and on, Ronnie Stanley, uh, Mike McGlinchey, some of your best players at Notre Dame, C.J. Procise, as somebody was bringing up earlier. C.J. was a three-star kid that nobody, you know, they didn't beat anybody big for that kid. Turned out to be a pretty heck of an athlete that was a big-time football player. So you've got to be able to evaluate those kind of kids, and Clemson did a great job of that on top of getting some of the big-time recruits. But at the end of the day, you need more elite players. Nobody is arguing that Notre Dame does not need more elite players. The argument is, does that mean they have to sign guys that are ranked number two in the country? Or right. if they can load up on the Morrisons, the Uso Koromoas, the Alts, the guys like that, can they be a great team? And my answer is, yes, they can, as long as they have – the right guy quarterback. Now, if it's a CJ Carr, who's a highly ranked recruit, great. If it's a Sam Hartman, who wasn't but turned into one, great. It just, but you need to be better at that position. There's no doubt. Notre Dame has had teams good enough to compete for a title yep. if they had the right quarterback. Yep. You put Lamar Jackson, who was at Louisville in 2017, on Notre Dame's 2017 team, they could have won a title, right? In 2018, if you'd have put Trevor Lawrence or Tua or Kyler Murray on Notre Dame's 2018 team, they could have won a title. They've been in those situations. And I think the 2015 team, if Malik doesn't get hurt, has a chance to win a title that year. I still will say that. Even with Brian Van Gorder's sorry tail, they'd have had a <laughs> shot to beat anybody that year if Malik was the quarterback. So uh, they've been close. It's just they got to get better quarterback. So I I just – and that those are reasons why I just reject this notion, Vince, that Notre Dame just can't recruit with the big boys. Right. And then it's always – yes, they can. They just haven't been able to put it all together – especially at the quarterback position from a development standpoint. So do better there and you'll be able to compete. But yes, the Clemson path is the way that Notre Dame needs to build, not the Georgia path, Correct. not the Bama path. It's yep. it's the Clemson path. Is yep. the way that Find the path. right guys, develop them. Absolutely. Right. And scheme it up. Coach and them scheme up. Scheme it up. You know? Absolutely. Yes. Because right. that's been an issue as well. Yep. At certain places. Yep. Remington jeans. At what point, can Notre Dame break the incoming transfer quarterback cycle? Thanks, guys. You all are killing the game. Thank, Thank you, you for that. that. Appreciate. That. I I hope it's next year. As far as the starter, right? right? And there, that's right. the key, right? Because I think right. they are going to bring in a transfer next year for twenty four. Yeah. But I don't know that they're bringing a transfer in to be the starter. Right. That'll be that determined remains to be how seen. the season goes. Correct. That remains because, like, seen. let's say Kenny Minchie just kills it this season. And he's the guy. He beats Steve Angeli out, and Steve leaves. You're gonna to need to go to the transfer portal, you even to. if you know Kenny's gonna be your guy. Correct. Right. Or or vice versa. Steve does, or whatever. Or there's a chance that nobody does, and you need to bring in a starter. I hope that that's not the case. But correct. The le- the, the last year you want to be there is 24. Uh, that's just. But the look what what we're gonna find is that in over the next decade, if they don't change the change the transfer rules to where you got to sit out a year. You're going to see more and more teams needing to go to the portal for backup quarterbacks. Yep, that's just going to be a fact. It's going to be hard to keep four guys yeah. that you. It's going to be hard to keep three guys. Yeah, right. Vince. I mean, reality is, yeah. it's going to be hard to keep three guys. So that's um, mm, yeah, that's going to be a tough one. It's going to be a tough one. Berkey 3 What role do you expect Carter to have this year? Antonio, right? Yeah, I think so too. Uh, I'm going to go with. Uh, very key rotation player that maybe by the end of the season is a starter. I think he's going to be a good football player for Notre Dame. I really like the transfers they get on defense, and we don't talk Me about him a ton. I love Thomas Harper if he can be yeah. healthy. I really like the Javante Jean-Baptiste pickup. Not that he's going to be a star, but he's just going to fit what they're trying to do on defense this yeah, year. A lot he fills better, the need. You know? Right. And then, of course, I really like the Antonio Carter pickup uh, sure. uh, uh, quite a bit. Now, his he could have an even bigger impact next year than this year. But even this year, I think Antonio Carter is going to have to play a lot of football for them and, and could end up being a starter for him if Ramon Henderson and D.J. Brown yeah. don't, don't play better. Nope. So I think it's gonna, there's going to be a competition for that second safety spot. And I don't I don't know if he's going to be able to break through. I don't know. But I think he's going to play. Yeah. yeah. Agree. Agree. 
Uh, super chat from Nathan. Thank you very much. Who developed Hartman? And does he get enough credit? Uh, Warren Ruggiero. And no, he doesn't. Because not only did he develop Sam Hartman, but he turned Jamie Newman into something that everybody at Georgia and other teams wanted. And I never thought Jamie Newman was that good. Yeah. But Warren Ruggiero developed him to the point where people wanted Jamie Newman. And, and Georgia fans thought that this was some giant, great pickup in the transfer portal or in, it was a transfer. And I was like, I don't see it. I think he's an athletic guy, but I don't think he's that good of a quarterback. It's just that system really did a good job of developing him. So, no, Warren Ruggiero does not get enough credit for that. But he's also a guy that I think is at his level. I think he is where he yeah. needs to be. Right. You know, but, no, he doesn't get a good enough, enough credit for that. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. All right, let's get to work. We, we don't have a ton of time left, so we got a couple non-football questions, then we'll get back and finish up with a few football questions. That I like. All righty. From Joe Irish, Brian, as a fellow history lover, what is the moment in American history that makes you want to yell, America? For me, it's the Doolittle Raids in Tokyo. Yeah, um, th those ones would not be it for me because they didn't really have much impact on the war other than just kind of letting people know, like, hey, we can do this. And we're you know, still we, here. It, like, it, like more of a motivational yeah. thing, right? But as right. far as, like, actual impact, they didn't – the bombs didn't have a ton, a ton of impact. Uh, you know, for me, man, there's a lot of – look, there's a lot of Revolutionary War ones that – That's like, just kind where of my like, mind goes. For me, it's just – like, one of the stories that, I, that, I, that I've heard that you've read – was there was a battle that the, the they needed to win and the and I can't remember what battle it was I am so ashamed of myself but they were starting to lose and they were starting to falter so it, it's like the scene from the Patriot I believe is kind of loosely based off this although it wasn't like that it wasn't a militia guy it was actually George Washington they were starting to lose a battle and they were starting to fall the lines were faltering and so George Washington in the middle of the battle rode his horse to the front line. And British are shooting at him. That's why I always felt like this country is God ordained because there's no way he should have survived that. And then just rally the troops and they they come back and win and just stuff like that. Where when when you look at that period, it's like this is this is why we are who we are, you know. And and so that's that. There's a lot of those uh, type of battles that um, that I kind of like. But like a lot of the guerrilla stories are kind of like that's kind yeah. of us, you know. And yeah. Right. Because we we were the underdog and we went out and beat the big boy. But um, as far as like more recent history, man, I got to tell you, um, I still say Midway. I still say the Battle of Midway. Is still, I mean, that, there's just something about that battle that just kind of does it for me, you know. Because we had to, we had to have a little bit of luck, right? Which I think when you go back to our founding, there was some luck involved, you know, with fog and. Different weather things kind of bailing you out a little bit, but you had a little bit of luck um, because radar was not what it ended up being by the end of the war. But just uh, just great strategists. And then also you started to see, I mean, because that was even before uh, the military, you know, the or the, the the industry started to ramp up because we we were down to our last few carriers. It's, like by the end of the war, we had 20, 30 carriers. I mean, it's just, we just overwhelmed them with our industrial power and industrial right. might. But yeah. Midway was such a fascinating battle because that was one where Japan had the numbers. They had the advantage. They had six, five, actually five carriers because one of their carriers was getting repaired because it had gotten hurt. And one, I think Coral Sea had gotten damaged. Coral Sea. They had five carriers, our three. And one of our three, uh, the Yorktown it was even a miracle that they were even able to get it up and running to get back in the fight because it had gotten damaged, I think, in the Coral Sea battle as well. We had lost Lexington. We'd lost the Saratoga. And it just was like, look, if we don't win this battle, we're going to be in trouble for a little bit, right? And so you had this great strategy. And then Bull Halsey gets sick, and so he can't be there. You got to bring in Race Bruins. And it just is – but then it just came down to – you know, our code breakers breaking the breaking that yeah, and then the, yeah. the tricking the Japanese into confirming that Midway was where they were going and and just all that. And then and then just, you know, that's where the, the new movie Midway had such an impact for me because it, it, you, you finally see the pilots and what they had to go through to do what they did. And I mean, you want to talk about the, the biggest stones in the history of 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 warfare to me are Dive, dive bomb, like um, the dive pilots, right? Like the diver pilots, the guys that were not the torpedo guys, but the guys that were just, I mean, just going straight down with anti aircraft flak and machine guns and zeros. And they're just, nope, I'm locked in. I got to drop this bomb. And the fact that we were able to sink all four carriers in one battle and just completely change the tide of the war, uh, that's, there's just always been something about that battle for me. 
that has just been kind of like the most American thing. Cause also it was a Navy, it was a Naval battle. And you know, that's, we've kind of always, we've had the world's best Navy supposedly since then. But, uh, I think some of the other ones where you get down to it is just, um, you know, probably some of the, some of the bat like D day, you know, days like that, some of the battles, like, you know, the battle for Iwo Jima, you know, some of those where it just, it just took men of courage facing brutal reality of war that said, I've been tasked to do my duty and I'm going to do it in, in ways that I could never fathom of having the courage to do what they do. And so, and, and with, you know, it's just, uh, like all of those to me, cause that's what America is to me. Like when you, when you look at it from that standpoint, it's, it's, it, it's, if we're talking about from a, a war standpoint, it's, it's not the glory of war. It's, it's the, the courage of men to say, I'm going to do something that no one else has the courage to do. And that I don't have the courage to do sure. me personally, I don't have the courage to do. And so those are, um, those are those moments, you know, the people that are willing to sacrifice everything so that others don't have to. Uh, and now some of those guys, obviously they were drafted, but when they were drafted, they said, okay, I'm here. I'm, I'm going to fight right. for my country and, and I'm going to do what I got to do. So th those are the things that, that, um, that uh, make me want to yell that that's like when I watch the Patriots, like that scene where, where he takes the flag and he's running out. I'm just like, everybody's Psh. running the other direction. And yeah. He's like, you know? Yeah. yeah. He's running to it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And those are, those are the people you say when, when, when gunfire breaks out, the ones that run to yeah, the sound right. of gunfire, not away are the ones right. that you're like, yeah, we're, we're, we're still free because of those guys. Yeah, exactly. Right? Um, that's pretty cool. We pretty can still cool sit here and talk football for three hours and 40 minutes. <laughs> What's that? that? I said, exactly. we can talk, we no, can exactly. talk football. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Exactly. There was another, there was another um, uh, qu war question I wanted to get to from Irish for life. Uh, he's got a two parter real quick that we'll All get right. to. And then we'll, we'll get a few more football questions before we get out of here. Which military officer do you give greatest credit for us winning the American revolutionary war? Francis Marion, uh, Baron Friedrich von Steuben, Washington, Marquis de Lafayette, Daniel Morgan, Nathaniel Green, other, and why? Which one doesn't get credit they deserve? Which gets too much credit? Well, what's interesting is I think the answer for, for the second, so the answer for who gets the most credit is also kind of the guy that I would give the answer to sometimes who gets too much credit. It's George Washington. George Washington. And yeah. allow me to explain. So the reason I think George Washington uh, is, is get, should get the greatest credit is because he was such a famous figure that he was able to actually keep the war effort going. He was the one that was able to lobby to get sure. the things that they needed. He was the he was the figure that the, the troops would look up to as when when the general would, like you said, would go to the front line saying he's in it with us. He, he He's sacrificing yeah. with us. He was there in the trenches with them. Uh, he was able to kind of keep them going long enough to where the others could then start to have a say and where some of the you know, supplies from the French and then eventually the French get over where those things, if he doesn't do what he did early in the war, it doesn't even get to the point. Sure. They give up where a lot of those other generals had an impact. So um, that's just kind of once for me. Now, Francis Marion is the guy that some people believe Benjamin Martin's character in, in, um, in, uh, the the main guy that Benjamin Martin yeah it's like a based conglomeration of. right of, right of. but Francis and Ma Francis Marion's the one they primarily because he was a more of a militia fighter type of thing uh, he he'd be one but like Marquis de Lafayette gets talked about a lot so I don't think he is is under Nathaniel Green I I think Daniel Morgan had a big impact too because what they, what he was able to do and and what the people down in the in the South because they were we were getting destroyed in the South and so then Cornwallis and the rest were about to come up north and then they were about to hit washington like this and it had been over but the 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 militia and the sort of the guerrilla warfare was able to keep that other part of the yeah. force in the south long enough to where we could finally start doing some things in the north so but honestly at the end of the day it's all of them play yeah a role. right yep. i mean they all played a big role in it but but sometimes but like like washington was I, I don't know if he was necessarily the greatest military mind that we had at the time Right, there were others that were better strategists, <laughs> you know. But sure. he was a but but part of being He's a great, great leader, leader is there. Yeah. You go. Part of yeah. being a great general is that right there. Yeah. And um, 
and yeah, surrounding exactly. yourself with guys who can do that kind of stuff. Right. And, you know, and had, just like uh, the Civil War, it took them a while sometimes to find those right guys. Yes, it did. So <laughs> the North yeah. went through so many <laughs> of those yeah. guys. But it was also true early in the Revolutionary War as well. So, yeah. Good question. Let's 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 end with some football questions here, Vince. We got a couple more here that I want to get to uh, that I, that we'll find here. Here's an interesting one. This is a football question, but not a Notre Dame one. Irish blooded favorite non Notre Dame college football game you have seen. I, I it's hard. There's a lot we can go with. The 05 Texas USC game is that's, hard for me not to go with that's that. What one. I was gonna say I. Yeah, that was a big one, and I I was riveted to that one because of the USC part of it. Like that's why I was interested in it uh, because of that, what happened with that season and, and just the talent that they had and the whole thing. And uh, yeah, that was one heck of a game for sure. Trying to think of any other one that I would put in Ohio state Miami back in Oh two was a really good one. I mean, that was a great game. We've seen some, we've seen, I mean, um, Alabama uh, Clemson in 16, was a really good game. 15 and 16 were both great games, but uh, the 15, the 16 game was really good. Cause I mean, the team that I wanted to win won. I mean, that was a really good game. Ohio state Georgia last year was a all time classic. Sure. I mean, that was a tremendous game. Michigan, Ohio state. Oh, six. That was a, that was a big one. That was a great game. Uh, so again, we're talking non Notre Dame games here. The uh, what was it? Clemson, Ohio state when uh, Trevor Lawrence, the team on his back and oh 19 yeah won the game because of the way he was running the football yeah. like that was yeah that was a work. that was a good game because i liked that ohio state didn't win but it was <laughs> a sloppy game i, I didn't necessarily yeah. enjoy that game it was a little bit sloppy one of the best games i ever saw i've said this before and i can't remember what year it was but it was when dan hawkins was at boise state and i'm gonna have another boise one here in a second but when uh louisville boise played a great bowl game music city bowl game back then okay. but then of course oklahoma and Boise was a phenomenal Boise, game. See, I yeah. like games that are great games, not great finishes. Okay. Right? Like some of those games, like like Penn State Notre Dame in, in, in 1992 was not a great game. It was a great finish. It was a pretty ugly game leading up to the very end when Notre Dame scored to win it. Right? Like, uh, but it was a it was a pretty sloppy game otherwise. So uh, the Texas USC was a great game. Miami, Florida, St- Miami, Florida, Miami, Ohio State in 02 was a great game. It was a, you know, uh, Oklahoma boys was a great game. They were, you know, start to finish games. Those are some of my favorite. I'm trying to think of some regular season games because a lot of those are bowl games. But, uh, you know, Michigan, Ohio State was a really good one. There's been a lot of great games over the years. There really has. I'm trying to think. There was a there was a game. I can't remember. Oh, Texas, Texas Tech played a, a phenomenal game in Colt McCoy's, I think, junior year. It's the game that Michael Crabtree had to. Crabtree, the game and with, the, that was a sideline catch or whatever. Yeah, yeah I remember that. That was one. a great game. That was a great yeah. game. Those are some good ones. All right, let's get to a couple more here. Here's here's another college football one, Vincent. I'll quickly ask. All right, more likely to make the playoff this year between Florida State and Washington. So probably Florida State because they'll have a they have I think they have a better top to bottom team. They have a better defense, and they're going to get more benefit of the doubt if they have a loss. But they're going to have more opportunities to have game, pro, like season-defining wins. They get LSU. There's a good chance to get yeah. Clemson twice. You know, so where if they're if they're twelve and one, thirteen at the end of the year, they're they're going to be in. But you know, they have the best chance to go twelve and one to me. Sure. Uh, compared to Florida State, it won't be easy. Neither of them will be easy. But they have a they certainly have a chance. Uh, to me, there's no question about that. Um, Thought, Vince, you have a difference of opinion on that? I, I just I think because they both have a challenging I, schedule, and I just think – I agree with you. I yeah. agree with you, but I want Washington over Florida State. How about that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I kind of like what Mike Norvell's doing there, and, and I think yeah. it's good for college football if Florida State's good again. Uh, you know, I, I look at Washington's schedule. they got to play at – got to play Oregon at USC, home against Utah at Oregon State, plus a rematch with somebody – it, it, you know, both of them have challenging schedules. I think Florida State just more prepared to handle their challenging schedule, to be honest with you. So, yeah, that's uh, that's kind of where I'm at. A uh, couple more here that we'll, we'll ask for we get out of here. I think we asked this one, uh, or M Sleep says, who had the better receiving core, Drew Pine or Jack Cohn? I would argue Jack Cohn did. I mean, you had Kevin Austin, Michael Mayer. You had uh, Lorenzo Styles, Avery Davis for most of the year. I would say that one probably. Yep. 
I agree. Yeah. Kev, Kevin Austin was better than anybody had Notre Dame. Notre Dame had last year receiver. Plus, you still had Michael yes. Mayer, who was a great, yep. who was a great player. Yeah, and I don't think it's all that close, to be honest with you. No, uh, yeah, I think it's somewhat close by <laughs> the by the end of the year. But Notre Dame's receiving core early last year was pretty rough. Right, it was pretty rough. Uh, here's an interesting one from Pete Weber. Uh, Brian and Vince, what do you guys think is the most underrated pieces of merch in the IB store oh, that you're shocked doesn't get purchased more? Well, Vince, you can't really say who, what does and doesn't get purchased more because you don't really know. I, I was going to say, yeah, I'm not privy to that information. Yeah. Um, I mean, I got to look at it because I there's some cool stuff in there. Yeah. Does, is, does, the, does the white hat get a lot of love? Because that's my favorite a little piece bit, of merch in there. A little bit, a little okay. bit. Yeah, the the pullover, but that's partly maybe because of cost. We got a bucket hat in there that I think is pretty cool. Oh, that's, uh, that's get, fairly new, isn't get, it? Huh? The bucket hat is that new? Somewhat been in there, like okay. in the last few months. Yeah, somewhat. Okay. New. Yeah, I, I I'm surprised that the sweats don't get. Although the most recent per, recent purchase in the store was the sweats, but okay. as much as we've talked about how comfortable those oh. sweats are, the fact that more people haven't bought them is wear them all um, the surprising to me because they are so so comfortable. And t-shirts don't get bought as much as I thought. I think hmm. a lot of hoodies get bought and a lot of hats get bought, but t-shirts okay. don't get bought a lot. The hoodies are but yeah, those. Though. And then I got a notepad that's in there too that I absolutely love. It's uh, this right here. Okay. And that's in the bookstore. I use this for all like my business I, notes. I need this to get like one my, of those. This is like my little green, you know, notebook from the coach and uh, no. uh, <laughs> water boy. Water boy. Yeah. <laughs> But I, I need to add some new stuff. I was gonna, I was gonna add a book bag and a couple other tote things, but they're just made in a place where I just, you know, I haven't been able to do the research to find out if they're okay or not. So I can't add those in there right now. But uh, yeah, that's a good one. Here, here's a couple. Vince, we'll get, we'll get uh, two more, and then we'll get out of here. In two, uh, from Scott, in 2022, Notre Dame opponents got into the red zone 34 times, and the opponents scored 27 touchdowns out of those 34 tries. How can we improve this year? Is there any info that Notre Dame is addressing this issue? Of course, they're addressing the issue. They were dead yeah. last in that. Well, category. I mean, are they doing the right things to address it? That we don't know. And any info like that that I would have, I would put on the premium board, not probably discuss here. Uh, but as far as how can they improve? Number one, be better stopping the run. That's the that's a big one. Number two, these are the two biggest ones for me, Vince is having a better sense of what you're doing defensively from a player standpoint will allow them to make more plays. And, and then number three, trust your players more in the red zone. Right. And, and I think Al Golden is always trying to scheme up a stop mm -hmm. instead of just saying, Hey, I, I, I got pretty good players. I'm gonna let them go play. Right. And, and be gap sound. Don't let the quarterback get out of the pocket, be gap sound, turn your, turn your pass rushers loose, let your guys play man coverage and get after it. So yeah. I think that's the big thing for me. Uh, I think creating more negatives would help too. They, they weren't a great negatives team last year, Vince, to me. And when you're getting into the red zone, the best thing you can do in the red zone is a first and 10 tackle for loss. Yeah. That absolutely. And now they got to try to throw on a short and a shortened field. That's a tough place it's to be. Condensed. Teams are always yeah. ahead of schedule against, or he's on schedule, I should say, against they, Notre Dame defensively, which is why so many teams went on for four. They had multiple fourth downs that they gave up. BYU had one. I think Carolina had two fourth down touchdowns against Notre Dame because you allow them to stay on schedule to where fourth is fourth down is manageable for them to go for right. it against. Notre and there Dame. was, there was also plenty of opportunities uh, first and goal where they scored touchdowns. Like they would get in the red zone. It'd be first and goal touchdown. Like it was just, they, they just didn't hold up, man. And sometimes, I mean, there was a couple of times they, they did hold up much better and then give up a fourth down. Right. So it was just, right. it's just this weird consistency. But at the end of the day, that they both go down to not being a, a good enough run defense. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you just got to do better to create more negatives, in my opinion, uh, to, to be more disruptive. I think that's a big, big part of it. I want to end on this one. Uh, hold on one second. He, he, yeah, here we go. This is this is the one I want to end on from We Are Not Marshall. All right. It says, is there enough quality depth on this roster outside of quarterback? What position group can we not afford to have injuries I obviously don't want anyone to be injured. Just would like your insight. I think this team has enough quality depth. I do. Uh, there are two spots that I don't want to have an injury. Really, three. But that's the if 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 the running back depth chart as a whole is healthy, they can sustain an injury. Mm -hmm. If Jerry and Price and some other guys aren't back to full speed, then they can't afford an injury. To me, the biggest it's more of a position, right outside of quarterback. It's left tackle. 
and then safety. To me, yep. those are the two that I look at and say you just can't afford to have an injury at those positions. Absolutely. And it's agree. even better now at safety because of Antonio Carter. Right. It was a really bad before he came. But even still, you know, he's an in, you're a safety injury away from a freshman has to play. Right. Right. And, uh, you know, well, if Ben Minich is playing this year, I want it to be because he's just that good and he's ready to play. Sure. Same with the Don Schuler, not because oh, somebody got hurt. Yeah, a couple guys got hurt and weren't playing well and you had to play him. Well, we did add Harrison Smith to the team, too. So we're, we should be good at safety. <laughs> Yes, well played. <laughs> well played. Well played. All right, Vince. Well, that is that is gonna be it, man. We got it. We got to get rolling because the uh the uh the next show is gonna That's right. start. Here. That's right. And I need a pee break. Yeah. So <laughs> we you could have you could have gone without telling us all that. So no, we're, you know. we're all good. No, no, we're all good. good. So anyway, take us out of here. It's all good. Hey, everybody, thank you for joining us on this edition of the Irish Breakdown Podcast, our Friday free-for-all mailbag. We love having you here. It's the best day of the week, people. We'll be back tomorrow. For, don't That's forget to what I was people. just going to say. We So, first of all, you got to hit the like button, the subscribe button. you got to tell your friends. you got to share. And you got to hit the notification bell because you never know when there's going to be an unscheduled show like, I don't know, tomorrow at 1 o'clock. Scheduled for us, not scheduled for you. So make sure you tune in. Make sure you hit that notification bell because we're going to be back tomorrow at 1 o'clock to do a positional breakdown, and uh, we would love to have you join us. A little Saturday afternoon sizzle. So make sure you join us for that. So for Brian, I'm Vince. Thanks for joining us on the Irish Breakdown Podcast. I'll see you in one minute over at IB Nation Sports Talk. I'm not going to be mean to